mass adoption of Power BI is happening. Everyone is talking about it. Power BI is one of the most popular and rapidly growing software for reporting and storytelling in the world of data that we all live in now. Microsoft's Power BI can give you a competitive advantage in business analysis. This powerful set of tools lets you analyze data and create visualizations that you can edit, manipulate, publish, and share with your colleagues. Learning Power BI gives you an edge over people who are trying to analyze data using tools that are harder to use, less powerful, and less collaborative. Hello, and welcome to Microsoft Power BI Masterclass course. My name is Andreas, and I'll be your instructor through this trip of knowledge. I'm a computer scientist and a full-time teacher. I have had my computer learning school for over 23 years. I'm a Microsoft certified expert, and I now teach students in over 150 countries. In this course, I'll be teaching you all about how to collect your data, how to analyze it, how to visualize it, and how to share your insights with the world. My approach is designed to use Power BI at work on day one. When you join my course, you're going to enter the Power BI Fast Track. You're going to learn the most powerful and important parts of a Power BI project and design your first dashboard in as short a time as possible. You're going to install, launch, and get data into Power BI fast. And then you're going to create your first report and use Power BI at work immediately. And once you graduate from the fast track, you will level up to the expert track. We'll start by transforming and shaping data with Power Query and exploring profiling tools, extracting and filtering data, unpivoting, and many more. We'll create our first project, analyze the U.S. population data. Next, we'll dive into combining and merging data, index columns, cleaning data, and model relationships. And we're going to create our second project, a sales dashboard. After that, we'll learn all about data modeling, cardinality, normalization, and star schemas. With our model configured, we will start by creating measures and learning DAX functions and calculated columns. We're going to learn sum and count functions, date and time functions, logical and filter functions in three different sections. Each section has a project so you can fully understand the theory. And finally, we'll bring our data to life with milestone projects, like this budget versus actual dashboard. It's time to future-proof and accelerate your career by learning Power BI. So if you're an analyst, data professional, or a user ready to leave the Excel safe zone, then sign up today and get immediate access to high quality video content, downloadable resources, course projects and assignments, and one-on-one -on -one expert support, all backed by a 30-day 100% guarantee. Make the shift to Power BI and enroll now. Thank you, and I'll see you inside. Here's what you'll need to work along with me on this course. For some hardware recommendations, Microsoft requires two gigabytes of available RAM and four or more is recommended. If you're working with larger data models, then you'll be able to brush up against some of these limitations fairly quickly. Even though four gigabytes of available RAM is recommended, if you have eight or even more gigabytes available, you'll be much happier. You'll need a CPU of 1 GHz or faster, and Microsoft's recommendation is now a 64-bit processor. The display requirement is 1440 by 900 or 1600 by 900 if you're using a 16 by 9 display. This is important because Power BI Desktop uses all this real estate, so if your resolution is set lower, for example, 1024 by 768, Power BI Desktop will actually display some of the items off the edge of the screen where you can't see them. And there's nothing more frustrating than a dialog box that you can't close because you can't even see it. If you've modified your display settings to increase the size of your text, for example, to 125 or 150%, that will cause the same type of problem. So if you need to change your display settings, you'll find them under Settings, System, Display, in whatever version of Windows you're using. 
In terms of software, Power BI requires Windows 8.1 or higher. Windows 7 is no longer supported. And you will need to have a .NET 4.6.2. It's probably already installed in your computer, but you will get a message that it's not. Just simply install it. It's free. Technically, you can use Internet Explorer 11 or a later version of IE for right now. However, Power BI will no longer support Internet Explorer 11 as of August 2021. So this is a great time for you to move up to a newer browser like Microsoft Edge Chromium, Google Chrome, or Firefox, which I will be using in the course. Finally, you need Power BI Desktop, which is a free download from Microsoft. And I'll show you how to install and launch that later in the course if you have not yet installed it. You also need to bring some skills and experience to this course. I assume, for example, that if you are using Excel, which we will do at the beginning of the course, you would already know how to enter, edit, and format numbers and text, use the format as a table command, and the other tools that are available within a table, find and replace text and numbers, sort and filter data, and insert and format visualizations, or as they're called in Excel, charts. If these are comfortable skills for you in Excel, that's great, because these are exactly the skills that you want to bring to Power BI Desktop. With our hardware, software, and skill settings in place, let's continue. When we think of Power BI, people naturally assume it's a visual software. Like, for example, we could create some kind of report like this. This is the image that people have in mind when they think of Power BI. But Power BI is not just a fancy visualization software. In order to be able to get this level, you need to have some underlying materials. So that's what Power BI offers. It offers the entire journey. So the Power BI journey, which is a collection of software tools that are all a part of Power BI, is what you need to know. So the very first step whenever we want to tell a story from data is we must begin the journey at the data level. So Power BI offers tools for dealing with the data related problems, how to query the data, how to combine data sets that are in different places, and how to transform the data. For example, you may receive somebody's date of joining the data set, but you want to calculate how long they've been with the organization. So that's kind of a transformation where you have the date of join and you have the current date and you want to calculate the tenure or age of the employee. Likewise, Power BI allows us to add and remove stuff like this from the data. Get rid of any columns that you don't need or add things that you may require. Likewise, updating the data when there is a change from the source system. So once that is done, then once we have the data in the nice and clean shape and size that you want and need for the analysis, you want to analyze it. So Power BI offers software tools for that. Through this analysis layer, you can link tables, you can set up relationships and behaviors between tables, you can calculate things, can set up filters, you can do all these sorts of data science stuff as well. And once that is done, then we want to visualize this, right? We have done some analysis. We want to now present the results. This is where, again, Power BI offers tools to make charts and tables, allow interactions so that if you select something from one place, the other things will respond to those selections. Allow drillings like you want to go down to the next level of detail, or you want to be able to see the detail in a different manner. Have animations so that you can see changes over time or periods of things and get some explanation for things that are going on and you have no idea what is making that change. Once all of this is done, if you are just making all of this and keeping this on your computer, there is no point. You must share so that other users can actually understand what is going on and make some business decisions. So Power BI offers us a platform or tools for us to share the information that you have analyzed through a web page or an app-based distribution, along with the ability to get additional insight using cloud infrastructure. 
implement artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms on top of all of your analysis, or even have integration so that whatever you are creating can be a part of the corporate page or an internet or something like that. Now, this is the journey that we follow, whether you're doing data analysis in Power BI or pretty much any software, including Excel. We tend to go through these steps in that order. We start with data, we analyze, we visualize, and then we share. Because Power BI is a comprehensive software that gives you this full spectrum, they have special names for each of the layers. The first layer is called Power Query using which you can query the data, you can do the transformations. The second layer is called Power Pivot, through which we can analyze the data. The third layer is typically what you see on the screen. So this is what people refer to as Power BI. The Power BI itself is like a collection of all of these things. We don't really see these underground things. We only see the visualization. So this is what we normally associate Power BI with. And then the sharing thing can be done with the online platform of Power BI. So Power BI Online can be thought of as the sharing thing. So this is your typical journey in the Power BI. Microsoft Power BI Desktop is one tool in a suite of tools. The Power BI suite also includes Power BI for mobile and Power BI developer tools. But the heart of Power BI is the Power BI service, also called Power BI on the web, PowerBI.com, or simply Power BI. We'll use this service when we're ready to publish reports from Power BI Desktop in order to share them with our colleagues. We can also take any reports that have been published and return them to Power BI Desktop for revision or expansion. Power BI Services, hosted by Microsoft, has its own extended feature set. You can create direct interactive connections with your data and have your data served by the Power BI service. You can explore data with natural language, which we can also do in the reports we create in Power BI Desktop. The Power BI service is the only place where we can create dashboards, and those dashboards can be viewed in a browser and on mobile devices. And with Power BI services, you can use specialized templates for software such as a service. For example, Microsoft Dynamics 365. There are different licensing levels or versions of Power BI, and they're based on price. There is a free but limited standard license. Power BI Pro, a higher level of licensing, is currently $9.99 per month per user. However, there is a free trial available so you can take it for a spin. Power BI Premium is designed for a large-scale BI deployment. It is an enterprise tool, but to create enterprise data models, regardless of whether your organization is licensed for Power BI Premium or not, you really want Power BI Pro. There are some distinct differences between the licensing for Power BI Pro and the free licensing. With free Power BI, you have a 1 gigabyte data limit. Your data gets refreshed daily. You have 10,000 rows an hour that you can stream, and your data is delivered through the Power BI service. With Power BI Pro, that data limit is bumped to 10 gigabytes. Your data is refreshed hourly. You have a million rows an hour of streaming data and can establish a direct interactive connection to your data. Some of these significant differences impact our ability to model quickly in Power BI Desktop. Regardless of which Power BI license you are using, Power BI Desktop is a free download only for Microsoft Windows. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to install Power BI Desktop. And if you don't already have a Power BI account, I'll show you how to do that as well. So if you already have a Power BI account and it's installed, you can simply meet us in the next lecture. If you've been using the Power BI service, it's straightforward to download Power BI Desktop from here. Simply click the download arrow button in the upper right hand corner and choose Power BI Desktop.
and then you'll be taken to whatever you need to get the Power BI desktop from. I'm running Windows 11, so it wants me to go to the Microsoft Store, and this is where you would choose to get Power BI Desktop, which I already have. If you don't have Power BI on the computer you're working with now, that's okay. In that event, we're going to go to powerbi.microsoft.com, and in the top, you'll see the Try Free section. And it will check if you need to create a new account or not. If you already have Power BI, it'll tell you that it looks like you're already a Microsoft customer. Sign in to get Power BI along with your account. Straightforward process. But what if you don't already have a Microsoft 365 or Office 365 account connected to your current email address? Well, let's talk a little bit about the email addresses that are used by Power BI. Power BI is designed to support only organizational email addresses. So, if you have an email that ends in .com or .edu or another valid organizational ID, for example, .info.net, then you can use those to sign up for Power BI. If you have a .gov or .military address, if you work for the government, then consult with your Power BI administrator before the process, because it's a little bit different. What you can't use are the consumer email addresses like Hotmail, Gmail, or Outlook.com. If that's the only type of email address that you can use to sign up for a Power BI, there is a workaround. You can sign up for an Office 365 E3 trial. That's Enterprise Level 3 trial. And when you do that, you'll actually get a new Office 365 tenant that has accounts for 25 people in it and will include Outlook and email address. Your email address will be something like your name at company name you provide dot Microsoft dot com. And then what you do is you use that email account from the trial to sign up for Power BI. This will give you what you need, which is an email address that you can use to sign up for Power BI, and that's the address you would enter to choose from to try Power BI for free. What we're going to do is we're going to go to office.microsoft.com. And one of your choices is going to be a free trial. So you notice that buy now is a choice, and all Microsoft is a choice. But if you scroll down towards the middle here, you'll see a plan. And check out work. See business plans. And where you end up is on a page that, again, is frequently redesigned, but it will look something like this. And you want to make sure that you're on the business page, and you're simply going to scroll down and make sure that you're looking at a plan that is either standard or business premium, not business basic or apps for businesses. And note that there's a link here. Try free for one month. If you click on this link, then you'll be taken through the steps to set up a new business standard account for Microsoft 365. Actually, you get 25 different accounts. So if you had other people in your organization who also need to try to work with Power BI in this way, then they could do that. And although Power BI isn't listed here, what you will get if you do this free one month trial is you will get Microsoft 365, including Outlook. You will receive an email address that will still have the domain that ends in onmicrosoft.com. And you use that email address from the Microsoft Business Standard free trial as the email address that you sign up with for Power BI. So even if you don't have a work email address, you can still use the free trial of Microsoft 365 Business Standard in order to leverage Microsoft Power BI. But I'm going to sign in now with my work email address and click Next simply sign in and it wants my password and you're prompted do you want to stay signed in if you do wish to do this on the computer that you're signed in on right now then you'll be asked to provide your password less frequently so you can choose whether you want to say yes or no here now i can click the get started button to continue and you will be taken directly to microsoft power bi from this page you can download the power bi desktop version so do this, and I'll see you in the next lesson.
When you install Power BI Desktop, one of the options is to put a link directly in your Windows Desktop. If you didn't do that, then you should go to your Smart Menu and scroll down to the P letter where you will find Power BI Desktop. Let's click on it. Power BI Desktop loads. I know I'm signed in because here I am in the upper right hand corner. And when it loads on the left hand side, I'll have access to get data and recent PBIX or Power BI files that I worked with as well as other reports. You can turn this screen off so you won't see it at the startup, but I actually like to see it because it provides current information to me. For example, what's new and improved in this month's Power BI update, or I can visit the Power BI forum, or just visit the Power BI blog. And I highly recommend this blog because it gives you a breakdown, not just a list of what's new with Power BI every month, and some information even about the new features. Power BI is updated very frequently, and sometimes even more than once a week, so there will always be a gap between, for example, this course that's recorded at a specific point in time, and the new features that have been added, or features that have been modified since the course was recorded. By keeping up with the Power BI blog, you'll know exactly when new features are available to you. If you don't want to see this again, simply turn off this checkbox. I will close this introductory screen and I will show you a little bit about how we navigate in the Power BI desktop. First at the top, we have a ribbon. This is the home tab of our ribbon. The ribbon also has an insert tab, a modeling tab, a view tab, and a help tab. This is a relatively new interface. There have been a lot of changes here in the last two months. On the left hand side, we have three different view buttons. The first is report, which allows us to create and view a report. And this is report view. Notice at the bottom we have, for example, page tabs, because our reports can have multiple pages. We also have a dotted line that shows us the edges of this report page. Next, we have data, and we don't have any data yet, but when we do, it will appear here. And then finally, our third view is a model view. It has relationships so that we can relay one table or a set of data to another table or set of data. Finally, on the right hand side, we have panes that appear appropriate to whatever view we are working with or perhaps to a specific report. In report view, we have a visualizations pane, but we also have a filters pane that can be expanded and collapsed, and a fields list that can be expanded and collapsed. When we're looking at our data, all we have is fields. And in the relationships view, we have properties pane and a fields list here as well. The fields list appears in each of the views in the Microsoft Power BI desktop. Those are the basics of the user interface for Power BI Desktop. In Power BI Desktop, when you click Get Data from the Get Data button, initially a list opens of common types of data sources. However, when you click More at the bottom, you will see that there is a long list of types of data that you can retrieve and different connections that we can create. There are six basic types. The first is file. And we have access to Power BI service to Excel and to CSV. But here in Power BI Desktop, we also have access to XML files, to PDF files, and to SharePoint files. Next, we have databases, including SQL Server and Access, and all these other databases. Some of these are in beta, so it is a data connection type that is new, and you can check it out if you are using, for example, Jethro Database, and see if it works for you. After it's been used for a while, it won't be in beta anymore. Next, we have Power Platform, and Power BI is part of the Microsoft Power Platform. So here we have data sets and data flows that we were creating using Power BI. But we also have the Dataverse, which is an updated version of the common data service and is still available. But it's the legacy service, which is used by all the tools in the Power Platform and other applications like Microsoft Teams. And also, how our platform data flows still in beta. Azure is in our cloud service. Azure SQL database, all the way through Azure Time Series Insights. 
Online services include Microsoft SharePoint Online, Microsoft Exchange and Dynamics, but it also includes other SaaS or software as a service connections. For example, we have the ability to connect LinkedIn Sales Navigator to Marketo, to Smartsheet, Web Trends Analytics, and many different choices. You can always search here in the box for a particular type of data that you want to retrieve, and it doesn't just search whatever category you have connected, it searches everywhere. What if the connection you want is in here? What if it doesn't exist? Well then, choose Other. Under Other, we have Web, SharePoint List, Microsoft Exchange, and Active Directory. But we also have the ability to retrieve data using an OData feed, ODBC, or OLDB, which means we can connect to almost any data source, even if there isn't a pre-built connection for it. Whenever we choose a data source, and click connect, whatever happens next is based on the data source type that we choose to connect to. In the next few lectures, I'll show you how to connect to some common data sources using Power BI Desktop. Before we can create a data model in the Power BI Desktop, we need to get some data that we can model with. We will begin by getting some data from Microsoft Excel. The exercise files is an Excel workbook called Median Age Years. The data in this workbook comes to us from Gapminder, a fabulous site that was created by Hans Rosling and his colleagues. The Gapminder site includes basic facts about countries in the world. All the data from Gapminder is available for free. I have already opened the Gapminder website and I'm going to click up to resources up here. And now I will find the data section and I'm going to click the link download the data. Here you can find a ton of different data samples for free to use them for Power BI or Excel. This particular set of data that I'm going to use is median ages for different countries and in different decades also projected forward in the future. It's right here. I've already downloaded it, and I assume that you did the same. So I should click Excel here, or I can choose to get data. Excel, it's exactly the same. So we'll just click the button, and I'm going to go to my Documents folder and Exercise Files, because that's where I want to put them. This particular set of data is median ages for different countries and in different decades also projected forward into the future. If I click on this table, I get a preview here on the right. So I'm going to choose the median age years worksheet. And notice that when I check the box, I have the ability to load and transform data. So I could transform this data here if I wished, or I could fix it after I load the data, which is in fact what I'm going to do. Note at the bottom, the data in this preview has been truncated due to size limits. All of these previews just give us a taste, a sample. I'm going to click Load. And here comes my data being loaded into the model. And you might say, well, great, but where's my data? I don't see it here. Well, this is my report view. We haven't begun to build our report, but if I click on the data view, here is my data. If I go back to the report view, I also know that the data is imported because it's listed here in the fields list. And if I expand it, I will see all of these different columns and note they're just column 10, column 11. I would have shown you we had a problem and that we need to transform this data, which will not take us long at all. If I wish, I can save this for further work, and in fact, that is what I'm going to do. So if I'm going to choose Files, Save As, and it's showing me the list of Power BI files, PBIX files, not Excel spreadsheets, because I would save them from Power BI, I'm saving as a PBIX. If it's your first Power BI file that you're saving, this area is going to be empty. So I'm going to call it median age and I will have a .pbix extension and I'm going to click save. 
For a brief period of time, there was actually a way to be able to close or exit Power BI in an elegant way in order to close down a data model. In fact, we had an exit button, but we don't have an exit button now, and it's not listed on the file menu. So if you want to close a data set, you, in fact, are going to close Power BI, and I can do that right here. The next type of data source that we're going to connect to is also a file data source, and it's a CSV file or a comma separated values file. The reason we want to know how to connect to this particular type of data source is that when you work in an organization where your IT department exports data to you for your use, the two most common formats that it will be exported in are Excel and as a text or CSV file. So I choose to get data. Choose Text CSV and click Connect. And again, we're looking for a file data source here with a CSV. It's this file right here. Now, CSV files are flat files. They don't have multiple sheets and multiple tables like you would see in Excel. So we immediately get a preview that shows us the data that we would have. Choices that we can make here are the types of file origin that we have. And this was actually read by Power BI that it's a Unicode file. The delimiter normally will be a comma in a CSV, but you might have a file that is delimited in another manner. For example, you might have a file where the individual data elements are separated by tabs. That's second most common type of delimited file. And we also have other choices. If you have a file in that someone used a custom symbol, for example, the pipe symbol, on the keyboard to separate columns, you can do that here. And then finally, the last type of delimited file, actually not delimited at all. It's a type of file called fixed width. And you would see these most frequently in older legacy systems, healthcare, insurance agencies, and in fixed width files. We don't have any symbol delimiting the columns. We actually have allocated specific space. For example, the first 10 characters as an account number, the next 10 characters as a last name. So you simply choose the type of delimiter that you have, and we can instruct Power BI. Take a look at the types of data that we think we have here in these columns based on the first 200 rows, a sample, or based on the entire day data set. Or don't detect data types, which means that you have to assign all of the data types. Not a big deal. But if the rows in your data source tend to be representative, then you can simply go with this first 200 rows and Power BI will detect all of the data type for the country or for the region for the year and the GDP per person. There's only one data set here, so I don't need to choose what I'm going to load. And again, I could transform data first if I wish to, but I'm not going to. I'll show you transformation later after we've learned how to connect to different data types. So I'm simply going to load this, wait for it to load, and then if we wish to see the fields that have been loaded, here they are. If you want to look at my data sample, I can click the Data View button, and here is my data. If you wish to save this file, you can, and perhaps do something with it later on in the course. I'm simply going to close the Power BI desktop, and when I'm prompted, say, nope, I don't want to save my changes. There are many data sources that are available on the web, some for a cost, some for free. We're going to grab some data from Wikipedia. So I'm going to choose Get Data Web, and we'll be prompted to provide a URL. The page that I'd like for you to navigate to in Wikipedia is the list of countries by GDP with purchasing power parity per capita. And on this page, we have a large table that has columns of data from three different sources about the GDP for the countries in the world. Copy the URL, Control plus C, swing back to the Power BI desktop, and paste the URL right here. Control plus V. After you've pasted, click OK and then connect.
and Power BI Desktop will make a connection to that web page. I could have chosen on another page or two or three different tables. I happen to only want one, but you can select multiple tables, uh, just as you can select multiple tables in any Excel spreadsheet, for example. And here I have a list of my tables, six HTML tables and five suggested tables. I'm actually going to take a guess that the name table here is precisely the one I want, so click on it. You can also switch to a web view so that you can see the web page rather than having to switch back and forth out of Power BI into a browser. But this is the table I want. I'm going to click load to load the data into the Power BI. And of course, Power BI is creating queries as it builds, which is why I have a banner that says there are pending changes in your queries that haven't been applied. Now, Power BI has resolved that by applying those changes. Here's my fields list. They're all called column, and I'm going back over here and look at my data. And here are the countries. And I can quickly and easily fix these columns headings. Not a problem at all, but we will leave this as it is then, except I'm going to save it so that I can use it later in the course. I'm going to choose File, Save As, and I'm going to call it My GDP. And we'll see this a little later on. Now that we have a comprehensive overview of what Power BI is and how to insert data, let's get into Power BI. Let's load up some data and let's build some visualizations. We are now going to have a play with Power BI by looking at some of the sample human resource data, just dummy data for 100 employees, and kind of get a feel for Power BI by creating something that is truly powerful, extraordinary, and also not so time taking over to Power BI. So here's how Power BI looks when you open it up. You might actually see a splash or a welcome screen at the start. You can close that or you can use that to do these things as well. Power BI, because it is built for not only creating things but also sharing, there is an optional element of logging in. I have logged into my Power BI account. It is not necessary to log into Power BI to be able to use it, but if you log in, then you will be able to share whatever you create with the online workspace where your colleagues or clients can access what you're creating. Another little bit of information that I think is relevant for us to learn up front is Power BI is not like your traditional software. For example, if you take something like Windows or Excel, chances are that they are not updated every month. So I mean, Windows might get some updates every now and then, but in general, the look and feel of the software remains more or less safe. Power BI, because of Microsoft, which is the company that owns Power BI, release new versions every month. So chances are that by the time you watch this video, the look of the software might change slightly. Okay, so that's when we will get into the first bit, which is the journey of Power BI is starting with data. So the very first thing you probably want to do within Power BI is get data. I'll show you how that works. But before that, we'll go into our data sets and load up the employee data set in Excel so that we can take a look at what we have here. So we have our employee data here. It's a fictional company called Melon Tour, and it's a web tourist company. And they have 100 employees. So this is their human resource HR data set that we are dealing with. So we got employee ID, employee names, gender, what's employee's age, job title, which department they work in, which date they were hired, how much salary we are paying them, what is the rating of their employee on a scale of 1 to 5, and who is the manager of that employee. So all the data is there. It's all good. We will now load up all this data into Power BI. We will go here, Get Data Button. 
Now, when you click on Get Data, it will offer you some of the common sources, but Power BI has an extensive collection of sources that you can connect to. For example, if you go to More, you can see that there is like a heap of connections available, including some very exotic ones. For example, you could go into SurveyMonkey, collect your survey data, or you could go and bring in a Python and our language scripts into Power BI, or connect to CRM solutions and payment gateways. We will go with Excel because this is the place where our data is, and then we will connect. Power BI asks, where is your data? So we will go in to point to that, and then this will establish a connection. So in this case, what we are doing is we're connecting to a file that is located on a computer. So you would need to do the same with the employee data file that you have downloaded. And then usually, whenever you connect to a source of data, probably I will show you on a navigator screen asking you what you want to do out of this file, because the file has two things. One is a spreadsheet. That's the icon for the spreadsheet. And another is a table that is inside Excel. So these are the one and the same from the layman's point of view. But essentially, table one is what we want. We will connect to this, and then if you want, you can refresh the preview, especially if you have previously connected to the file. Then Power BI may not even fetch the current data. So once this is there, then we can just say load. Once you finish working on your data, you are loading it to the next stage. So that's what we are doing. So we will just load this, and as you load this, you will get a table called Table 1. And notice it to the right of the screen, right here. And then all of the fields within that table are listed here in that area of the field. So now that we have some information, let's take a quick look at Power BI itself. What is the screen telling us? So the layout of the screen is fairly straightforward. You've got your ribbon on top, which is different types of ribbons, home, insert, modeling, view, and help, and some other ribbons that may appear depending on what you're doing at the specific time. Now let's look at the three small buttons on the left side of the screen. Here is report view. And the report view itself is on the white canvas area here. It is set to report view. And that's the view that we're currently on. You can also switch to data view or model view. Data view will enable you to look at the actual data that we are working on. If you have one table, it will default to that. If you have multiple tables, then you can select that table and then see the preview of that data. And the model view will kind of show you a box view for each of the tables. Each table in the data will have one box. And if there are connections between the tables, then there will be lines connecting. Right now, we don't have any tables other than table one, so there is really nothing going on there. So the typical behavior, especially when you are developing things in Power BI, is to stay on the visual or the report view. You build things, and then when you need to do some extra data-related stuff, you will go to the data view to look at it. That's the majority of the screen area on your ribbon. And then you've got the view selection thingy and then the view itself. These black colored lines that you see in the report whenever you create shall fit into that much space. And the white space with that dotted line there. So depending on how big your Power BI window is, that view may change. The idea here is a typical report within Power BI world is always a widescreen format. So that means it will be 16 to 9. That's the ratio. You can adjust these settings if you want to. For example, make a 4 to 3 size report or something else. You can click on the white space and do the format things here. If you click on that button to format your report page, you can set up the canvas settings. So it is typically settings to 16 by 9. You can also set it to the letter or custom and then type your own dimensions for the page. As such, Power BI reports do not have any fixed size. So what this means is that when you create the report, this is how big it looks. But if I publish this and somebody is viewing this on an iPad, then it will automatically resize to fit that iPad. 
So this is called a responsive model of report. What this means is that there is no fixed size for anything, and this way Power BI can resize things automatically while keeping the proportional team intact. So that's the report view. And then you have your filter pane, which can be minimized. All these panes can be minimized. Filter pane is the special type of pane that you can use to control what goes into here. We will play with this later. And then you have your visualizations area where all the visualizations are listed. And then for whatever visual you have, you will have the fields and format settings that can be applied. Okay, enough of the overview. We will go and start building and then you can come back and understand these in more detail. So let's just say I want to understand how many people we have by department. We've got some employee data. So I want to look at the number of people by department, and this is where, for example, a column chart or a stacked column chart is a good idea. So we will add that stacked column chart, and as you click it, it will add a chart. And then for this column chart, you will see that as soon as one is added, all these fields got changed because of a column chart. You can have an x-axis, a y-axis, a legend, small multiples, and then a tooltip. So we will add all of these things. Let's start by dragging and dropping the department field into the x-axis. And then the y-axis would be how many people are there. So I can take a full name field and put it here inside the y-axis. That would count. So this is how you set up the charts as you select and drag. This is how your people are. You have your IT, which is the largest department with 23 people, and then HR is your smallest department with just 7 people. Notice something funny here, which is when you create something, it's not sorting the names by alphabetical order by default. The default behavior is always based on the size of the columns or bars or whatever, okay? But if you want to change that behavior, you can click on these three dots up here, More Options. then sort axis and then you can say just sort by department name i think now it is doing the alphabetical order but in the reverse way if you want to change that you can just say sort ascending and then that would reverse that but if you don't specify anything then it's going to be like that There are more options here. For example, you can also look at the data and remove the chart, etc. But that's one chart. This is how that is. Let's look at the gender distribution as maybe a pie chart as well. Usually gender is comprised of maybe two or three or four different values. So pie charts are a good type of chart for that kind of information. But if you make a pie chart out of departments, then it might get a little busy without labels you may not be telling things apart. Click anywhere inside the white space and insert a pie chart. So I can add gender inside legend and then you can click on these things and they will get added to the chart. And I can count the names as well. So drag and drop full name field inside values. Great. So we can see that we have 48% male and 47% female. But there is a blank item, so this exposes the problem with the data. Now, as you're exploring the data, you see, uh, I want to visualize this, but I have a problem with my data. Why do we have some people who do not have gender information available? It could be because maybe that information was never gathered, or they choose not to divulge their gender information, or whatever. So in any case, from a reporting point of view, Having the word blank is not really suitable. You may want to call this other or missing or something like that. So to fix that problem, you would go to data and you can kind of really see where the problem is coming from. If I go to the gender column, there are really missing values like this person and that person do not have their gender information entered. And that's why this is coming. If I want to change this, and if I want to put the word other there, this is not the place where I can do it, because if I double click here, I won't be able to edit. 
You might think this looks like a spreadsheet, so I can edit it, but that's not how Power BI behaves. This is only showing you a copy of the data. If I want to change this data, the better way to do that is to change the source file. But let's say that you don't have access to that source file. You're only reading it off a server or something, right? So in that case, what we would normally do is we would go to the very first step of the journey, which is the data step we loaded. We connect to the Excel file and then we just loaded it. Remember that screen where we clicked on load? There is another button on that sheet called transformation data. So we could go to that step and then make some of these changes there. Let's return to the report view. So that's what we will do. We can click on the transform data button and this will take us to the Power Query editor screen. So this is the place where you play with the data within Power Query. You are able to look at all of the data and understand what is going on and also tell Power BI that you want to do some extra steps on top of it. Power Query is the software built to deal with data related issues. For example, without even knowing it much, we will really be able to look at the gender column. There are some null or empty values as you can see from this column quantity indicator here. The column quantity indicator here shows that, right, if you place your mouse pointer there, it says 95% of values are valid and 5% are empty. Let's click the down arrow here. You can either remove the empty values, that's a button there, but that probably is not the correct way to do about it because then you would not be able to report those new people. So right click on the gender column and then what we could do is we could replace values. We can replace null, which is the missing value, and then we can replace those with the word other. And then you could see that it has completed it in step. Now, as you do that, you would notice that Power Query has added the step to the list of steps that it has done. So now that we were in Power Query, it would be a good idea to really look at what's going on. So in order to get this table, Power Query, which is the data engine of Power BI, has to do with four steps. The step number one is it needs to go into the Excel file that's located at that address to connect to it. Step two, it needs to navigate to the table one. This part we have done through the navigation screen. Step three, it has applied some sort of data type to every column. So this is a number, that's a date, that's a number, and that's a number. And then step four, which is what we just did, which is replacing those values. So those are the steps. You can add more steps so that each step does something to your data, and then it takes from one stage to another. So that's how it works. And then the final thing is the table name is table one. Within Power Query, you can also rename things. So because table one is not a very good name, I'm going to click here and then rename it says staff. And then when you are done, if you come into the home ribbon of Power Query and click on close and apply, what it does is it will push those changes back to Power BI. And now we have a staff table with the data. And you can also see that the gender here has changed. It is now other, right? So this is that. So we've now got two visuals here, which is the number of people by department and number of people by gender. Let's take a look at what happens if I click on one of the departments. If I pick marketing, I can immediately see this kind of thing is changing to show how many people are within marketing. So four people in female and 11 males in marketing. And then if I click on the mail pie, I can also see the chart. So this kind of behavior is called interactions. Every Power BI visual by default interactions with other visuals. So as I click here, that visual is responding. And to undo it, all you have to do is click again into the mail pie, and then it will restore the behavior. So this is how Power BI behaves. It is interactive by definition. So now that we've been able to explore a number of people by department and number of people by gender, let's take a look at by manager as well. 
Most of these visuals are fairly similar to what you'll get in Excel, but these are some of the exotic ones like maps and funnels and gauges and these other kinds of things. We will do that in a minute. This is all the employees and I want to be able to see what it is for a specific manager. And to do that, I can add a slicer. Keep in mind that before adding a new visual, you have to click on an empty screen right there. Otherwise, the new visual will replace the old one. And then put manager into a slicer. So each manager will be listed once. And just as you expect, if I pick Sam, all my visuals will be filtered down to Sam's people or Virginia or Andreas's. And then I can see those employees. So that's what a slicer is. A slicer is a filter. So you could be thinking, oh, Andreas, this is good, but what is that filter pane? I could not have that there. So that's what the filter pane is essentially for, because many times we want to filter by different combinations and conditions. Power BI has this filter panel where I can put all the filters that I want there so that I can save some space on my screen for actual reporting rather than having the filters. So this is my manager slicer. We will play with the filter pane as well, but for now that's that. We will leave this there. Probably I will move this to the corner here for now, and then we will select a manager. We are seeing the overall summaries. I want to be able to see the staff, who are the people, as well as a table. So we add a table visual. A table is essentially just what it is, which is a table of data. You can add any number of columns, and all those columns will show up. As you can see while I'm talking, and I'm toying with Power BI, so I can expose the behavior of various things. You can put the visuals, you can size them into, you can drag them and move them around. So this is a table. In this table, I want to see who the people who are that report to Sam. So to do that, I can just add the full name. So these are the people. I can also see how old they are, so I add the age field. I want their current rating, so I add the field rating. And how much salary we pay them, right? So all of this information shows up. Some of the totals also show up in the table. Probably for salary, it doesn't make sense, but rating total and age is not very appropriate. If you don't think that the total thing is relevant, you can select the table, you can format the visuals from this button, and then from here, total off. Because there are the heaps of properties associated with every visual, it might be difficult to remember where everything is. So that's why there's a search bar. And usually I don't bother going down to the total, I will simply reach for the word total, and then I can see that and drill down so that I can filter that. So these are the names, that's the age and rating and salary. Now because of all of this there, we are not able to quickly spot who are the poor performers. For example, these people have two ratings, whereas everybody else seems to have a rating of five or four. So I want to be able to highlight those ratings that are very low. Now to do that, what you could do is you could go to the fields from this button, select rating, little down arrow there, and then apply some conditional formatting on top. For example, I could apply a background color. And then the lowest value is dull white, and is the highest value blue. Now, for a thing like rating, lower rating is bad. So really, that's what you want to be able to highlight. So maybe if we want, we can just flip this color by saying lower rating goes in that orange color, and the higher rating is just white. We don't care about that. And then when you click OK, you can immediately spot those people. That's your traditional conditional formatting applied on top. Likewise, you can also apply the same sort of formatting on 
top of salary so that you could see who's the higher paid staff. It might get a little too busy, but you could apply, for example, data bars. Let's click the down arrow beside the annual salary for conditional formatting and select the data bars. And then, because positive values are usually green, we don't have any green colors here. So let's just click the other colors and select a green one. You can size these columns so that you can move them around just as you would expect. And you can also sort these by salary from this little arrow down. So that's that. Once the table is set up, it would work exactly the same as you'd expect. If I go to Cynthia, I get all of Cynthia's staff and I would be able to see the updated conditional formats. And I can go to Andreas, I can go to Sam, I can go to Vanzel, I can go to Virginia. And then, I think we do have enough people for this full box. So this is how we can quickly set up without even knowing anything about Power BI. Right, we started talking about it and then we loaded some sample data and we started building. And everything works beautifully. I can select finance. I can see that people report to Sam in finance and how they are. I can go to marketing. I can go to sales. Good stuff. Let's just say what happens if I select Cameron Lowe here. This is going to highlight those blocks because now Cameron is selected. It's saying he's an IT male gender. Well, you might say, oh, this interaction is kind of useful. It's also not so friendly. I mean, it is probably not the needed interaction. The needed ones are, I can select IT, I can see those people, I can select female, I can see those people. Or I can select male and I can see those people. But the interaction that's probably not so useful is the ability to select something like this and seeing that there. So to fix that problem, what we could do is we can tell Power BI, hey, I want these visuals one and two to talk to everything. But I want this visual, number three here, not to update the values on the others, right? Let's first make the visuals a bit smaller. So to do that, what we will do is we will select this visual, the table. We can go to Format, and as you can see, those additional ribbons will only appear when you select certain things. And then from this button, you can edit the interactions. So we can say Edit Interactions. And when you enable this kind of a toggle thing, it is on off. When you enable, you see some extra icons. So let's take a look at these things. I selected this, and I'm looking at them. And here's what this is telling is right there, there are three types of interactions that can happen. You can filter a visual, you can highlight a visual, and you cannot have any interactions. So for this, if I selected something, I don't want this or this to respond. So that means I want the interaction to be none. Currently, it is highlighted. So I want this to be none. Once that is done, we can uncheck this. And if I click this, nothing happens to those visuals. It only highlights that particular row within the table. Whereas if I select HR, it does still respond and I can get all my answers. So now that our report is kind of ready, let's go and add some titles and things like that. I'm just going to move it slightly so that there's enough space for our title. All right, let's select the column chart first, and then we can go to home. We can add a box text, which will be our report title. And I'll move it to the top. Q. 
here I'll simply say our first BI report. You can also apply any kinds of fonts and formatting that you wish, just as you would expect. You can also name the page. Power BI has the multi-page kind of situation. So you can have many pages in your report, each page telling one part of the story. So think of this like a PowerPoint presentation where each slide tells one part of the story. So you can go and add another page. We don't need another page for now, so I'm deleting that. But I can also double click and then say getting started. Right? So once this is done, we will save this. Once it is saved, you can also publish, assuming that you've logged in. So I'll go through that process so that you can see what happens next. Which is if I publish, this will simply say that you want to publish this to your current workspace. You could have multiple workspaces. I only have one and I'll select this. It will do its thing and eventually when it is finished, it will say success. You don't need to open it, but I'll open it just so that we can actually see this report on a web page. This would open up in your browser. The web application can also be used to edit these things and make changes as well. But essentially it will work just like the desktop application which has its interactions. And then those interactions work just like the other interactions that you have seen. Okay, so from here we can also share, right? Well, this depends on what kind of plan you're on with Power BI. In a corporate environment, typically you create something and then you share it with your clients or colleagues or bosses. So that's when that process happens. You can also have additional types of sharing, like export or to share the Power BI report with the wider public so that everybody can watch it. Okay? So that's how Power BI really works. As I said, this is really just getting started lessons. So we haven't really built anything that is complicated or comprehensive, but that's the start. In the next lessons, we will actually define some goals for our reporting. Thank you so much for watching. In the previous lesson, we had an excellent getting started session with Power BI. In this lecture, we will continue the theme of HR data analysis, but instead, rather than doing something haphazard, we will define some themes and scope for our analysis and then go and do it. This is very important whenever you go on a data analysis journey with Power BI or any other software. Because these tools, despite being very powerful, they are also very distracting and can be a massive time sink. That's why I believe that if you clearly define what you want to achieve, you can quickly get the results. But if you are unsure of what you want, you could lose a ton of time just playing with the software. So for this lecture, we want to define some scope. We will start with this kind of themes. Feel free to add something else and try to do that with the sample data that you already have. But the themes that I want to explore are salary versus performance. And then I want to be able to see if there is something funny going on by gender, department, or manager. Right? Likewise, I want to be able to see a headcount over time and whether as a company we are growing consistently or not. And if so, are we experiencing any patterns? So these are the themes that we will explore. Keep in mind that this is fairly dummy, random, made-up data. So there are not many interesting bits going on. Everything is just random noise, but when you apply these themes to ideas and real-life data sets from your work or personal situation, you can eventually discover some very interesting elements. So we'll go to Power BI. This is where we left off in the previous lecture. Okay, so we have our first report. 
this is what we build. And now we can look at salary versus performance and then do a headcount over time of both. Headcount over time seems like a very straightforward thing to do, so we will go over that first and then we will go to add salary versus performance kind of reporting. All of this we will do on the second page. We will name this later. For now, let's take a look at the headcount over time. Now, anytime that you're looking at some sort of trend where time is involved and you won't explore trend over time, it's a good idea to use a line or an area type of chart, okay? So we could use a line chart. We will go and try the area chart if you want as well, but we will try the line chart first. We make a nice big line. I want to see our head count because we only have an employee start date. We don't know when employees have left, and if somebody has left, we don't have that information. For example, this is all our current staff. We don't know if somebody has left in 2023 because that information is not provided to us. So we could just assume that no employees have left the company. That means that the headcount will always go up. It's kind of like going upwards, but the slope of that line might change depending on how fast we hire people. So that's what I want to be able to explore. First, we will add the hire date inside of the horizontal axis or x-axis. Now, if you notice these fields, Power BI shows some exciting and funny symbols next to them, and they're self-explanatory. But because we are at a point where we are really looking at Power BI from a closer angle, let's go and see this. Anything that is a number would have a sigma or a sum symbol at the front. This indicates that Power BI can sum up the average count, medium, and max within those numbers. Anything with a date that is obviously converted to a date will have a little calendar symbol next to it. Other items can have symbols as well. We don't see any of them right now, but eventually as you start working with complex data sets, we will see those symbols. Because the hire date is a date, Power BI automatically provides this as a hierarchy, right? So it will say the higher date is your date. It has a year, quarter, month, and day. So that means that I would explore this trend by quarter or month or by individual day of the year that they have joined. This is very powerful because we don't need to write any measures or any calculations. We can just use the hierarchy and use it. I will only keep the years because I want to know how many people we are hiring per year. Now, if you look at the department dashboard, the department chart only has these icons. Whereas this one, because it has a date axis, it will also have these special icons at the top. Because there are multiple levels, you could go down to the levels, or you could go up a level. So that's what those drill down buttons and drill up buttons are. We will play with them later as we load up the data, but this is the higher date. And then I want to count how many people are there. To count the people, we are simply adding the full name to the vertical axis or y-axis. Nice. What we really wanted was headcount over time. Now this is changing cumulatively. But what we ended up getting is we got a point in time value. So this is how many people we have in 2005. So in 2015, if I had 7 more, then I would expect that this value is not 7, but it's plus 7 to the previous years. So it should be going in a straight line upwards. But this is how we get. And that's the yearly trend, because the calendar view that we currently have shows how it's showing. Now let's explore the small icons at the top of the line chart. And if I go down one level, and let's go to the next level in the hierarchy, then I'm going to get the quarter view. Just press these little double down arrows. So quarter three is our best quarter for hiring people. This is how that trend looks, but which quarter three is that? Quarter three of 2005, 2015, or 2019? That context is not provided, and that's because that when you go down to the next level, you are only looking at the next level. You are not looking at both of the previous levels level and this level. So that's what that button is for. I can go back up with the up arrow. There's another button that looks like a trident. This button is expanded all down one level in the hierarchy. This will go down to the next level while keeping the ear in context. 
This will give you the quarter by how the trend is. If you go down one more level, you essentially see the monthly movements. Let's say that for the purpose of this analysis, the month is the focus. We can delete the quarter level and day level so that these are the only two levels that are in the chart and there are not too many buttons. So I can explore by year or by month end. So that's what this is, but this is not adding up. It's just showing the items one at a time. Let's see if this is an easy way to add this up. Let's click the down arrow next to the count of the full name. So show value is count. And then you can only show this as a calculation or as a percentage of the grand total. So it's not really giving me a total running option. It's just that within Power BI, so far our journey, we haven't really come across all the features that would let us do that kind of calculation. So we will park that for now. We can say maybe we are happy with this analysis, which is headcount over time, but just points of time, not cumulative headcount. So this is that trend, and you can see that as it spikes, you can also see this as a step review. Let's click on to format button. And let's expand the line options right here. This is a line so I can go to the chart and then there is a stepped option that if I enable, I can see like steps rather than just going down and up. Could be interesting and useful in certain situations. So that's the headcount over time. Now let's go and explore the theme that we wanted, salary versus performance by employee, manager, department, and gender. Whenever you have an A versus B kind of situation, you can use different types of charts. For example, I want to see what is the average salary by gender for various ratings. I could use a kind of clustered column chart, so this is the icon of a clustered column chart, okay? And then I can put gender into the horizontal axis. And now I'll drag the rating into legend. So each of the six ratings would be that. And then the annual salary is a value into vertical axis or Y axis. And rather than having the total sum of the salary, if I say average, we would get something like this. I'm going to quickly make some adjustments to the size of the line chart so that we can make space for this and be able to read it. So this is how that looks. This is one way of exploring that information. What I will do now is I will exclude this for the analysis of any other gender people or anyone whose gender information is missing. We will exclude them from this analysis. So what we would do is we could go to filters and I could add a filter on this page so that every graph or every visual on that page will exclude that particular gender information. So I'll go to gender and add gender there as a data filter. After that, I will simply select female and male only. So the other gender information won't show. Let's collapse the filter pane. Now I don't know about you, but I feel that this kind of clustered column chart is not the best way to visualize, not giving me that kind of information at a glance kind of thing. This is where I think a table or a matrix visual is probably the best visual to go with. So let's change it to a matrix, okay? I'm just going to increase the font sizes here so you could actually spot everything clearly. Remember that if you want to format your visual, you only have to click this button. Let's expand the row headers, and here is the font size. Now, from values, I will increase the font size. Optionally, you can also increase these labels over here from the grid options. Here it is, global font size. So we can now see by each gender what the average pay is, and we can quickly kind of see what's going on. Let's return to visuals. 
As I said, these are random data, so there's no rhythm here, but that's interesting to explore. I could also add, for example, a department view instead of gender, and then see that by department there are too many decimal points going on, which is a bit confusing. So I could click to format button and then search for decimals. All right, let's remove all the decimals. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to set up a comma formatting or a currency formatting here without having to really build up some extra things on top. So by each department, each rating, I can see that this is a continuous scale and then that's that. Let's say that we wanted to add something else, like by manager. We can say rather than rating, I want to add manager. And then I can see the average salaries by department and manager. Now, with so many numbers, it's really hard to see anything interesting. This is where, again, the conditional formatting feature really comes in handy. Let's click the down arrow beside the annual salary, then from conditional formatting, add a background color. We could leave it at the basic thing or change the colors if you feel like. I like to put a white color as the lowest value and then a dark green color as the highest value. Let's also turn off the totals, which is probably irrelevant at this kind of analysis. So I will turn off the column and row subtotals. And that would explore that theme of department versus manager as average salaries. We are still unable to explore the theme of what we wanted to do, which is salary versus performance. But as I said, with this random data, sometimes we want to visualize something, but that's not even there because it's unclear. But what I think would be interesting is by the department and by the manager. If I can calculate the average rating, that might also be interesting. So we will want a copy of this table. So I can copy that visual with Control plus C and then paste it. Control plus V will get another visual exactly like that. So then I'll move it here and then we've got like two of them. We need to work on the sizing of these things. But here, rather than average salary, I'll put the average rating. Let's say that this should be average. Great. So that they are averaged out, and now we can see that any manager, any department combination, where let's say the rating is too low or average rating, we want to be able to highlight that we could again apply conditional formatting. What we will do is we will go to the background color, and this time instead of color scale, we will apply rule basic formatting. What this will do is it'll give us the choice of saying we want to do the average rating with a rule based on the average rating. And if the value is greater than zero as a number and is less than, let's say, 3.5, And then I want that to be highlighted, so I'll select a red color. That'll be good. So only those important bits get highlighted, and everything else is to stay the same. For example, finance seems to have quite a few people on the 3.5 mark, whereas marketing has nobody with a 3.5 rating or less. So that's what will be easy to explore. We will also play with some of the other visuals so that, for example, if you want to just see in general statistics of how many people are there or how many female employees are there or something like that, you could use the card visual. A card visual is perfect for showing single numbers. Let's put the full name inside fields. It will show the first name by default. But can you say just count the names and then we'll say that there are 95 people? You might be thinking 95, but shouldn't there be 100? Well, there are 100 people, but remember, we had a page filter that excludes the other gender. So everything on this page ignores that particular gender value, right? 
So think of this like a report filter for pivot tables, but rather than a single pivot table, all of the reporters are here using that filter. So that's 95 count of the name. Now, 95 is good, but count of full name is kind of lame. What if we want to say employee count? All you have to do is select the card, and then where it says the count of full name, double click, and then just type whatever you want. So we can type employee count, so you have 95 employees. This is a very good way to show that kind of quick summary information. Let's make it smaller. I will show you how to make this more popping and enjoyable. Once that kind of tile is created, I can select that and then we can apply some more formatting from the format. Click on the second tab, General then effects. We can apply maybe a little bit of background color. Let's go with that light blue color. And we'll end up with this kind of tile. If you want, you can also have some sort of rounded borders. If you go to the visual border and then enable that, and then let's just say I want rounded corners of 30 pixels, I'll just put white color as a border they'll kind of give it a rounded edge. Hopefully we can see that now. So once that tile is created, I can copy this and then paste it down here. This is usually a better way than individually formatting them. You do the formatting for one. Hmm, let's make another one. What I want is, in this second tile, I want to show the average salary, so I can put average salary instead of employee count. And then just say average. So that's your average salary. The last tile, what we want to show is the average rating. So that we would get some sort of report like this that shows the overall statistics, like the average salary per department and manager, average ratings, etc. You can add some extra tiles on top of these tables and matrices if you want. I'm going to do just that. Now there are a couple of different ways to add titles. One is that you can select the visual itself. You can go to the Format button and then click the General tab. Then further down there's a Title option. You can enable the title and then you can type it. For example, this is the average salaries that would show up there. I will increase the font size to 30 as well. and a center horizontal alignment. Optionally, you could change everything here, like adding a color for your title. So this is the number one method. In general, I'm not a huge fan of this method. What I normally do is I would just add a text box and then place that on top. So this is how I do it. From the Home tab, add a text box. I just add average salary. The advantage of a text box is that it will give you a little bit more control over the visual layout and formatting. So let's copy this text box. Then we'll move this right here. This is the average rating. So for these text boxes, you can apply a background color. The Power BI is fairly easy to work with in terms of moving things around and formatting them. But certain things, like for example, the space between these tiles is uneven. 
like there's a little bit of space there, but more space there. So to fix that, you can select all of them using Control Multi Select, and then go to Format tab. And then from a line button, you can distribute them vertically so that the spacing is even. Just as we rename the field on the card, you can also give proper names to the horizontal and vertical axes on the line chart. For example, I can click on Format button and then General Tab. Now from the title of the chart, I can simply say New Highs by Year and Month. And then we could just adjust the font sizes if you want, so that kind of shows up. So this is how you are able to explore various themes before you set out. If you define some goals, then you are able to do that. Now you might be thinking, oh Andreas, this is all good, but how do I know what should be explored? This is where having a knowledge of the tool and what is available to you will come in handy. And that's what I aspire to teach you in this course. Throughout the course, we will uncover different themes and different ways to analyze data, so that by the end of it, you feel more confident and comfortable taking on any kinds of data and then saying, yes, I could analyze this, I can present some sort of story from it. And just as earlier, everything works. If I pick on sales, then I can see what's happening with the sales department and how many people are there and what is the new trend for that. Or if I pick Virginia, then I can see that. Now how cool is that? Finally, let's add a name on page 2 down here. HR Data Analysis, for example. And save the changes. So that, in a nutshell, is how to do a little bit more with our HR data in Power BI. Thanks for watching. Previously, we created a data model using data from Wikipedia. So let's pop that open and learn a bit more about how we are going to work with a particular data model in Power BI. The first thing we can do is rename a table if we wish. This table came in with a pretty good name, and we can hover over it and note its GDP by country or territory. And this is when it was last refreshed, which is great. If we expand our table, you'll see the column names. Don't do anything with those. But if you wanted to rename the table as a whole, you could do that right here with a right click from your mouse. You can refresh the data, you can edit the data for this query, and actually, that is a way to open up the Power Query Editor right here. I'm going to close this though and show you another way that you could open the Query Editor rather than going to the table. So you could go to Transform Data on the Home tab of the ribbon, and that will pitch us to the Query Editor as well. The Power Query Editor is a separate tool packaged inside of Power BI. You might be familiar with this tool from Microsoft Excel where it is also used. On the left hand side we have our queries. They appear here in a pane. On the right hand side we have settings for a selected query and you can have multiple queries in a model. So you would just select the query and then view its settings over here. On the right its name. If you click all properties, you can actually add a description to your query if you wish. And I could say this data is from Wikipedia. And anything else that I wanted to say. And as we change our model, you might want to change the description. There are steps that you can take in the query editor, and this is a running history of the steps that have been taken. And we didn't do any of these steps, they were done for us by Power BI. 
The data source was identified. We have lots of HTML here, and that's step one. And here is a link back to our web page, so that if you ever need to know where the data comes from in a web query, just go into the source. Then Power BI extracted this table out of that HTML, and it changed some data types here at the top. These are a series of steps that occur almost every time we connect to a data set that we import. My overall goal across this lecture and the next lecture is to create a list of the 25 countries of the largest GDP. And we're going to do all that work here in the query editor. Notice that my columns came in named column 1, column 2, column 3. And the reason is that the column names in our web page were actually across two rows. So we have, for example, here in column 4, IMF, and it's had done a superscript 5, an estimate. And when Power BI took a look at this, it said, I'm not exactly sure how this works or what all of those columns mean. So what we can do is we can fix this. Noting that this is the first time we see an organization like the International Monetary Fund mention, the first column is the estimate, and the second column is the year for that estimate. So one of the first things that I want to do is say, use my first row as headers, really. So from the Home tab, I'm going to simply click that choice. And it makes my first row headers. Also, these little areas here are called Column Quality and Distribution. In simple words, they show column quality details in data preview, like empty cells, etc. Then I'll need to rename some of the columns, like these two columns with the IMF, for example. If you'd like to rename one of these, you can simply right-click and choose Rename. And this is going to be the IMF estimate. I'm going to rename my next column IMF Year. And I have four more of these to rename. So here's World Bank Estimate. World Bank Year. CIA Estimate and CIA Year. So we've done a bit of the renaming that works. Then we have this first row, this all null values, except where it says estimate in year. And I actually want to delete this row. So I'm going to click on the Home tab, and I'm going to choose to remove the row. And I can remove the top rows, bottom rows, duplicate, blank rows, remove errors, but I'm going to remove the top one now. Now, note that each one of these actions that I'm taking is being added to the steps here at the right-hand side, which is pretty slick, because if I want to roll back a step, I can simply click here to undo that remove top rows. And I can choose to modify my query by removing steps higher up. But if I do, it says, are you sure you want to delete this step? Because if I do, the steps after it might have relied on it, and that would break my query. So you've prevented from accidentally deleting perhaps one step, but you can do that if that's something you wish to do. The last thing I want to do is fix my data types, because column IMF estimate here is predominantly numbers, but it has some text in it and some blanks. To modify your data type, you're going to select the IMF estimate column, and then click on the transform tab, and we're going to change my data type here to a number. And these are whole numbers. When I apply this data type change to change this to numbers, it throws some errors. And the reason is that there were text values in this column, and this is not a number, so it returns an error. 
and it says 15% of the changes that were made resulted in errors. If I wish, I can choose to remove those errors, and what I just did was I actually removed all the data that had errors in it. Hmm, that's a bit of a problem. I don't want entire countries to go away at this point, so let's undo this last step. If there wasn't any data here at all, it wouldn't be in this table. It's true that we have empty cells in a lot of the entries, for example the IMF year, but either World Bank or CIA has data for that country or territory, or it wouldn't be on our list. So let's fix the column for the World Bank estimate, which should be numbers. In the same way, let's also set the data type to whole numbers. And again, it'll pitch a few errors for us. And then let's go into the CIA estimate, and in the CIA estimate, let's choose whole numbers as well. So we've changed our data types, and you read that the data type right here at the top. Notice that we didn't have the same problem with the CIA data because they have data on some territories that the World Bank and IMF don't keep track of. With these changes made, I want to apply the changes to my model. So I'm going to slide that over here to close and apply. It says I have 37 errors, but we know where they are. That's okay. Now notice that my field list has been modified to the names that I chose. And when I go and look at my data, I have 229 rows that I had to begin with. But as I scroll down, I'll be running across some places where I have data that's empty data. And that's okay. We don't need to do anything to fix this here. We'll talk about it in the next lesson. This is our GDP data model that we worked on in the prior lesson. I want to throw this back into the query editor. So in the home table, let's go to the transform data section, transform data. And then the power query editor opens up a new window. And I would like to reduce this data set so that what I have are the top 20 countries in terms of their GDP per capita. And along the way then, I might find that I have some errors to deal with. The data set that I want to use overall is the World Bank data set. It's a newer data set and it tends to exclude territories and include countries because the data set here for CIA, for example, does include other territorial units. And also some of the data here is older, 2014, 2015, whereas the World Bank tends to be 2020, 2021, and it's simply a matter of choosing which data set is going to meet your business purpose. So having decided that I don't care about the IMF data, I'm going to select this column IMF Estimate and remove it from this button. And the same thing is true with the IMF year. And for that matter, I'm going to get rid of my CIA data so I can hold the control key and select these columns as well. IMF year, CIA estimate and CIA year, okay? And notice that you have been given a choice to either select the columns that you want to remove and remove them, or select the columns that you want to keep and remove the other columns. But I'm going to remove the selected columns. And what I'm left with then is four columns, country or territory, region, World Bank estimate, and World Bank year. Having decided that we're going to use the World Bank estimate, that frees us up to remove the errors from the World Bank data, because those errors represent countries that were not included in the World Bank estimates. Perhaps they are territories and included in other countries, that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is select the World Bank estimate column, right-click and choose Remove Errors. And now we have 199 rows rather than the 229 previously. Well, this is kind of slick then. So now I want the top 20 rows. So first I should make sure that we've sorted that in order. 
So I'm going to choose Sort Descending. And now I have the countries with the largest GDP estimate in the World Bank at the top. And my goal was to narrow this down to solely 20 rows. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to choose Keep Rows, Keep Top Rows, and it says how many. And I'm going to say I want to keep 20 of them. And I now have my query results, 20 rows, 4 columns. One more thing I would really like to do, because we have a bit more information, this more was actually a hyperlink. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of my text transformations. That's extract. And this would allow me to extract, for example, the first characters, which would allow me to take part in an account number, for example, the last characters. So I want the first three characters of the text. Let's click on first characters. So I'm going to say keep the first three characters and I'm going to click OK. And notice that the remaining characters is now taken out of our data set. I also have tools that come alive when I, for example, select a column that is numbers. Then all of my number column transformations are enabled. And then I also have specific transformations for date and time columns. But I have now also achieved what I wish to from this data set. And all of that remains to me then is to apply and close my changes, reload my data into the Power BI desktop. And here are my 20 rows of data, my data model that I'll be using for other purposes. We're going to create a new data model so that we can do some filtering, setting data types, and replacing values. I'm going to start with a new model. So I'm going to choose Get Data Web and we'll be prompted to provide a URL. The page that I'm going to navigate to in Wikipedia is the list of the U.S. states and territories by historical population. Copy the URL, Control plus C, swing back to the Power BI desktop, and paste the URL right here. Control plus V. After you've pasted, click OK and then connect. In Power BI Desktop, we'll make a connection to that web page. And here I have a list of my tables. Nine HTML tables and three suggested tables. I'm actually going to take a guess that the name table here is precisely the first one that I want. So click on the total population from 1790 to 1860. This is historical census data from the first census in 1790 until the census of 1860. Here's our data, and I'm going to load it. Wait for the connection to get created. And my fields list is populated. But notice it's column 1, column 2, and so on. So we know we have a little bit of work to do. Let's click the data view. This is what our data looks like. And let's immediately drop into the query editor. Click into the Home tab, Transform Data, and Transform Data. When we retrieve this data, only three things were really done. We have the source, some extraction from HTML, again, where this data comes from, and then one data type was changed, at least one. And if we scroll across, we'll see that a lot of text is changed to numbers. Okay, that works. We still have work to do. First, because columns 3, 4, 5, and so on have year numbers in them, Power BI made the first type of assumption that Excel would, which is, it assumed that 
they were values and not column headings. On the Home tab in the Transformation section, simply choose Use First Row as Headers. And our headers will be prompted just like that. And our headers are prompted. And Column 2, which is admitted, was changed to a number. And that's cool. Next, we have this little green bar all the way across the first column, across most of the second part of the third. This actually tells us about the validity of our data. So if I point, for example, to the third column, it has the column name 1790 at the top, and it says 33% of the entries, 19 of them are valid. There are no errors, but 38 of them, or 67%, are empty. We're going to scroll back here to the admitted column and note that it says I have 56 valid values and that one of them is empty. If I scroll to the bottom, there's a summary row at the bottom for the entire United States. It's null. So what I can do very easily is I can point here to the admitted to the green bar and choose remove empty. And if I do so, the filtered rows will be added as a step here. And now I have 56 rows according to my status bar in the lower left hand corner. And my green bar goes all the way across to the admitted column because there is no null values in this column. Next what I'd like to do is eliminate any of the 56 states that were not states by 1860 because they will have nothing to do with the null values all the way across. If I choose for example Guam, Hawaii, or Idaho and click on the row indicator, then if you click scroll down to the bottom, notice that all of the values are null. So I'm going to scroll across to the last year in which this was a census. It's 1860, and this is the last census in this table of historical data. We, of course, continue to have a census, and if I point to the green bar, it says 1860 there, and are 13 empty values. And I'm going to remove these empty rows, so Hawaii and Alaska and 11 others just left us. We now have 43 rows, and all of them had data in at least 1860, if not in every census year in this historical record. This is a good time to at least glance at my data types and decide whether I like them or not. I have text in the first column, and I have whole numbers, and all those others, and those work for me, at least for right now. Another common transformation is to replace some values, and I'd like to show you how to do that. I'm going to click on the column for 1790 and choose Replace Values. And I'm going to tell it that when it's the value of null, I want to replace it with zero. And I'm going to say OK. And notice that in the column we no longer have any values that say null. They say zero. Now, I actually want to undo that because zero would actually imply that we went out to take a census and that there were no people there. In fact, it's null because there was no census taken in that state or territory in that particular year. If I want to know more about this particular applied step, I can click the setting button and it will tell me what it is I did. I go, yep, and that's the one that I want to get rid of, and cancel that dialog and simply get rid of replace value to put it back. One more thing. We do have the ability to sort and filter here. We have sort ascending and sort descending choices that are available to us, and when we use them in here, it means something because we're editing the query. So if I wanted to sort, for example, by date admitted in ascending order, I can do that. And now I have a list organized around when they become states and were admitted to the Union rather than in an alphabetical order. If I want to undo that, which I do, I can simply remove that applied step. I'm going to save our model as Census USA, so I'm going to apply all of my changes that I made, close the query editor, and save my model.
I'll see you in the next lesson. We were working with this data set in the last lecture. It's historical data from the census of 1790 to 1860. If you think about this data set, it's really a pivot table. Originally, we had transactional data. In 1790, there was a count taken in Georgia, and it was repeated again 10 years later and 10 years after that. So if we look just at Georgia's data, we would have a series of rows for Georgia, one for each year they participated in the census. So Georgia would have eight rows, Colorado only one. And all of that data was then summarized into a pivot table, and this is the result. But occasionally, we need to have that original data back so that we can create the visualizations that we want to create. We essentially want to take a pivot table and unpivot it. And if you ever need to do that, there's a reason to know about the Power Query Editor in Power BI. So I'm going to click Home, go to the Transformation tab, Transform Data, and I want to unpivot this data. So every single row then would have the same information about the state, the year it was admitted. But it would also have the year of the census and the data value for that year of the census. I'm going to choose Name, hold Control, and then choose the Admitted column. And then I'm going to click the Transform tab and choose Unpivot Columns, Unpivot Other Columns, and I'm making it intentionally because what we get then is we get Alabama and we get an attribute and a value. So I actually get the data set that I want, which has the name of the state, the year it was admitted, the year of the census, and the value. Now we could actually have the name of the state and the year it was admitted in another table. That would make this more normalized. But in a data set this small, I'm not going to worry about normalizing it to that extent. We now need to change a couple of column names. Right click, rename, census year. And the value here we should rename population. even though that's not quite true either. As a result of our unpivot operation, we now have 242 rows, each row of which contains the name of the state, the year it was admitted, the year of the census that's being reported, and the value for that census for that year. Covering all the commands that are possible in the Power Query Editor is more than what we can do in this course, but I do want to show you some of the other choices that might be useful as you're working with data for your organization. If we look at the Tables section, we have the ability to transpose a table, which treats rows as columns and columns as rows. It's the same command that we have available to us as a paste function in Microsoft Excel. I can reverse the rows so that the last rows are displayed first. I can return accounts of numbers of rows in this table. So if I want to know how many there are, I just click and it says 242. Simply cancel the applied step to get it back. Staying on the transform tab, we have types of data over here as well. When we bring that data into the module, Power BI automatically detects data type. But if you wanted it to check a particular column, you can do that. And the reason that you might do that is if you have a column with a lot of null values, but all the other columns are numbers. That might be assigned originally as text, but if I've chosen the column, for example, admitted, and say detect data type, and then the data type is clearly numeric without the presence of nulls, sends this here, detect data type, it's a number. So notice that this could be useful after you've made other transformations to your data. You can replace values as we've done previously. You can fill up and down as you would in Excel. And you can move from the left to the right, beginning and end, the same choices that we have available when you right-click a column and choose Move. But here on the ribbon, the next sections are dependent on what types of data you have. So, for example, if a column that is a text column, like the name column, then I would have options to split the column by a delimiter. 
by a number of characters and by positions. You would do this if, for example, you have a column that has a city, state, and you want to split that into a column based on the comma and the space the limiter between the city and the state. You can modify the format of a column, lowercase, uppercase, capitalize each word, which is a proper case, trim any trailing or leading spaces, clean any non-printing or non-printable characters, otherwise known usually as object characters or object code. You can add a prefix or add a suffix. So if you had an account number and you needed it to proceed with the three characters, you could do that. You can extract the first characters, last characters, a range of characters, text before, after, or between delimiters. And you can ask it what the length is of each of the text entries in a column. The number group works in columns that are numbers, and the number columns allow us to apply some aggregate functions, like some maximum, minimum, and so on to do the basic math, scientific, some trig, rounding, or just some information. Is it odd or is it even? And if we had a date column, would we be able to format the exact elements of date values and time values here? All of these tools are available to you based on the type of data that you have in a column. And for any column, you can set data type, detect data type, unpivot, and so on. We're now done working with this data model, so I'm going to click back on Home, and I'm going to close this. You can apply the changes and save that if you wish, or you can keep it as it is, so that you can practice over the modifications that we've already made. So if you wish, you can leave it as it is, or you could discard the changes, apply the changes. It's up to you. In this demo, I want to look at how you can get any data from internet and make some analysis on top of it. While it may not be necessary to connect to websites from a day-to-day -day work perspective, many times we will have to deal with sources that are other than Excel when we are analyzing data. So this lesson is an example of how you can connect with things, how you can bring them over, and how you can work with Power Query so that you have the data in the necessary shape for analysis. So for this purpose, I'm going to define an arbitrary goal, which is I want to explore the population trends in the 50 states of the United States of America. We could do this for all the countries in the world, or states of Australia, or regions of India, or something else as well. I just thought we would pick something very simple and straightforward, so this is what I go with. Whenever you want to connect with data from the web, the first step is to find out where the data can be accessed. So this is where you want to go to the internet and just to search for some data. This is what I've already done. I have found two pages where that information is available. One is a Wikipedia page and it has all the details in a tabular format. So it has the ranking under the name of the state population estimate as of July 1, 2022 and a census population from 2010. It also has some statistics like percentage change and absolute change and how many seats that particular state has in the House of Representatives in the United States and some other related bids. The other one in this page is the worldpopulationreview.com and it does also have a similar data set. It has a rank state 2023 population, so it's one year ahead of the Wikipedia page, and then the growth since 2010 and the percentage of USA as a population and the density. Because this one has a density, I'm kind of favoring this one. It might be an interesting thing to explore which states have a very high density or very low density, etc. So let's go and do this. We will need to copy the URL from which we want to get this data, and then we will go to Power BI. As I said, when you open Power BI, you might have a blank screen, or you might have this welcome screen. I usually get the welcome screen, and then I close it. But the welcome screen does have the necessary buttons to start your work, which is Get Data. So we'll click on that because we are connecting to the web and then we will simply type web and then we will find the web connector that is necessary to import and then we will connect to this. I'll paste the URL there 
worldpopulationreview.com slash states. And then let's see if we can actually connect to get this data. Mind you, not all websites are very friendly. So if you try to connect to an airline website to fetch the travel phase, you may not really get the results. But here, the table one of that table website does have all 50 states. We will select this and then we will load the data directly. Let's see if there's anything that we need to be doing here. I believe this is fairly good enough, so we can start loading this. If needed, we go and transform our data into this query so that you can make some changes. Now that the data is loaded, it comes here as table 1 and it does have all of these information, right? We can start visualizing this. For example, I want to see maybe a map US states population. So I could put in one of these maps. We'll start with this. We will figure out if that doesn't work. Then we will need to add. So I'll add the state as a location. For my instance of Power BI Desktop, I did not immediately see the shape map as a visualization option. However, I was able to enable this feature by simply going to File and then Options and Settings. Now click Options. Then under Global Section, click the Security menu. Okay, so now I will check this box. Use map and filled map visuals. Okay, let's delete the state and drag it again into the location field. Great! And then the 2023 population as a bumble size. If you make this map nice and big, you can see all the states of the USA here as a map. Well, this map is alright. It's not the ideal map because the problem with this map is because Alaska is all the way over there and this is probably Hawaii. It's here and it's kind of neat to stretch out all of those. And it has all of the elements that do not present any value. But it is still worth looking at the sizes. You can see that California is a bigger state in Florida and Texas and all the usual suspects. You could try other visualizations. You can select this and you can switch this to, for example, a field map. Field map is not useful if you do not have US states. It only works for certain types of visualizations. But this is perfect because it is now able to kind of show the US map with Alaska and Hawaii on the bottom corner here. And it does show this. Let's drag the population inside of Legend. I could also see the growth rate instead. These are percentages. I prefer the population field. So that's the field map. And then there is another map called ArcGIS map, which can be used to visualize geographical information with reference layers added on top. We won't be able to use that right away in this scenario, but at some point in the future, we may come back and add that. Now let's go back to the data here from the web page. And if you notice, this has a population density, but it doesn't really have, for example, the number of seats in the House of Representatives. That data is coming from Wikipedia, right? So one thing that you might be thinking is, oh, maybe if I can get this in a data table as well, that I could combine both of them. These kinds of things are called table joins. Like, you want to combine the data from two or three tuples and then visualize that. So we will attempt to do that. I'm saying attempt because in order to be able to join, the wording here is California. It needs to be the exact same on the Wikipedia page as well. And I hope that is how it goes. 
We will go to the Wikipedia web page and then copy this address as well. We will say get data from the web and paste that there. The Wikipedia page will show up in the navigator. Looks like there are multiple tables, and that's the table that has the data, state rankings. As you can see, this table is having the data that we want, but it's not really all very clean. So this is the table, it is having the data, but there is an extra row on top which is useless, but the wording is to match. And then this is the population information. And then that's the total seats in the United States House of Representatives, right? So we can't really load this because it's going to be useless if you load it directly. So I'm going to click on the Transform Data button. And load this into the Power Query where we can go and quickly clean up the data. This is the role that Power Query plays. Power Query is for connecting to the data, bring it over, and then also do any necessary polish on the data. The first thing that I want to do is I'm going to name this table as State Seats. That's what it is. And then what we want is we want the Name column, then hold down Control and select the Total Number of Seats column. Those two columns are selected. Now right click and then say remove other columns. This will remove all other columns and then we just keep these two columns. At this point it makes sense to quickly observe what Power Query window is really doing and have a brief overview of this as well. So Power Query as you could see is the place where you can really edit all the incoming data and change the behavior of it or nature of it and even make some amenities to it. Within Power Query, the kind of changes that you can perform usually falls into two buckets. One is you're transforming things, which is when you're adding columns or removing columns, or you're taking a column value and then multiplying that with a number or adding to it. Those are transformations. So you're keeping the data as it is, but making changes in place. Another type of thing that you could do on the data is that you're adding new columns. So that's the Add Column tab. Apart from this, there are also other bits and bops to help us get around. And then there's the Home ribbon, which is having some of the commonly used functionalities, like choosing columns or removing or splitting columns and doing some group, etc. That's the top area. The window itself is divided into three areas. The major area is your actual data view. This is where you're previewing the data. Keep in mind that by default, Power Query is always showing just a preview of your data. Let's say you connect to a database and you're bringing over all the sales transactions. Power Query will usually do for the top 1000 rows so that you can actually see it and then you can apply some conditions and rules on top of it. But it won't load all of the data here. It will only load when you click on that and close the apply button when the load happens. If you're thinking, oh, why is that the case? Why can't I see all the data here? This is because within Power Query, your role as data analyst is to only define rules and conditions for getting the data clean. So you are not here really interested in looking at all of the data, but you're only here just so that you could clean it up and make sure that everything is nice and tidy. But within Power BI, you're analyzing the data. So there you must have all the data. But here you don't need so to make to speed things up. Power Query just loads up a preview, and then depending on how many connections you have, the Query tab will list all of the connections. So you could have two connections. Right now we have Table 1, which is connecting to the World Population website, and then this one is connecting to the Wikipedia website, and those two tables are there. And then for each query, we think of these as tables, but they are essentially queries. So for each query, you will have several steps applied on top of that. Those steps are listed here along with the query name. 
And then there is also a formula bar on top. Depending on how much you've used Power Query before, you may not even see this. So the formula bar is something that tells you what Power Query is doing behind scenes to go from one step to another. You can enable this by going to View Ribbon and clicking on the formula bar. I recommend that you turn this on. This is a one-time thing. Once you do it, it will be available in all Power Queries of all Power BI workbooks that you open. But by watching the special instructions, you can also learn how Power Query works. Power Query uses a special language called M. M is for money or monkey, and using that M language can also tell Power Query that you want it to be done. But M language tends to be fairly complicated with pickup up front. So we will not bother about M language right away, but we will come back and use a little bit of M here and there to get around some sticky situations. Fortunately, you do not have to learn M language. There's tons of things that you could do with just the ribbon on top. Okay, enough introduction. Let's see how to put this into action. We did connect it to the website Navigated, and then Power Query did some data type challenges, and then we removed those columns. So those are the four steps done. If at any point you change your mind and you want to amend a step, all you have to do is locate the step. And usually many steps would have a cog or a gear icon next to them. If you clicked on that, it will reopen the state. And then here it's saying all of the columns I selected, name and total seats. If I want, I could also add any other column from there. So that's how you will change that. Now, if you notice, the first row is useless. It's not really helpful at all. The actual database begins from row two. So I want to really delete the row number one. This can get done by clicking on the remove rows, remove top rows, one row. So that will kind of get rid of that. Then the next biddy is if I come back and all the way down here, I also see that there are other items at the bottom like Guam and U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa and etc. All of these are not really data for me. So what we could do is we could delete all rows from 53 onward. You can remove bottom rows and then type how many rows we want from the bottom. I believe this is 53 to 60, so 7 or 8 rows. Yes, it's 8 rows. And then once that is done, what we could do is we could get rid of these non-voting ones and then put them into 0. What we will do is I'll click on the column and then I can change type to whole number. This will do it for all except those non-voting ones. That will become an error because there's an extra text bit there. So Power Query couldn't really convert it into a number. Once those errors are there, then I can right click and then say replace errors with zero. This would be a roundabout way to fix that problem. We could also replace that with one if you want. I have really no idea what would be best. So this is the state name and that's the total seats. And there's a big title here. What we could do is rename the column to seats. We now have a table that tells me by each state how many seats there are and then by each state what the population is in this table. Let's also rename the queries. So this is state pop, and that is state seats. We have two tables, each providing one part of the story. One table is giving me the population information. Another table is giving me the seat information. What we could do is we could combine those two tables within Power Query itself to come up with a final table. That's one way. If you want to do that here, you could use the Merge Queries option. Alternatively, you can push both of these data into data sets into Power BI, and then from there you can deal with this. I'll click on the Close and Apply.
Now you can see that there are two tables within our fields list. One is the state population and another is the state seats. So now that we've got two tables, we could go into the model view. And here I can select my state and link it to the state or the territory there. so that there is a relationship between both tables. And if you click on that line, you can see that it's actually a relationship between state and state. The number one and the one here indicates that this is a relationship one to one. It's state here and has a mapping value there. That's what it is. And there's a bit of arrows going on and that's going to indicate that there is a BI directional filtering happening here, which is a little bit technical for now. So we will be ignoring that bit and we will come back to that in a minute. Now that that bit is done, I can select this and rather than looking at population, I can also look at a number of seats. Our color scheme is now diverging. We could go back to fill colors from format options, then just adjust this so that the important states where they control most seats in the House of Representatives are in the darkest blue color. All right, I hope you found these lectures useful and interesting. Thank you so much for watching. In this next lesson, we're going to use the data shaping tools of Power BI Desktop to create a model that includes multiple tables. Let me give you an idea of what it is that we have and what we're trying to accomplish. I have two Excel workbooks, Continents and Growth Rate. I took all the data from the web and specifically from these websites. So you can find data from the internet for free and import them inside Excel. Our first worksheet in the workbook growth rate is countries and their populations as of the date of record and their percent of world population and the source that comes from. We want to be able to visualize our data on a continent by continent basis. So in our second Excel file continents, we also have the information on the continents the names of the country, the capital of the country, and we've also separated this into different worksheets. Africa, Asia, Europe, America, and Oceania. This isn't unusual that we have data that has been disaggregated based on geography or based on time. For example, you might have one or more workbooks full of transactions, but each year's transaction or each quarter is put on a different worksheet or in a different workbook. We're going to use Power BI Desktop to reverse this process of disaggregating data into different sheets by combining it into one usable data model. We could try to do this here in Excel, but there are several reasons that we wouldn't want to. One is that error prone. We can make mistakes even with copy and paste. The second reason is that there are many valid reasons that somebody else is using this Excel data just as it is. Perhaps it is not our data set. Power BI lets us take this data and work it in to create the data model that we need without disturbing the original data set here in Excel. We have one more set of data that we want to include as well, and this is a population growth rate as a percentage. This is stored in the Growth Rate Excel workbook, okay? So let's dive in. We will begin by taking the data that is in the continents workbook and adding a column to each of the continents tables so that we can say, for example, that all of the countries in the Africa sheet are on the continent of Africa. All of them in Asia are in the continent of Asia. And you would do this if you were working with a set of 10 different locations for your company. If you had a separate worksheet for each location, before we could consolidate those, you would want to add a column that listed the location. Basically, that listed the information that's sitting on the sheet tab. So I'm going to close both Excel workbooks and open Power BI.
I'm going to choose Excel as my data source. So you could either click here or here. Go to the folder of Exercise Files and choose the Continents Excel file and open it up. After we have our connection and our navigators open, I'm going to select the continental data for Africa, America, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Each one of these is essentially the same. There's their column for the country name, capital city, population, and key. We're going to load all of this data. Power BI is creating five queries to import these five sets of data. And so here we have our fields. And we'll begin with Africa. Go to Home tab and transform our data. The Power Query Editor opens. I'm going to follow exactly the same series of steps in each and every one of these five queries so that I have five sets of data that are easy to combine. The first step is to remove the population column. We don't need it. So right click, remove. Step two, I'm going to send the key column to beginning where I think a key column belongs. So right click and move to the beginning. Great. And then finally, I'm going to add a new column. There's a command for that right here. So I'm going to select the capital city column and choose add column. Custom column. And the name of this column is continent because we're in the Africa table. The custom formula is equal to Africa, but I need to put this in quotes because it is static text equals Africa. No syntax errors. This looks good. So click OK, and you'll notice that when I do this, I get a new column right here at the end so that each and every country has Africa listed as its continent. All I've done here is create a column of static text. There's a lot more that you can do when you're adding new columns. You can create calculations based on other columns. There's an entire formula language, M, for use in the Power Query Editor. I need to follow the same series of steps for each one of these queries. So I could click on America and the same thing. Remove the population columns. Send the key column to the beginning. And add a column that's custom column. And in each case, we will name this continent. But in each case, we will put quotes in the name of the continent. And click OK. I'm going to continue to do this with the other queries in my data model. And you can do the same in yours.
and when I'm all done, I'm going to close and apply all pending changes. I like to do a quick check from data view. Yes, all looks good. Let's save our report and I'll name it Countries. And I will see you in the next lesson. In the last lesson, we created a PBIX file called Countries. And if you're working along with me, this is the same file. If you've just opened this from the exercise file, remember that you will need to change the data source to the location where you have placed the download exercise files so that it can be appropriately connected to the Excel workbook that served as our data source. We have data in five different tables, one for each continent. And what I want to take is each one of these queries, each of these data sets, and combine them into a single query that includes all five continents in the same way that I might need to combine all the results that came from surveys taken in four different cities or production data from five different manufacturing plants. The more I work with business intelligence, the more that I realize that large sets of data are very helpful and that the way many of us have spent our time in the past taking large data sets and separating them by year or by geography has made them harder to work with, harder to analyze. If individual worksheets or workbooks for each continent or each one of the clinics or manufacturing plants is the primary way that we track our data, we make it incrementally more difficult to do year-over-year -year comparisons, or in this case, continent-to-continent -continent comparisons. Multi-year or multi-location data sets like we're going to create here are more and more the norm. Let's jump into transform data. Transform data right here. And here we are in the Power Query Editor. I'm going to start with the query for Africa simply because it is first in the alphabetical order, but it's also where humanity started. So it's a fitting place to start. I don't want to lose my Africa query, so I'm going to begin by duplicating. I'm going to right click and choose duplicate. And now I have two. And I'm simply going to right click on this duplicate and I'm going to rename it all countries. So all countries only includes the data from the countries in Africa. Now, what I want to do is append all data from the other tables, and I'll begin with America. On the Home tab, choose Appended Queries and Append Queries. It says, concatenate rows from two tables into a single table. So let's do that. Let's say in our All Countries table, we're going to Append America, and click OK. And if you scroll down, there are entries from America. Pretty slick. All right, let's do it again. Append queries, append queries. And this time, let's just choose three or more tables. Tables to append. Available tables. Asia, Europe, Oceania. Just throw them all over at one time. Add, OK. And give it a minute. And we now have 235 rows in all countries, Africa, Asia, Europe, and so on. And note that the custom columns we added allow us to identify which continent it is. We have one grand query that lists the countries of the world, their capitals, and their continents. This will give us the ability to sort and filter data and visualizations based on continent as well as by country. This looks great. I'm going to save this with a new name. So let's close and apply so that our changes can be applied. We're all set, and I'm going to choose Save File As. And I'm going to save this as All Countries. 
I'll see you in the next lecture. This is allcountries.pbix, the file where we left it at the end of last lesson. And you'll notice that my key column has values, but they were inherited from various queries, Africa, America, and so on and so forth. So we have duplicate values. We have one though, 58, and then one through 55 for America, starting again with Asia at number one. This key column should be unique values. It's not, so it doesn't do as much good. I'm going to want to remove this column and replace it with a true index column. So let's click Home, Transform Data, Transform Data, so that we can go back to our Power Query Editor. Let's take the existing key column and let's simply remove it. Now let's go to the Add Column tab and insert an index column. And our choice is to start from zero, to start from one, or to start from a custom value. And if you choose custom, you have the ability to also increment by a number other than one. You could start with 100 and increment by fives, for example. But we simply want to start with one and work our way down. So we'll choose index column from one. Here's our index column. Let's move it to the beginning. And I'm going to rename this column as ID. I'm going to return to Home tab and apply my modifications. We're going to add two more small data sources to our model that will provide some real value, but also some issues. They're going to require some cleanup. Close the query editor, and now let's import data from the Excel workbook. And the workbook that we want is called Growth Rate, and I'm going to open that. And the two tables that we want are Population by Country and Population Growth Rate, which is also by country. I'm going to load them both. Here they come. And let's drop right into our Power Query Editor. Let's begin with Population by Country. Population by Country has a date. We also have percent of world population. The column notes is useless, so I'm going to remove it. Our green bars all the way across let us know that we're not throwing errors anywhere. Population growth rate has also some data that was imported like population growth rate and key. Let's remove the key column. I've cleaned up my data. I'm pretty happy with it. I'm going to apply all of my changes to the model. The type of cleanup that you have to do depends exactly on your data. It's not unusual that you'll need to change some data types, that you'll need to replace some data. Perhaps you have data sets where values that should have been left as nulls or empty, somebody has typed NA, and you want to remove those. So examine your data, pay close attention to your indicator bar, that will let you know if your data is valid or if it's a problem. And when your data is all cleaned up, you're ready to proceed. If you'd like to save this, you may do so. And I'll see you in the next lesson. This is the same PBIX file that I've been working with for the past lessons. Our set of countries, continents, population, and population growth. We really have three primary tables that we're going to use, which are all countries, population by country, and population growth rate, which I would like to relate those three tables to each other. So I'm going to click Model View, and this is the first time that we've been here. I'm going to collapse the properties pane. All right, we have just lots of things going on here, and I'm going to change my zoom slider so that you can see all of the tables that I have here. And some are related, and some aren't. Let's move some of these tables around so that you can see them better. 
So, population growth rate is related to Africa, America, Asia, Oceania, population by country, and all countries table. And you can see the basis of this relationship. What it says is that these tables are related by their country field. They each have a country field. How did these relationships get here? Because Power BI created them based on the fact that they all had a country column. Why didn't it include the others? The Europe one, for example. Some of it is timing. If we bring all tables in at the same time, it's a little bit different than if we bring them in one by one. I'm going to drag the population by country over here. And I'm going to delete the relationship between population growth rate and all countries. Okay? Now I'm going to relate population by country to all countries based on the name of the country. I'm going to drag country to name and drop it here, and that will create a relationship between the two. If I right click and I look at the properties of this relationship, it says I'm relating population by country to all countries, and it is a one to one relationship. If I have a country listed in all countries, it will appear at most once, or perhaps no times in population by country. This question of one to one or one to many is a question of cardinality. So one-to-one -one is appropriate, and the way the Power BI determined that was it looked at all the data in the tables and said, oh, each of these things appears here only once. An example of one-to-many relationship is if you have one company and many employees, for example. So we'd have a company's table and an employee's table. And then we have one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many -many relationship. This is a one-to-one -one relationship between country and name right here, and that works. Let's click OK. Now let's delete all the other relationships between continents and population growth rate table. I want only these three tables to be related. That's my data model. Now I could have removed the other tables and asked Power BI to attempt to determine what the relationships are in the model that works. But if I know what the columns are that I'm going to use to relate these tables, then it, it's equally easy to open the model view and relate them myself. And finally, why do we bother to do this at all? Because by relating these tables, I can ask valid questions about, for example, the population growth rate in a country versus the current population because they are both related through all countries. I have a lot of queries here and I'm going to use them all, but they all show up in my fields list and this makes it more tedious for me to work with the fields list. But it also means that if I share this Power BI data model with others, that there'll be data that they probably don't need to use and it adds a level of unnecessary complexity to their use. The only data that I really want people to see for reporting purposes is population by country, population and growth rate, and all countries. That's it. I could delete the others if I wish, but I also have the choice simply to hide them. So I'm going to hide them. Hide Africa in report view. I'm going to hide America in report view and Asia in Europe and Oceania. Now, they're still available to me here in the data model because that they're a part of a data model. But what I'm left with are these three tables that I've built relationships with. And if I go back to report view here, where we will actually build visuals, notice I'm down to simply three queries. Much more compact, much clearer. We begin with the file that we're using at the end of the last lesson. We're going to merge a couple of these data sources together so that we get a single larger query. You might do this for a number of reasons. One reason is the reason of speed, because it's easier and faster to pull data from a single cache query than from several queries. And you might do it for the reason of simplicity, because you have a lot of small queries and you'd like to merge them together. 
or you might do it to standardize your data, which is the reason that we're going to do it. But sooner or later, you'll want to merge two or more queries together in Power BI Desktop. So I'm going to transform data. And let's highlight all the country's queries. And on the Home tab, the same place that we found Append, I'm going to choose Merge Queries. Merge Queries is new. Because I had selected all country queries, it's listed here. And the question is, what do I want to merge it with? So, I'm going to choose population by country, and I'm going to choose the country field in both. Now at the bottom it says, the selection matches 185 of 235 rows from the first table. So, we have 50 that come back with no values. And the reason is that in our population by country list, many of these are territories. So we have these countries by our initial list, only countries. Then the next we'll have a list that includes countries and territories. I could use fuzzy matching to perform this merge. This is a poor data set to do this with because what it does is it tries to match more based on the information being similar, but perhaps there's a typo, that sort of thing. But I really don't get anything extra out of this data set because there aren't typos. These are two different ways to report on the same data, and in our organization, we're really driving off all this standardized all countries list. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm choosing the correct type of join right here. There is a whole list of joins, but the first is the most common one if you start with the query that you want to use as your main source of information, your main list of countries in our case. In this case, it says use all the information that we have out in our first list. Use that country as your gospel, so to speak. And then anybody who matches from the second and include that information. The second choice is the opposite. Use all of the records from the second, but only the matching records from the list. And notice in this case, we only get 185 rows of 195. And then we have the other lesser used options, but they may be options you need for your data set. If I said I have two lists of customers and want everybody in no matter which tables they appear from, I would use a full outer join. And if I want to see the records where we have the match in both tables, I will use an inner join. And then we have some joins that let us see who the outliers are, who's missing. Left anti-join and right anti-join. Show me who doesn't show up. Show me, for example, the list of territories. The choice I want to make here is the default choice for the left outer join. Use all countries as our main data source and return anyone who matches from the second and I'm going to click OK. When I do that, I have a list that includes the country name, the capital city, the continent, and then we have population by country, and it's a table. In the upper right-hand corner, I click this button and tell it that I want to expand, and I'm asked what columns I want. I don't want all columns. I don't need the rank anymore. I don't need the country name because I have it. I want the population, the date, and the percent of the world population. And I click OK. And now I have population by country population, population by country date, and population by country percent of the world population. So it shows me in each of these cases where my data is coming from. And note that because we have 50 empties, we have a less than full bar at the top in terms of our validity. If we want to scroll down to the bottom or search, we can find those territories that are reported here. Here is my merge one, right here. Now I'd also like to add my other data. I have my population by country. Now I want my growth rate, so this is going to be a repeat. I'm going to go into the merge queries, and this time, I'm not merging them as new. I'm simply going to merge a second query into this query. And I'm going to select population growth rate.
left out or joined based on name and country. And here I get 209 of 235 rows from the first table. Click OK. And now from the population growth rate table, I'm going to simply choose population growth rate and I will use the original name. So it will say population growth rate dot population growth rate. Now I don't need it. I'm just going to remove that column name. So it'll simply say population growth rate. And there are my growth rates. So now I have one query that contains all of the data from really all of my tables. I'm going to rename it, and rather than naming it All Countries, I'm going to say All Countries and Population Data. If I wished, I could click in the All Properties and document the types of joins that I used, and normally I would do that. You already know how to get to that dialog box here. So this is how you can merge queries. In these two part lessons, we're going to take a look at how to create some simple sales or retail reports using Power BI. This assumes that you're already familiar with Power BI. You should have built some introductory stuff with it. So we will focus more on storytelling, report layout, and understanding of various visuals and interactions within Power BI. For the purpose of this exercise, we'll be using a coffee chain sales data from 2022 and 2023, and just use random data to understand various things. So here is the final report that we will construct. It showcases the sales performance of any given time window. So you can actually select any range of dates and then you can understand what was the total sales, how much is the cost of the goods sold, what is the total other expenses, and what is the net profit at the end of it. It also shows the breakdown of sales in various product types. We sell four types of products, espresso, coffee, herbal tea, and tea. And also what's happening in individual markets, Southeast, Central, and West markets, as well as across all the states that we operate our stores, whether we have reached our budget profit goals or not. So as you can see from this configuration here, none of the states have met the targets except for this one. This is actually pretty much borderline around the target value. So anything in the gray area is good, red is bad. Let's go ahead and create this from scratch on a blank page. That will give you a full journey of how such a report, construction, and storytelling can happen. As you can see here, I have a Microsoft Access database with all the data that we want. So I'm going to import these data in a blank Power BI report. So let's go ahead and click the Get Data. As I said before, my data is inside an Access Database, so I will click on this icon here, Access Database. Then press the Connect button. And here is my file, which you can also find in your resource files. It's called Coffee Chain. Open it. I want to load the Coffee Chain query data, so let's click on this checkbox and press Load. Great. Pretty straightforward, right? The very first step that we want to jump into report construction is to spend a minute or two understanding the data that we have. As I said, this is actually a coffee chain data set. It does not have many fields. There is very limited amount of information, but everything is in one single table. So let's take a quick look at what we have. Click the Data View button. We have some numbers. We know what is our profit, we know what is the margin, how much of the sales, cost of goods sold, and total expenses. 
I'm assuming these are all in dollars, but they could be in hundreds of dollars or thousands or even millions for that matter. And we can analyze it like that. There are also some extra columns like marketing and inventory. We are not using these columns for our purpose today, but you are more than welcome to try those things. Apart from the actual numbers, there is also budget information. This is how much we're supposed to get profit. For example, in this line item here, we're supposed to have $30 as profit, but we got $11. So we are under that budget for that. Likewise, the margin is supposed to be 40%, but we only got up to 26%. Sales are supposed to be $50, we only got $43. You get the picture, okay? And the date corresponding to that entire line item. These dates are one per month. So these are basically years 2022 and 2023. So 24 months of data. And then the market is categorized into four levels. Central, East, South, West. And various states in that we operate this business. This business is US based. So there is some additional information provided here about market size, product type, product and type of the product. Is it a regular or a decaf one? As you could see, the product item has various types of products that we sell, like various types of teas and regular espressos and etc, etc. So that is in a nutshell about our data. Let's click on the report view. Now, when you want to tell a story of what is happening from a sales reporting point of view, it's a good idea to create some sort of rough sketch of how this is going to look. Let's not overcomplicate this. So we will imagine that this will have a summary of what is happening at a high level and then a detailed view of what is happening at various product types and various geographies. So that's pretty much what we will hope to achieve. And there are many ways to analyze and visualize data within Power BI. In this particular lesson, I'm focusing on building as much as possible without writing a single line of DAX code. But the next logical step is to actually build some measures so that you are able to achieve even greater amounts of insights and analytics within Power BI. So to create that kind of summary in detail, like a two-step layout where you show quick statistics at the top and the detailed statistics at the bottom, we could use the card visuals to show that summary. And then for detail, we could use any of the other visualizations. It could be tables, graphs, or maps, or something else. So let's add a single card first. This is where I want to show our overall sales. So we'll select the card and then we can go and put the information here. This will automatically sum it up. To get the currency formatting on the card, you just have to select the sales field, go to the column tools, and from here apply the currency formatting. Let's add the currency and remove decimals. So once this is there, then the next step is to apply some sort of formatting for this card. Because these are summary figures, they need to stand out and grab attention. So we will apply some visual formatting to the card visuals from this button. Format your visuals. And then let's start with a general tab. Then open the effects options. And here is the background color. We can pick any background color. Let's go with something like this, that dark blue color. And then we will change the text color to have a better contrast. Let's click on the visual tab and open the callout value options. I'll choose a white color for that text. We will do the same for the category label as well. This will make sure that, and this is visible. Okay, so that is pretty much it. What we could do is we could adjust the font size depending on how big the style needs to be. I imagine these styles will be about that big. And you can also adjust the font families if you want, but we will leave it there. Now from the general tab and from the background options, we will go and try some of these features. I'm going to enable the visual border. We will meet the border on and the color of the border will be the same as the title. 
but the rounded corners can be about 20 pixels. So this will give it a nice little rounded rectangle shape for my tile. And then we will go and enable the shadow. This will add a little bit of shadow effect around the box. I'm not a big fan of built-in shadows because they tend to look a little bit bulky and clumsy, but I want to show you that you can change pretty much every little aspect of the card visual. And finally, I want to change the text of this title of this card from Sum of Sales to Sales. I can do it from this little down arrow and then rename this to Sales, okay? So once you're happy with the appearance of these tiles and you can do what you want, well then you can press Ctrl plus C to copy that card and Ctrl plus V to paste it. So this way you don't have to do the formatting multiple times. You just do it once and you can use it. So we have one tile for sale and the next one we will use it for the cost of goods sold. Alright. I will drag the cost of goods sold field and drop it here. Let's add the currency and remove decimals. We will repeat this for the total expenses. All right. I'll rename the category title to Total Expenses. Oh, I forgot to close the Good Sales title. All good. It's time to add the dollar sign and remove the decimals. and the final tile will be Profit. The same formatting here. Now if you see that your cards are actually not fitting because they are too wide or too small or whatever, then you can follow the steps that I will show you. First you're going to select all of them and you can hold the control key and select all of them. But this is even better. You can just drag like this and select all the tiles in one go. So once you select all of them, you can go to Format Options, and from the General tab, you can adjust the height and the width of the card from the Properties option. Okay? Because profit is the most important number in all of these, I want to make this a bit more prominent. This can be damned in a few different ways. For example, you can change this from a different font or a different size of it. Because in the DIN font, I think this is the default fault for this. It doesn't really have a bold face. So there's nothing that we could do with the DIN. You could change this to another font that allows bold like Sego Bold. There are other ways to emphasize this number as well. For example, this could have more shadow or a different color. I'll use this light yellow. And all of these can switch to Sego UI Lite, so that the same font family, but this one is bold and those ones are not. Once all of these are there, we will quickly select everything. Go to Format, make sure that they are all aligned in the middle and that they are spaced evenly, 
distribute horizontally, and then we'll space them out evenly at this point. And once that is done, we can select all of these, right click and group them so that if we accidentally move one of them, all of them will move. So this kind of locked them in this configuration of spacing and sizing and everything in one set. So that part gives you the overall business summary. I'm not a big fan of showing every single number per se. So when you show $820,000, it doesn't really tell you whether that is a good number or a bad number. It's always a good idea to contrast this with something else. But I will leave that for you as homework. For example, we could contrast this with budget sales. We already have that information. So we could show the amount of budget sales either underneath or above or on the side as a comparison so that we can understand whether we have exceeded the budget or not and develop feelings towards those numbers. In the next lesson, we will start creating the graphs of our Power BI report. Thanks for watching. Now let's go and create the remaining graphs. So we will add a clustered bar chart for exploring individual product category detail. So we'll make this big. And then add this product type into the Y axis or vertical axis. And then we will add sales and profit into the X axis or horizontal axis. So this will give me sales and profit by various product categories. They will be colored in a different way. So once this is done, I can copy and paste this. This way you don't have to manually work on formatting the visuals one at a time. And then on this cluster bar chart, we will remove product type. And we will use market for here so that I can see the same information by various geographies. Now, because Power BI is interactive at this point itself, this report provides so much more than those six data points. Everything can be interactive. For example, I can see what's happening with espresso. I can select the espresso bar and I can see those numbers for espresso. I can also see how much of espresso that we are selling by region and what kind of profits we are making. So for example, the East region seems to be having significantly lower profit on a comparative basis than other regions, and that will give you additional insights. Likewise, you can select Central and then see what is happening to the Central region by various product types. How much is the cost of goods sold, expenses, and profit within that region? Okay, so once these two are done, the next one that we will create is a comparison of whether we have achieved the profit targets or not. This kind of thing can be done in multiple ways, and this is my favorite way of exploring that information, which is to use a scatter plot or that one scatter chart. And right here in the details section, we will put the state column. So for each state, one bubble will be drawn. Right now, there is only one but it will be automatically expanded as you can add the x-axis and y-axis. On x-axis, we will show you the profit, and on y-axis, we will show you the budget profit. So this is how much profit we have actually achieved, and this is how much we should have achieved. As a dot will tell you for this example, uh, in the state of New Mexico, the profit was $799, but the budgeted profit was for $2,660, okay? This in itself is useful, but if you add another feature to it called symmetry sharing, what it does is it will automatically share the graph into two triangles, indicating which part is leaning towards budget and which part is leaning towards actual profit. To enable that, you just need to select the graph and then go to the Analytics tab. And from here on, Symmetry Shading, and add it. This will add Symmetry Shading like this, 
and we will get some default colors. Again, these colors will not be very well contrasted. So we will go, and because if we have not met the budget profit, that means in this area, any dot here is not a good thing. That means that those states have not met the target. So to emphasize them, we will select that, and we will put this kind of red shading. You can try various things, of course. And then the lower area is good. That means that these states have matched the profit, and there is no need to emphasize them. So we will pick something that is dull, like this light gray color, and this will give you that kind of visual. The other thing that we want to achieve is if you look at this coloring here, sales is blue color and profit is dark blue. In the scatter chart, the dot is blue, and because it is a visualizing profit, we want to synchronize that color as well. So select the scatter chart and then click in the format area button. And from the markers options, change the color of that to dark blue color. So that it syncs with our profit picture there, okay? Another thing that we will quickly do is select these charts and disable both legends and titles from them. Okay, this might seem counterintuitive because of the legend and the title information. They can be added by us. We will remove that. Let's size these graphs. Whenever you resize or move, you can see the Power BI adds this helpful guidelines, the trend color that is appearing. So you can actually make sure that these are all uniformly sized and positioned, okay? Once this is done, we can go ahead and we can start applying the title and additional formats here. So for the title, I want to show my corporate logo. I have already designed a logo for the coffee chain, so I'll show you how to get that. Alright, click the insert tab and then the image button. I just go to my media folder and I pick this image. Okay. Bring it over here. And put it there and size it and move it as you want and that will work. Now we can insert the tile saying sales report. To do this we will just insert a text box, type the word sales report. and move it right to the end of the logo, like that. And then you can just adjust the font for families and their sizes as well, and I will make this nice and big so that we can see the wording. It is also a good idea to add a slicer so that you can choose specific dates for your report. So let's add the visual slicer, move to the right upper corner, and add the date as a filter. Great! Let's go ahead and add titles for this part of the dashboard as well. I will add a text box and type sales and profit by product type and region. Let's make some formatting here.
and add a light gray background color as well. Okay, I will add another text box and type profit by actual versus target and state. And then our sales report is done. So this is how you can plan your reporting and start constructing. So at this point, you can really stop watching. But if you're thinking, okay, this is good, Andreas, but how do I take it to the next level? Then you can start adding some extra measures. This is just one page. So you could build another page where you could add new measures, new charts, and new cards. Individual product details or whatever and link that page as a follow-up. So this is the final sales report. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching. Continuing from the last section, this is our data model. We've worked with it here in data view. We've thrown it into the query editor and made significant modifications. Also, we looked at it in model view and made sure that our tables were properly related. Our data model is complete. Even though we have a number of queries that are available to us, we've hidden the ones that we don't want to see when we change to report view. Now, some of us at this point would be done because we're data modelers, data designers, and what we've done is created a data model. But even if that is your role, I do believe it's good to throw in a few visualizations into a report so that you can get a feel for how this model will be used and really take it out for a spin. And there's another reason to do this. There are ways that you can leverage your knowledge of the data model to improve reporting for your users. And let's begin by switching to report view. There are two different ways that I can add a visualization to my report canvas. I can start with my fields or I can start by adding a visualization. And let's begin with the fields first. I'm going to expand all countries and populations and click the checkbox for continent. And when I do, predictably, I get a map because I chose geospartial data. If I were to choose zip codes, the names of states or provinces or countries, continents, and so on, I get a map as a default. And I'm going to make this map just a little bit larger. I'm going to add a little bit more data to this. I'm going to choose population as a percent of the world population. And you'll notice that our bubbles are different sizes now. And the larger that I make the map, the larger the difference between the bubble sizes becomes. I'm going to leave it just about like that. The bubble for Antarctica is so small, it simply slid right off to the bottom. This is a decent visualization. I can tell that there are more people in Asia than there are in Australia, for example the more people in Africa than in Europe. So I'll leave this visualization right here. And let's start another visualization by first choosing our visualization type. Click anywhere inside the empty Canva. I would like a stacked bar chart. It is right here, upper left hand corner in the visualizations pan. I click and as long as I don't have any other visualization selected, it simply gets dropped into the canvas. Now I want to add some data. So I'm going to add the country name, which is the column name. And then I'm going to add the same population as percentage of world population. And I get a bar chart with the very large countries at the top, very populous countries. And as I scroll down, countries that are very, very small in terms of their population 
particularly in comparison to the giants like China and India. Now, sometimes we think of percentages of world population, we might think, oh, I think that would do well in a pie chart. We can do that. It's a grisly pie, though. It's just so many data points, so many teeny tiny wedges, it's very difficult to really do anything with. So I'll go ahead and I'll give it some even more room. And it's not going to make that much of a difference because it's over 200 slices and some of them are really teeny tiny. So unless the story we want to tell is that there are a couple of very populous countries and then almost everybody else, this isn't great. But there's another type of visualization that is similar to a pie chart. It differs really in two aspects. One is with the pie chart, you're always showing all of something, all of the countries in the world, perhaps all of the countries on a continent, but you can't simply show some data. The pie is whole in and of itself, and that's also true with this other type of data that I'm going to show you, but it's very hard to compare the widths of wedges. It is comparatively easy to view the different sizes of rectangles and squares. What I want to use here is a tree map and you'll see the tree map visualization to the right of our pie. When I choose tree map, I still have a lot of small rectangles in the lower left hand corner, but I have many large rectangles that are easier for me to compare. Now, what if I want to change this visualization so that it was population rather than percent of world population? Well, in that case, I'll just turn off percent of world population and I will drop down and choose population by country dot population right here. That's how easy it is to simply change the data that we're looking at in a visualization. Having percent of world population, if I were to filter to show me only one continent, it no longer makes sense. But if I have pure population, it will continue to make sense no matter how many times I filter this. And because we're filtering later, we care about this. Microsoft recently redesigned the formatting panes that are used for our reports in Power BI. First of all, we have a number of themes that are available to us, just as in all of the Microsoft 365 documents. So if you want to make sweeping changes in the color design, for example, start by going to view and choose a specific theme. You can also browse for themes. You can go through a theme gallery or you can even customize the theme and then change it. But just to give you an idea, choose this theme that's called Storm. And when we do, notice the predominance of blues because we've chosen a different palette. Choose Bloom and we get a lot of purples and a purple background as well. If we choose Innovate, it's crisp. It has different use of effects and lines and all that sort of thing. But I'm going to, when I'm all said and done, going to return back to default, which is what we've been looking at all along. This is how we change the overall theme. What if I want to change just the visualization, for example? Well, I'll choose visualization and this map. And here's my data information. This is format for your visual. That's what that button is. And when I click, I have all the visualizations really well grouped. There are two tabs here, visual and general. General are things like, does it have a title? Does it have tool tips? And the items that are under general are the same, regardless of what type of visualization you're looking at. If I choose my tree map, here are my general options. If I choose back to my map, my general options. But if I choose visual, I get options specific to the type of visualization. Here, options for a map. Here, different options for a tree map. So this is a really well designed and an exciting change in the formatting options for those who use Power BI. So the question is, can I change the bubbles? Yes, you can change their size and you can change their colors right here. And you can also always revert back to default if you want to change all of the choices that you make. You also have a choice at the top. If you don't necessarily know all of the changes that you have made from the default, you can revert all of the settings in a visualization back to the default. 
If I have no visualization selected, then my choice is what to format is format your report page. It's a different icon. That's clearly a page. And here's everything about my page. I can easily go in and change the color of the background. That was a little more difficult to find before. Now, really super easy. If you'd like to save your progress, this is a good time to do it. File, Save As, and type All Countries too. And I will see you in the next lesson. I want to show you some specific visualizations so you might understand how your users would use them and how you might want to use them if you're creating a report or a dashboard. In this formatting pane, the visualizations gallery only appears when you could actually choose from it. Right now, I have a particular visualization selected. If I click on the canvas, I'll automatically get my visualizations back. But if I've recently been formatting, the visualizations pane is hidden. If I click back here, though, on the Build button to add data, I'll get my visualizations. This is just a matter of making sure there is enough space for formatting when we're formatting and visualizations when we have visualizations. The visualizations that I would like to show you next are card, which is sometimes also called big number card, multi-row card, and then on the row below, table, and matrix. All of these, matrix is really my favorite because it works just like Excel and users automatically know what to do with it. To create a little bit of space, I'm going to rearrange and resize the visualizations that I've created already. Let's begin with a matrix then. I'm going to click on Report Canvas and choose a matrix. I'm going to expand all countries and population data, and I'm going to choose Country. And there's my country name. Next, I'm going to drop down and choose Countries and Population Data, Population, which gives me a number. And then finally, I'm going to slide a couple up and choose Percent of World Population for my third number. And the issue that I'm having is that my titles for my columns make my columns really, really wide. Now, these are the names that I have left in my fields list. And if I change them on my fields list, they'll be inherited by every single visualization I create. But what if I don't want to do that? What if there is a reason to keep some of these names the way that they are? Well, I have the ability on the Visualizations Build tab to change the name of any of these. So Population by Country Percent of World Population, my third column, I'm going to choose that and I'm going to rename it. This is Rename for this visual, and I'm just going to keep Percent of World Population. And press Enter. There we go. Same thing is true for my country population. I'm going to rename it for this visual and just call it Population. I want to contrast this kind of renaming with the right naming that we do over here in the fields list, which is renaming for the model. I should rename country to country name. If I do it here, I'm only doing it for the visualization because that's all I'm allowed to do. If I wanted to rename it for the model as a whole, I can actually rename it in the fields list. And when I do that, it will automatically update any visualization I have that relies on the default name and fix that for me. So that works just fine. And this looks good. 
maybe give it a little more space to the country name in the same way that we would kind of adjust this sort of data in Excel. And I'll drag down so I have a little more space and we can figure out how to use this type of visualization. Again, users just go, oh, I know how to do this. They don't even think about it. I want to drop in a big number visualization using this card. So I'm going to click here on the desktop canvas, click this card, and it says, give me a field to populate this visualization. And the field that I want is population, the same field I'm using here in this column, and it will add up all of the data and even show me 7 billion. If I click, for example, just on North America, we'll see only the countries in North America. We'll only see the population of North America. And in the tree map, the countries of North America are highlighted. Same thing. Click on Africa, and I've got a whole different country list and a different number. And if I want to turn that back off, I've clicked on a filter, and I can just turn this back off this way. I can also filter, by the way, in any of these visualizations. For example, I click on China from the tree map, I just get China in Asia, 1 billion people for example. This is called cross filtering, and we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go along. I have one more thing that I want to do to my big number card. It has population by country dot population. We know that's a field name. And so if I wish, I can rename it for the visualization here and change this to total population. And if I want it gone, though, no, that's a formatting option. I would go to formatting and turn off the category label. If I want it on, and this all looks good to me. Nice scrollable list. Everything is working. And if you'd like to save again, go ahead, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Another reason I like tables and matrices is that you can style them and format them as you would in Excel. And I'd like to show you two different ways that you can format a matrix. The same thing applies for a table. The first is with the matrix selected. If I click on format, your visual at the very top, I have style presets and these are groups of styles that I can apply. For example, I have one called flashy rows and it picks up the colors out of my theme and applies flashy rows. Or I could have bold header flashy rows, and it almost hurts my eyes. Minimal formatting, which is basically making it look like a grid or a bold header. And I have all of these different choices, so these are built in. If you don't like any of these built-ins, then you can modify the grid, the values, the column headers, and so on, in order to create your own mix of choices, rather than using the ones that are the presets. But I'm going to take us back to our choice, which was the default. Another option I have is conditional formatting. So I'm going to select this visualization, and you might think formatting go to format your visual. No, that hasn't made it there yet. Go back to your build visual, which is where we add data, and we're going to apply this to the data in the column. So if I scroll down to my values, I have two columns, population and percent of world population. And I would like to take percent of world population right here, click its drop down arrow and you'll see conditional formatting and I would be able to choose and change its background color to format, font color, icons, web URL, but I'm going to choose data bars. And when I choose data bars, the data bars dialog box opens for this particular column of data. And I'm going to say that I don't have any negative numbers. There are no places where there are fewer than zero people, but I don't want this dark of a bar because this bar will overrun some numbers. So I'm going to choose a light version of this blue, 60% lighter than what is being used. For example, here for China, and I'm going to have that bar run from left to right. And if there were other options, I can then show this bar only rather than a number, enter values for the highest and lowest values. But this is all I want to do. Choose a light color and click OK.
And now if I click percent of world population to sort this, and it sorts the first time out with the smaller countries like Vatican City at the top, just click again so that our largest values in terms of a present world population are at the top. That's kind of nice. Many of the choices that you are familiar with from Microsoft Excel are here for conditional formatting. And if you wish to customize the colors that are available to you, then choose a different theme or customize the theme. We're going to be doing just a little more cleanup to provide some consistency in our basic report. A few last things to look at. So if I choose my map visual and I go to format tab, and I look for examples, at my map settings, I have choices for what type of map I want. Do I want an aerial map? Do I want to have a grayscale map, which really shows the bubbles to pop? So I have some options here. Also from controls, do I want it to automatically zoom in or do I want it to provide zoom buttons? These are the choices that are made available to me here under map settings. If I go to my general settings and I look at my title, which is on, I can see that the font is DIN and it's a 14 point. And I'm actually going to change the text color to a dark blue. I like that. Now, knowing that, I'm just going to click on the visualization underneath it and change it to exactly the same blue. Really easy to have consistency. And I also want to change this title itself, but we'll come back and do that in a second. Because while I'm right here, let's go over here to our third visualization. And its title is turned off. So I'm going to turn the title on. And this is country population. Now I'm going to change this again to a 14 point and blue it. Power BI holds my place so I can go from one of these to the next and easily compare items. There are a couple of other issues here. I want to go to the visual itself where we've been previously and notice that I have these subtotals here across the bottom. This number is not exactly 7 billion and some people are bothered by that distinction. I'm just going to turn off the row subtitles and that title is gone. Easy enough to snag out of here. Let's come back here to our tree map to change the title. This is population by country. And there we go. If I wished I could really center these a little bit more, my text cards in my space if I wish, and provide more space for the maps. But I have some other plans for future visualizations. Otherwise, I would make this a little more spacious. There's no reason to have white space here and items cramped here, but I know where I'm going. So it's good for me now. If you wish, this is a good time to save your progress, and we will continue. In this lesson, I want to show you how visualizations within a page are related to each other. By default, visuals cross-filter each other. So what this means is that if I choose a particular piece of data, for example, Africa in this map, then that filters all of the other visualizations. Now, the population for Africa is 1 billion. Here are the countries and their percentage of world population. And within the tree map, the countries in Africa are a more brilliant version of the color. And the countries, for example, China in Asia and Canada and the United States, North America, are more muted. So it's not quite as easy to see in this tree map. It's very easy to see everywhere else. I want to show you now what a slicer is, and I'm going to make that a little bit more space for it right here. Slicer is actually a filter for an entire page. So I'm going to click in the canvas and come over here to my visualizations gallery. 
Slicer really looks like a small data form with a funnel on it. It is to the left of our table visualization, and when I click Slicer, a slicer will be dropped in here. What I would like to do is create a slicer for continent. So I'm going to choose the continent field, or I could also draw a rag and drop it in here. And that's my slicer. It doesn't look all that cool yet, but let's format it and clean it up a little bit too. Uh, it has a header that says continent, and that's great. Kick it up to a 14 point like my other visualizations titles. And then I'm also going to change my font color to that deep blue that I'm using everywhere else. And then I actually want to change the size of the values because this is okay to read data. But when I'm choosing data that I'd like something just a little bigger, so I'm going to take that up to a 14 point. And that works well for me. Let's see how this works. And I want to help you contrast this with how the cross filtering works. If I choose Asia, notice that my other visuals here, these three visuals on the page that are changed. And what's changed in my country population is only countries in Asia are named. In my tree map, the tree map itself only changes in terms of the effects on the particular, on the individual data points. So Mexico is not in Asia. It is still here, but the color is not as vibrant as China, India, and Indonesia. I'm going to turn this back off. No filtering right now. Watch what happens instead when I choose Asia in a slicer. When I choose Asia in a slicer, this isn't cross-filtering. This is pure filtering. The only data that shows here is that comes to us from Asia. Therefore, that map only Asia. And it usually will zoom in nice and tight. Here's the world map. Just Asia, North and South America, Australia. They're all gone. The other countries in the world are not here. Only the countries in Asia. And this list is only Asia. So we have a difference in how the slicer works opposed to how the cross filtering works. The slicer is a filter for the entire page that we place it on. It's a recommended practice to make slicers easy for users to stop, to make anything that filters jump off the page. And so what I'm gonna do for my slicer settings is I'm actually going to change the background, which is under effects in the general tab of format your visual. So I could choose one of the colors that are here, and I can go to more colors and find a custom color that I want to use. That's a possibility, or I can simply choose a light version of one of the colors I have. And I'm going to choose this 60% lighter gold out of my theme colors. So every time my users are looking for a filter or a slicer, this is what it's going to look like for them. And I'm going to right size it so that it's only as large as it needs to be. And I'm going to scroll it down to the bottom of my page, which would give me room to put something else here if I wished. You can have more than one slicer per page. Well, for example, if I had a report that included information about products and sales, I could create a slicer that was for our product categories and another slicer for our different geographical sales territories and place them both on the same page. To save space, you can modify the slicer settings, which we have here, so that the orientation is horizontal, or for the selection is a single select, which it only lets them choose one thing. And we get radio buttons then. as opposed to a multi-select, which allows the user to check more than one checkbox. They can control and select Europe and Asia, for example. And another choice is to have an option that says select all. And that just makes it easy for them to go back to the state from, for example, looking at just some, uh, to looking at all of them. There are other options available for you here as well as there are with all of the visualizations. I like slicers because it makes it easy for folks to intentionally filter their entire report page.
We're continuing here with the same data model that we worked with in the previous lectures. The slicer is a user-friendly, visible way to present filtered data and to allow user choice, but sometimes we want a filter that is just baked right into the report. For example, to show visualizations for a particular category. These are very popular when you have sale territories, for example, or production facilities where you want to have one page that shows you everything for the entire company and then on a separate page for an individual geography like a sales territory. So to show you this, I'm going to begin by right clicking on the visuals page and duplicating the page so that we have two of them. I'm going to return to the visuals page, right click it and rename it. And I'm going to rename it All Continents. And then I'm just going to right click on the second page and I'm going to name this America, just like that. On the America page, I'm going to collapse the Visualizations pane and I'm going to open up the Filters pane. Alright, there are two text boxes here what are sometimes called text wells, and I can filter an entire page, the America page, by adding continent right here. And then setting my continent to America automatically filtered my America page. I'm going to now click on my slicer because it's only going to have two possibilities, America or select all. In other words, I don't want you to filter here, and I'm going to simply remove it. Here's my America page with all the information only for America, and that's kind of slick. Not all users are even allowed to open up this filter pane. Some of your users will have to edit permissions and they'll be able to do all of the things that I just showed you. But users that are only allowed to view and use the report can't modify the filters pane, but they can still see it for right now. Now another possibility in this filtering pane is to put some of the filters on the same page. Now I wouldn't use this same filter on all of the pages for something like continent because we would want to have different filters on different pages. However, we might want to have a filter on all of the pages that was a date range, data from the current fiscal year for example. And let me show you how this would all work. If I delete this filter so we're back on the America page now, it looks like all of the continents page except for the missing slicer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add continents to filters on all the page. And I'm going to set continent to Asia. When I do America is Asia, but all continents is also Asia. So if I want to apply a filter report wide, then I can do it on any page, but I added to the filters on all pages group right here. To delete it, simply clear the filter. Now we're going to need to put our filter back for America. I don't want to have continent here. I really only want to have continent on filters on this page. I never took that away. It was just overridden by the page filter, overridden by the filter that appears on all pages. In other words, a report wide filter on a report filter, and we'll go back to America here. So you have the choice when you're designing a report to decide whether you want people who can only view this report, your regular users, people without permission to edit, to even see the values that you're using to filter. If you don't want them to be able to engage with the filter pane, even to see it, even to view it, then to click on this show or hide the filter pane from report readers button and turn it off. You'll still see it. Anybody with editing permissions will see the filter's pane, but your regular viewers won't be able to see it at all. We continue now with the same report that we've been using for a while. I'd like to show you how you can add natural language capability to a report. I'm going to insert a new page, not because I have to, but simply to have some additional space and not need to modify my existing pages to make room for this. The Q&A visualization looks like a little comment box out of a cartoon. This is what the character is saying. I'm going to click it and drop the Q&A box right into the report canvas. This visualization allows me to use text to create new visualizations. There are some choices here, some suggestions that are already built in, but I'm simply going to click in the box that says, ask a question about your data. 
and I'm going to say show countries. Now, the term countries is underlined, but it is showing me all of the countries and their name of the country in alphabetical order. What if I wanted a map instead? Show countries as a map. All the countries as a map. Each one plotted little dot. Now I'm going to type show countries with the largest. And Power BI shows me the China and its population. Now I'll type show countries with populations. And I'll get a chart that should seem very familiar because we created a chart much like this back here on all the continents. It's a column chart. Here we did it with conditional formatting, but here is the result of an inquiry that we made. And if we want to give some more room to this visualization, we can go and do that. When a term I type is underlined, it means that there are other options. So for countries, I can click and it now will say uh, population by countries, countries with population, or show all population growth rate countries with population. When I point to populations and I click, it says that you should also choose show all countries with official population clock, and they have a source for that. That's interesting. So I have other options when I see a blue underline. Now, when you see some text underlined in orange, that means it's a little bit ambiguous. So show countries. And when it has an orange underline, it has another option for me. Show population. But I can spell something so badly, all I get is a red underline. That means that I've misspelled it and that I really need to work on it if I can't guess. So show pupulate and it's like we didn't understand your question. Look at that double underline term and it will do something else with it. Tell me what it is. So, show population growth rate by country. And notice that each time I pause, Power BI is quickly creating a visualization saying, is this what you meant? Is that what you meant? And it says that when I said, when I entered the text, show population growth rate by country, it interpreted that as population growth rate sorted by population growth rate country, which they are in. That's how Power BI is resolving the text that I gave it. So another thought. Show growth rate for all countries. But if I said counties and it says, did you mean something else? Yes, I meant countries. And now I get something that makes more sense. When you see that yellow dotted line, the term you used isn't in the model at all. So show sales and it says, we didn't even understand your question. This model has nothing about sales in it. Count all countries. I'm going to get a big number card, 235. Count all countries with growth rate below zero. Thirty-eight of them. 
So instead of count them and getting a list, I'm going to say list all countries with a growth rate below zero. And here they are. And if at some point I have exactly the visualization I want, there's a button here to the left of the settings gear on the visualization that turns the result into a standard visual. The Q&A visualization goes away and is replaced with whatever visualization I created using the Q&A. Q&A is really remarkable. It tolerates ambiguity and misspelling, and it tries to help us with creating meaningful queries. And it's a great tool for our users. It quickly and easily created visualizations based on the things that they may want to ask questions about. When we're all done, if we have something that we like, we can choose to save it as a visual. Our users love Q&A in Power BI. All right, let's delete the visualization and let's rename the page to Q&A. I will add again the Q&A visualization. I'm asked if I want to add synonyms, and it shows me suggestions for how to get started. I can actually change exactly how Q&A works by clicking from the settings button. My choices are to provide synonyms, to review questions that people may have asked that didn't get resolved so that I can see what kinds of vocabulary my users are using and if I have reflected on my Q&A. I can teach Q&A to understand questions, and I can suggest new questions. I want to quickly show you how this works, and at the bottom of the screen it shows features that are in preview, so it may look nothing like this the next time you see it, but this is how this feature has looked for the past year or so. I'm going to start with field synonyms. Here are the tables that I'm using, and when we have hidden tables from our users, we also have hidden them from the Q&A, so if we want to be able to have a table that is hidden, still be useful in Q&A, we can turn them back on here. But I'm going to open all countries and notice that there are some suggested terms that have been supplied. These are suggested by Power BI. So when it says all country or all countries, Power BI is suggesting all nation, all location, and will include those in Q&A, and that works. This takes care of my first table, All Countries. If I dropped into All Countries and Population Data, I'd have some other choices, and you work these in exactly the same way. The more synonyms you can provide that are synonyms your users will use, the better Q&A will work. Review Questions I can sign in and see any questions that people have asked and that were not answered. In fact, there aren't any right now, so I'm not going to worry about it. Teach Q&A. I can ask questions in the same way I did with the Q&A tool and then clean them up because I'll get the same feedback with the orange underline, the double red underline, the blue underline, and so on. And then I have the ability to manage terms that I have defined, so I can actually throw them away if I wish later on. Suggest questions is really pretty cool, because the list of questions that I start people off with should be something that they might be interested in. So if paying attention to population growth rates are important, I might say, for example, countries with the highest growth rates. Now countries was ambiguous until I added more information. Now it knows what I'm talking about. So countries with the highest growth rates, and I'm going to add this, and it's giving me one country. Okay, I'm going to add that and save the suggested question. I'm going to close the Q&A setup pane. And the suggestion here are no longer the suggestions provided by Power BI. They're the suggested question that we created.
This is the report that we've been working on. And assuming that you will get an error when you open it, you'll need to change your data source settings to the location where you place the downloaded exercise files folder. So what we're going to do is simply on the home tab, click publish. And I'm asked if I want to save my changes. Presumably I made some, so I do. Power BI Desktop begins the process of publishing to Power BI Service. I need to select a destination. My workspace, by definition, is a new experience workspace, so I'm simply going to save it here. Notice there's a search box. I need to search for exactly where I would like this to go. I'm going to click Select, and I'm reminded that if I wanted to have a view of my report for mobile phones, I could actually create that fairly easily, and that's good to know. Learn more here. I'm going to open All Countries 2 in the Power BI service. So here's what that report looks like in the Power BI service. It has pages down the left hand side. This is clearly a view. Remember, if we hide the filters it would be gone, but we didn't. We formatted it. Notice that the map visualization is not shown here, and the error message says map and filled map visuals aren't enabled for your org. Contact your tenant admin to fix this. So to fix this, we will click on the gear icon in the upper right corner here and then admin portal. From tenant settings, scroll down until you find the option map and filled map visuals. Enable it. And apply settings, right? So what did I get when I published this? If I go to my workspace, all of the files that are published are here. This provides a really quick and easy way to push out a report so that I can either share it with others from here, or I can use it somewhere like Microsoft Teams, which we'll do in a bit. So publish, here it is, and we are in great shape. So far, we've been able to use Power BI and make some very simple reports. But all this while we have very little control of how the actual calculation is happening. For example, if I wanted to see the average salary by department, we would have to put together the salary and then we'd have to change it to the calculation type from the sum to the average or from first name to count of employees. This kind of behavior is analogous to how you would do things in... Excel pivot tables. Imagine you have the employee data in Excel and you want to make a pivot report to see the average salaries by the department. You would have to put the department into road labels and salary into value fields or the pivot table. And then from there, you would have to change these type of calculations from sum to average or median to see all those values. But these kind of options are very limited. You could only sum or count or average. What if you wanted to do a little bit more? Let me give you some simple examples. Let us say we're looking at the employee salaries by department, and I want to know what is the percent of employees in that department that are making more than $90,000 or $100,000 of salary. So we want to call this proposition as high pay proportion, and then visualize this so that we could see maybe which departments have very highly paid employees. Or what if I want to analyze what percentage of staff within each gender group are not performing well? That means they have a rating of either 1 or 2 out of a total rating of scale of 1 to 6. So these kind of calculations are very tricky to achieve with the built-in options. This is where Power BI really shines because it offers a powerful calculation engine. And you can talk to it, you can tell it what you want, and you can get the corresponding result. The engine is Power Pivot, so in the following sections, we're going to take a look at Power Pivot and DAX. We will create some very simple things because anytime you are learning a new language or a new system, you always start by making some simple things so that you can get a good understanding. And then we will solidify that knowledge throughout the course. This is a simple introduction to DAX language that is used by Power Pivot to tell it what you want it to do. 
DAX or data analysis expressions is the language that is used to create formulas for Power BI that extend our data model. DAX gives us the ability to create additional information at runtime so that we can quickly and easily generate new information beyond the information that's in our model already. If you already know how to build data models in Power BI Desktop, DAX is a logical next step because there are things that we can do with DAX that we can't do as easily or at all without it. Okay, let's move on to the basics of data modeling. Data modeling is the process of taking your organization's data and creating a model that can be used then for reporting and forecasting by the business. It sounds simple, but not necessarily. Data modeling includes many steps. First, we start with determining what data that we want to load. And that includes what data source it comes from, because we can include data from more than one source. It also includes how much of the data we want to return from each source. Do we only want to include the last three years of data, for example? Do we want to summarize transactional data and just return the summary? Or do we actually want to see each and every one of the transactions? Once we've made these choices, or even while making these choices, we will begin loading data into the model using whatever modeling tool we're using. And in this course, we will be using Power BI Desktop. If we have more than one table, and you almost always will have more than one table, you'll need to define relationships between the tables. For example, you'll need to indicate the relationship between territories and the states in the territories, between customers and their orders, between purchases and vendors. With those types of relationships in place, now we're ready to be able to transform this data. We'll shape it, we'll combine some columns, merge data from different sources, we'll transform data, we'll change the data type, for example. We may also change the names of columns so that they're more human readable and easier for business users to work with. And it's in this last stage here of data modeling where DAX really shines because DAX isn't primarily about getting data. It's all about how we're going to transform our data. DAX, which stands for Data Analysis Expressions, but everybody says DAX, is a formula language similar to the formula language that we have in Excel. It uses functions, and this is a good way to think about it. You think, if I were in Excel, I would do this sort of thing. And for many of the DAX simple formulas we'll create, we'll use very similar functions. But DAX has other functions as well that are designed to deal with data models, data warehouses, and so on. So we use DAX to be able to create new information from the data that we already have. For example, if we have two columns, one column for the quantity sold and another for the unit price, we can use DAX to create a formula that will calculate the total price for that item. Basically, quantity times price. And to be clear, if we had control of the data model, and if it was a good decision to do so, we could also add that column in the data model. So sometimes we're doing work in DAX that could be done in the SQL server, could be done in Excel, in Access, whatever our data is coming from. DAX is also used for period-to-period -period comparisons. This year's sales by product to last year's sales, which are much harder to do with traditional formulas and functions. And we'll return to DAX when we need to create information in our model and we're not allowed to modify the data source for whatever reason. Using DAX, we will build on what you already know about creating data models in Power BI Desktop. The data set that I'm going to use was put together by my Microsoft, specifically as a demo for the Power BI desktop. It's called the Contoso Sales for Power BI or Contoso Sales Sample. Simply go to your favorite browser and search for it. If you enter Contoso Sales Sample for Power BI, it will be the first non-sponsored item in your search results. Click the link to go to the Microsoft Download Center. There is one button, Download. 
You don't get to select another language, just download the file. So I'm going to click download. And it doesn't take very long. It's a relatively small file, and I want to save this in my project files folder. Open the folder, and you'll notice that we have one file in here. I'm going to extract it in the same folder. Here's the Contoso sales sample. Double click on it. This is a PBIX file, so it knows to fire Power BI Desktop. I know I have data here because over on the right hand side, here are my tables and my fields list. Alright, let's click the model view button and let's collapse the properties. This is the model, or as many people think of the relationships view in Power BI Desktop from the Contoso sales sample. Here we will see tables and the relationships between them. And there are a few things I'd like to point out to you here in this particular view. First, we have the main table here. This is the sales sample, and so it's the sales table. The sales table has information about sales in it. It has columns like product quantity and the price of the product. This table is our fact table. It's a data table. The other tables are supporting tables and they're called lookup tables. And so if I wanna know information about the store that something was purchased in, it'll be in the storage table. Products or categories those products are in, that's out here on this branch. When I add data into a model, several tables, for example, from SQL Server or any other data sources that are related. Power BI Desktop tends to lay them out like this, a star, a snowflake arrangement with our fact table, our main table in the center, and the lookup tables around it. There's another equally valid way to lay these out if you wish, and that is to lay them out with the lookup tables on the top and then below them, the other tables, and really the fact table alone at the bottom. Like that, okay? So each of these lookup tables are at the top. Make sure that you're dragging the tables by the top. If I look at a particular table, I can find the lookup tables related to that above it. Hopefully one of these two methods seems intuitive to you, and it might depend on whether you were working previously with relational databases. That usually will mean that you'll favor the star layout, or if you've mostly worked with files from a more flat file world. Or people who have worked with SharePoint, I think, often say that they like this because they understand how lookups work in SharePoint, and there's also a sort of built-in numeric, alright? You look up to find the lookups. In addition to arranging the tables in some way that is comfortable for you as the modeler, and for other modelers, you can look up specific relationships between the tables. Double-click the relationship icon or the line between these two tables, sales, and calendar. And you'll see that we have two tables that are related, sales and the calendar. And sales to calendar is many to one. For every single day event in the calendar, there could be many sales in the sales table. So sales to calendar, many to one. If you need to modify this relationship or remove a relationship, this is the place to do it. And you'll remove a relationship if it shouldn't be there. You added a table to the model, it's not related but has columns with the same name as another table, and therefore there's a relationship that gets created that's not correct. Before you begin transforming your data, shaping your data, using DAX with your data, make sure that your relationships between the tables in your data model are correct and are arranged in a way that's going to work. All right, let's click on the report view button. We're going to use DAX immediately to create what is called a measure. A measure is simply a calculation that is going to operate across our entire data model. There are two ways to do it, neither of them is wrong, but I find one of them more easily leads me astray. So if you go to modeling, you can click on the new measure button. 
But if I do that right now, it's going to create this measure on whatever table is selected. And I'm not even sure what table is selected. Oh, the, the calendar. Notice that I don't want to measure in the calendar. I want somewhere else. And this is why I don't typically do it in this way. So let's click in the Home tab. I'll simply go to the table where I want to create the measure, in this case, Sales. Right click and choose a new measure and it's going to be put in Sales. It always puts them in alphabetical order. I need to rename this. Even if I only wanted to create one measure, I need to give this a name that describes what it is. What I'd like to do is I'd like to calculate the total sales. This is a common thing that you'll do. Capital T for total, capital S for sales, okay? And I'm going to hit equals. Now, I want to call one of those DAX functions. And the function that I want is when I'm totaling is the aggregate function sum. So I'm going to begin typing, and as I continue, there's a sum which adds the number in a column. That's a little different than Excel. In Excel, it would be adds all the numbers in a range or adds all the numbers specified. We're always dealing with the columns or all the rows here in Power BI. So this part's right. And I can hit Tab. And if I do notice, then that I get the open parentheses and I get to choose. Now the syntax for DAX is that we're going to start with the name of a measure that we're creating, the equal sign, and then we have a formula. Here it's looking for a column name, and the column name is going to have two parts. It's going to start first by specifying the table because we now have more than one. And then it's going to specify the column name. What I want to total is the sales amount column in sales. So I'm going to begin by typing sales. And then if I finish, I can either click on the sales amount or double click. Or I could have, if I wished from sales, tab down and hit sales amount. There are several different shortcuts here, and I need to close this parenthesis to finish the end of this measure. And then I can press enter. All right, I have a new measure. And I can click here to finish it, or I can press here to finish it. And you'll notice that it has a different icon than the summary data elements that we have as our other columns and sales. So this looks good to go. I'm ready to go, and I've created my first measure. Now that we've created a measure, let's take a look at the DAX syntax, because we'll be using the same syntax over and over again. It's like writing functions in Excel or writing a statement in SQL. The same parts appear every single time. First, we have a name for this particular measure that we're providing. And in this case, it's total sales. And we have an operator. In this case, and in most cases, the equal sign, followed by the name of the DAX function. And remember that at this point, when I begin typing, IntelliSense kicked in for me. I hit the letter S, and I got a list of things that began with the letter S that might be possible. And the more that I filled in, the more that the list was filtered until I ended up with something that was really easy for me to get to. Now remember, that sum is a really short word. You might think that wasn't really all that helpful, but some of the functions, so to speak, are more complex, longer names, and more keystrokes, so it's nice to have this IntelliSense kick in. I particularly appreciated that after I typed the sum function and hit tab. I got an open parenthesis and then a list of table names and columns that I could be choosing from. And again, that's being provided for me by IntelliSense. Note that within parentheses, the table name isn't in quotes like it may be in some other formula languages. Instead, the table name appears and there's an open bracket with the name of a column, a closed bracket, and then a parentheses that are enclosing the arguments for the DAX sum function. We're indicating that this particular table, when we say total sales, we mean to take the sales amount and add them all up. 
sum all the values in the sales amount column. And that's how we do it using DAX syntax. Let's use this total sales measure that we've created in a visualization. And what I'd like to do is add a matrix because this gives me real numbers to look at as opposed to a beautiful chart visualization. They often look good to me whether they're correct or incorrect. So I'm going to drag and drop total sales into the values field. And that is the total for total sales. But now I'd like to actually have a total sales split out a little bit so that I'm looking at a total sales by brand. So let's expand the product table. So I'm going to choose brand name, total sales by brand. And that looks beautiful. You could simply drag and drop brand name into row fields and it's the same. Here are my brands. Here are our total sales. If I wanted to choose something other than brand, I could. We could turn off brand name and choose manufacturer. That looks good. Or I could choose product name. And we'll get a really large, endless scrolling visualization that also uses our new measure. Get used to creating matrix visualizations. It's most of what we'll do while we're building our data model. Another nifty attribute of measure is that you can format it. And every time you use it, the formatting that you've applied will hang in there with you. I'm going to select the measure, and when it's selected, it's available for me for editing, but it's also available for formatting. If you're not already on the Measuring Tools tab, go there. And here's the formatting that we could apply. For example, if I wanted to choose a particular dollar sign that's United States, or if I wanted to use the Euro, some other currency, I can. I could just indicate currency general, and note that when I do that, I get a different number of numbers after the decimal. And that's because this is set to auto. And I'd like to actually have no decimal points. It makes my numbers easier to read. And notice that that picks up in the total as well. Click back in the canvas. Now if I turn off or create new visualizations out on the canvas and I add total sales to it, notice no decimal points. There is the currency format I want and we could then choose manufacturer for example. And that looks good, but the formatting that we see here is the formatting that is now saved as part of the measure. And I'm going to right size this visualization before I leave. Give me some canvas back. Sum isn't the only aggregate function in Excel or here in Power BI DAX. I'd like to use a couple different versions of count function. I'm actually going to show you three of them. What I'd like to be able to do is count the number of products so that I could look, for example, at a brand and see how many products are included in the brand or how many products are included from that manufacturer. This is all about products, so we're going to start in the product table. I'm going to right click here and choose new measure. And the new measure that I'm going to create is called number of products. Might kind of like numprod too. No, notice that, and I actually type this out in real human legible form, and I think that I prefer this. Number of products equals, and I'm going to use first count. But before we can do that, Count counts the numbers in a column. So if I'm going to choose a column like product name, that won't have numbers in it anyway. Then I should choose count A. That's another possibility. So I'm going to choose count A, hit the tab T. IntelliSense helping me out with the whole time, and I'm going to go to the product table. And under product, I'm going to choose product name and close my parentheses and enter. Okay, I have now created a number of products, and if I click in the canvas, add a matrix visualization and click the number of products check box. Check out that I have 1,690 products. 
Now, a couple of possibilities as to why this might not be exactly the way I would like it to be. First, it's possible that some of the products in here don't have a name. It'd be more likely if I chose it in description, but that's a possibility. So what are my other options? I'm going to leave number of products and I'm going to show you another version of it. Let's click in the canvas. Go to the product table, right click and choose new measure. This time I'm going to put in num products. It'll be a little bit different. Equals, and I'm going to start with type count. But I'm going to use count rows. This counts the number of rows in a table so I don't get caught up in what column I'm choosing because as long as the row exists, I'm going to return a true count for me. Click the tab key. So there we go. And I'm going to be asked only for a table, not for a column. So I'm going to choose product. And close that off with the closing parentheses and press enter. Let's create a new matrix. And take num products and drop it in. Again, 1690 items. In this particular case, both of these do the exact same thing. However, what I really want to know is how many rows there are in the table. Then num products is a far better choice using count rows than number of products using the simple count A. Count, count A, and count rows all do something slightly different. Make sure that you're using the function that matches your business need or intent when you're creating your formula in DAX. If you'd like to delete a measure, you can simply point to it, click to open the menu, and choose Delete from Model. You'll be prompted, do you want to delete num products? I do. And when I do that, notice that it breaks this visualization. It's okay. I can just click on the three dots and remove visualizations as well. Or I could have edited the visualization to choose a different value here. For example, to put number of products and then delete num products, not a problem. But I'm going to delete that visualization, and then I would like to edit the number or products, which is what I would like to keep. So I'm just going to select this to pitch it up in the editor. And instead of count A, I'm going to use count rows. I'm simply backspacing over the A, and note count rows is available to me right there. Double click, and now I've modified the number of products. There is a warning message that says the single value for a column product name cannot be determined. So notice that count A needed to be a table name and a column name, but count rows does not. So that's okay, we'll just drop back in and modify this. So now we have number of products equal count rows product. That's cool. I could have done it the other way. I could have modified the name of num products after deleting number of products, but I'm content with this. Remember also my envy of this nice product name. I'm going to drop down here to the total of sales and just pitch a space in there and make sure that it works by pressing the enter key or by clicking the check mark, modified it here, and we're all good. And notice that it modified it in two places and it's used in this report in these two matrix visualizations that we already have. One other thought about editing measures. Sometimes when I'm creating decks, it's helpful for me to write notes either to other people who are working on a data model, not using it, but the other people who are improving it or, as I also think about it, my future self. I can forget so much that I'm just another user that I'm going back to a project that I've worked on two or three years ago. So let me just show you how you can leave comments in your DAX. We are in total sales. Simply hold shift and hit enter to go to a new line. And notice how it opened in line two. If you'd like to create a comment, you can simply hit the slash key twice and type your comment in. And let's type, comment regarding the total sales measure.
Notice that the text here is green and it's not treated as code when it's being evaluated. If I hold shift and hit enter again, I'm on line 3 and perhaps I'm going to type some other. Now notice that this text is gray and the DAX editor is saying, I don't have a clue what you're trying to do here. And I'm going to do shift enter again. If I've already typed my comments in, I can select them and hold Alt Shift and hit the letter A to have the entire block commented. Notice that if I comment is more than one line, I get an opening and a closing comment tag. So I should have a small novel that I've written in there. To add a new line at any point, go to the end of the line previous, hold Shift and hit Enter. If I feel the need to provide more information to other people or to my future self, this is the right way to do it. Not a sticky note, not an email, not something that I drop into Slack, but instead by using the formula bar and putting a comment into my DAX. One more thing. Although I told you to be careful to choose your table and then right click to create a measure, sometimes you'll be so eager to create a new DAX measure that you won't notice what table selected. If you need to move a measure from table to table, select it. Go to the Measure Tools tab. Here on the left hand side under Properties where it says Home Table, you can actually move a measure to a different table by selecting the other table right here. I just move that to the product table. We want to move it back. And I'm going to move it back, and my measures is now back in sales. The Contoso sales sample database is annoyingly complete. We don't have blanks. There aren't any places where a user forgot to fill in a discount or someone left a field empty because they didn't have the information, and then that moment passed them by. But these are things that happen in real business, and it's not unusual that we need to check a data set to see if we have any blanks. So let's take a look at how we would do that. I'm going to choose the product table, and let's imagine that someone no fills a class name. Let's click the data view. If I want to know if that's something that could really happen, I could go into the product table, but you'll notice that the class name, like everything else, is filled in. Let's create the measure here nonetheless. I'm going to create a new measure. And the new measure is going to be called no class. And that equals count blank. Now it's time to specify a column, and we're going to specify product and class name. Close parentheses. Now it would probably be better if I said no class name here. Enter. And there's a new measure. Let's now return to the report view. Create a new matrix. I'll move it somewhere there. With it selected, choose no class name, and you'll notice that we have no results, because we have no rows that are missing a class name. But if some were, this is how you would use count blank in order to find them. There is one more DAX count function that I want to show you, and that is called distinct count. What distinct count does is it rips down a column of data and counts each unique value only once. For example, we have a number of stores, but I'd like to know how many of our stores had sales during a particular period of time. For example, let's take a look at our data for sales. Click the sales table and then the data view. If I go to the stores table that I can count stores, but here I have as part of my sales data a store key, and this shows me what store a sale was made in. Therefore, if I want to know how many different stores sold something, this is a great way to find out. 
by going to the sales table itself, the summary of our sales transaction and say, if in this table, a store's number shows up, then count it and tell me how many of them there are. Let's create this measure then in the sales table. I'm going to right click, choose new measure. I'm going to call this stores with sales for right now. Makes sense. Click equals, and I'm going to start typing distinct count. Distinct count counts the number of distinct values in a column. Remember, it's a column, so we'll be going to our sales table, and the column that I want is store key. Close parentheses and enter. If I want to provide some specific formatting while I'm here, I can do that, but it's really what I want. It's a whole number. I don't have fractional stores. So if we do go back to our report and I click throw in a matrix visualization and choose stores with sales, I find that I have 306 stores with sales. This becomes more useful than as a measure when we are looking at a particular date on a calendar. For example, if we were looking at a particular year or we're looking at a particular month and we're filtering this, you could say, ah, 200 of our stores had sales yesterday. 306 of our stores had sales overall. When you need to be able to count the number of unique occurrences, use distinct count rather than count or count A or count rows. Let's save our Contoso sales because we're going to continue with a specific project and use it in the calculated columns and measures section. In the next few lessons, we're going to build DAX understanding through a project using the employee data set from the previous section and practice what we already learned by calculating things in Power BI using DAX. Specifically, we will learn all about creating measures, how measures can be reused, filter context explained, Nature Measures. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the Power BI course. Without knowing the actual DAX language, you won't be able to get very far in this Power BI journey. So that's why we have to learn this language and then use that to get more mileage out of Power BI. In this project lesson, we will learn all about creating measures and how measures can be reused. So let's dive in. I have my Power BI window open, and we just want to work on the employee data that we worked on in the previous section. Design your first dashboard with Power BI. So we can go and connect to the Excel file again, but because we have already been working with it, it will also be saved into the recent sources. So I can point to the employee data file here, and that would pretty much get the same file, same location, and then show up on the navigation page. So the recent source is a great shortcut to get into what you want. We will pick table one. We could load this, but I will go through the transformation data because I want to rename this table. It's not table one, it is staff. And I also see that there is anything that we don't need or that we could add. So this is the Power Query Editor. And then we'll quickly name this table as Staff. The next step is to replace the values with gender. So right click on the gender column and select Replace Values option. And then we should say Null, and that should be Other. So the column profiling feature of Power Query is going to show up like a green bar at the bottom of this tile, and this is very handy because you can quickly see what's in a column. So we have everything there. We do have higher date. Twos will calculate the employee's tenure, which is today minus a date joined as a calculation, so that we then have some calculations on top of a tenure like average tenure by department. To do that, all you have to do is select the higher date and then go to the Add column. Because it is a data type, the Power Query already highlights the date options from here. And then from here, I can simply say Add a column that is equivalent to age. 
This would simply add a necessary power query expression that will simply take a date time dot local now, which means that your current computer time from your local system minus higher date, and then it will add age. If you notice the icon here, this has a stopwatch kind of icon, whereas the higher date has a calendar type of icon. The difference here is that a date, and that is a duration. So Power Query, which is used for working with the data, has a very strong data type notation. Every column will have a data type associated with it. It could be a number, a text, date, time, duration, and other kinds of information as well. If you compare this with Excel and Excel, you do not have very strong data types. You could have a number in Excel and then format that as a currency or a date or time, and then it will all work. But within Power Query, each column is really attached to the data type. So Power Query supports more data types. Well, this lesson is not meant to be a Power Query lesson, so I will not get too much into this. But we have the age, and what I'll do is I will turn this age into just years. So let's go into the Transform tab. We don't want to add any more columns. We only want to change this column. So transform this duration into total years from this button. That's the tenure. And then we will just simply name this column as tenure, okay? From the Home tab, click on the Close and Apply button so that the data comes here. Our field is here and our new field tenure here. If I want to see, for example, how many employees we have, we could put a card and then we can say something like full name and add this here. I can change this to count and then it will tell me that there are 100 people. This method, the one that we just did, is kind of what we call implicit calculation or implicit measure. That means we are not really specifying what we want, we're using screen options to define what we want. But the real power of Power BI is calculating explicit measure. Let's delete the card. So you can right click on the table and then you'll see this option new measure. Also there is a button on the screen here from the home tab. So we will click on the new measure. And as we already learned, this would open up a formula bar right on the screen that would then ask you, what is this measure? So our very first measure shall be a simple employee count. So the measure name is employee count. We just want to count how many employees there are. The staff is a table. So if that table has 100 rows, it means that each row is one employee. So 100 employees. So that's how you should be doing this. You want to count how many rows there are on the staff table. So we will simply say count rows parenthesis staff table. This is the DAX language. Press enter. And now this measure is created and it is stuck to the table. There's a little icon next to it that is a calculator icon to give you an indication that this is a measure. We can now visualize this measure in any visualization I can make. For example, a card. And then I can simply click on the employee count measure and then it will show up as 100 employee count. Once you have a measure, it will just show up as a calculation. Now let's add a stacked column chart. and then put maybe department into x-axis, and then we'll put employee count into y-axis. This graph is telling me how many people there are in each department. Every measure that you create when it is shown on the screen has two steps in the background. The first step is what am I filtering and how am I displaying? Okay, this might be a little too technical at this stage, so I will move on. We can turn this into a table so we can actually see the numbers. Let's delete the card and move the table here.
We will work with the table visualization because this is a better way to look at all of this. You could adjust the size of the text if you want. Let's create a new measure to calculate the average salary. Average salary is equal to the average staff annual salary. Enter. We can then select this and add that into a table, but it is not ideal. Like, for example, I want to be showing up in currency formatting with zero decimals. To do that, all you have to do is, once you've created the measure, select that measure and then go to the Measure Tools ribbon. All right, let's calculate the minimum salary in that department. Min salary. You don't need to type table name, column name, and all that all the time. If you start typing salary, it will show you those options. And then if a new tab out, it will give you that. So equals to a minimum annual salary of staff. Enter. I'll add this new measure to the table. So if you could see this, what the minimum salary is doing is within each department, it is giving me the minimum of that total level. It's giving me the minimum across the entire organization. The same goes for average. Average for each department and average at the overall level. So this is how Power BI calculates things. For each number displayed on the screen, it will first filter what needs to be filtered. So here it is, looking at only IT employees, whereas here it is looking at all employees, not filtering anything. We will apply the formatting minimum salary as well. And then what we will do, one more measure in fact, we'll do two more. The max salary, which is the max of annual salary. Add the measure to the table so that we can see what the maximum salary is in each department, right? Let's format the new field. And then finally, the last measure that we will add is salary range. Salary range is the distance between maximum and minimum. So this is the max salary minus minimum salary. Now notice this particular calculation and compare this with the other calculations that we did so far. The other ones we did are having a proper definition. We are saying the count row staff or minimum staff salary like that, whereas in this measure we are reusing the calculation from elsewhere. So we are not specifying how the max or min should be calculated. Instead we are saying we already have a definition of that. You use that and get the max salary. Get the min salary and then subtract that and then give me the result. So this is a powerful concept. This is like the next level of thing that we don't normally even consider. Whatever measure you create, it is part of your data model and your table structure and you can always reuse them to create more measures. This will create a powerful opportunity for us where you can create something simple and then you build on top of that. And as you build more and more, you will be able to create some very complicated calculations without having to write lengthy formulas or whatnot. We will apply the formatting for this as well. And then we can see the salary range. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I remove min and max from this table? The salary range still works, so this is again something that we don't think of very seriously. 
But if you observe closely, what is really happening is salary range is a measure that is the distance between max and min. So in order to get this, internally, Power BI, or the Power Pivot Calculation Engine, must calculate those numbers, and then subtract and give you this. But everything happens on the fly, so you don't really see that as a real calculation happening, and it will come up with that result. This is how the measure language that is Power Pivot works. Let's save this file as employee count. In the next lecture, we will explain the logic of DAX in plain English and filter context. If you observe any of these measures, know where I'm telling Power Pivot how I want this to be calculated per department. We're not counting like count ifs or sum ifs or that kind of words. We're simply specifying. I want the sum of the salary, I want the average, I want the max, and then Power Pivot will calculate the scenario where we are only looking at accounting employees or finance employees. So this is how that is done. How is that defined in plain English? Well, in plain English, we have essentially two kinds of things. One is every time that a number is calculated, for example, that number 12 is calculated. Power BI defines the context. We can think of it as filtering context or filter context. So filter context is defined for that number 12. The filter context is department and is equal to accounting. So even before our pivot goes and does the calculation for the employee count, it will say, okay, wait a second. I'm just going to filter it down so that only the accounting employees are there as the data. At that point, it will then look at the definition of the measure. The measure definition is count rows in the staff table. But because the staff table is already filtered down to accounting at that point, how many rows are there? Only 12. So that's the result that comes back here and then gets displayed. That's why when you are learning about Power Pivot in the DAX language, you often hear the words filter context. Because for everything that is shown on the screen, there is an association filter context. And that filter context can be supplied by many things. We will take a quick demo of how that filter context gets determined. But right now, it's just determined by that role label accounting. But what if I add a pie chart that has employee count and gender? So we're now looking at employees by gender. And then if I click on, let's say, female, all of these numbers change to show the values corresponding to female employees. So here, the filter context is no longer just accounting. It's accounting and female employees. So the filter context can be supplied by interactions where individually you click on something and then the other will change. That's one type of filter context. You could also have filter context where there is a slicer on, for example, manager. So is there a slicer on manager? And if I pick Van Zell, a slicer who can also have control over the filter context, so Van Zell is saying, I only want Van Zell's staff, and then accounting for them, and then female. So female accounting Van Zell. That's the average salary. This is how filter context is applied. Everything on the screen will have a play. In fact, not just everything on the screen. There are things that are not shown on the screen. The filter pane will also have a control. So even the filter pane will tell you how the filtering is done. And all of these will narrow down your massive list of data down to some rows from the calculations that will happen. Okay, enough of that kind of theory. We will go and we will look at this in a greater light as we develop our understanding of the DAX language. But for now, if you see in general the way that this is working in each measure, it would have a name. The name can be anything. There would be no specific rules like you can have spaces, etc. I believe that you can't use some special symbols, but otherwise it's all fair game. Let's take a closer look at a particular formula, average salary, and observe what is really happening. And let's click on the data view.
Right now we have 100 values. So it will take the annual salaries of 100 people and then it will somehow shrink them to a single number. This kind of an operation in plain English is called aggregation. That means that you take a whole bunch of values and then somehow you aggregate them to a single value. It could be a number, text, date, or whatever that is. But that's how you aggregate. You take a whole bunch of things and then you shrink them to a single value. So in general, there are some exceptions to this rule. But about 99% of the time, any measure that you will create will always be an aggregate. That means that it will take a whole bunch of values and then come back with a single value, right? So this could be the average of all the salaries, all the annual salaries are taken, and then a single value is created from which we will come back. Employee count. All the rows are there, and then we just count, and then we come back with a single item. That's how the default behavior of a measuring is done, okay? I sincerely believe that in order to derive the most out of Power BI, you need to have a solid understanding of Power Query the data part of Power BI, and then a Power Pivot, the calculation part of that. Once you know those two things, then it's creating any practice visuals or dashboards or reports. It becomes a simple process of thinking about a story and then elegantly communicating about that. So that's where our folks will be from here onwards. As with other complex applications, there is often more than one way to accomplish what we want to accomplish in Power BI. So I'd like to show you some alternatives to measures so that you know that they exist so that someone doesn't stroll by and say, oh, you could quickly do this in a different way. And you wouldn't know if there was a better way to do it or not because not everything we do should be done with a measure. But a lot of work that we wish to do is best done that way. Open the Contoso sales sample that we worked in in the previous section. Let's now look at an alternative to measures, and those are calculated columns. I'd like to do some calculations on the sales table. Click the data view. Here I am. One of the things that I would like to do is to take the sales amount, subtract the total cost, and the result of that is actually going to give me my gross profit. Of course, there's overhead and other things, but the difference between how much we are paid for something and what it costs for us at our first cut at gross profit. To do this, I want to insert a new column. I can click the sales table and from sales tools, I can click the new column button. But I can also click on sales and rather than new measure, I can choose new column and I will get a new column. I will feel a lot like I'm creating a measure. I'm going to start by giving it a name, gross profit equals, and I want from the sales table, sales amount, minus the sales table total cost. And I'm double clicking on those to enter them, and now I'm going to either click the check mark or press enter for something. And if we scroll over, you'll see that the gross profit is the sales amount minus my total cost. So I've created a calculated column. Now, how is this different from creating a measure? When we create a measure, a calculation that is performed at the fly, at runtime, so to speak, and it doesn't take up any space in storage. So measures are nice and lean. What I've done here is I've actually added another column of data to my data set. And this won't take up CPU capacity. Columns use RAM. They use storage. And so I've created a larger data set now that has a column with 2 million more values than I had just a moment ago. So why in the world would I do this? Well, the biggest reason I would add calculated columns, well, there are two. The first is the calculated columns, because they are actual values that are stored in my data set, can be used for slicers. They can be used for filters, whether I'm filtering a report, or I'm filtering a page, or I'm filtering a particular visualization. Therefore, if I want to be able to create values that I can use to filter my report or visualizations, I'm better off creating a calculated column. And there's another possibility. 
In this course, we're creating simple DAX formulas, but it is possible to create incredibly complex DAX formulas that take a long time to run. And if that's the case, it might be good to do some of the calculation ahead of time and keep it stored in the data set. That would be a calculated column. So we could, for example, if we were creating a gross profit as part of a measure that would be created, and that measure was taking a long time to run, it might make sense for us to break out two or three of the calculations and create them as calculated columns so that they were stored in the data set, and they make our DAX functions and formulas run more quickly. Again, not a problem or something that we're going to have here, but when you have incredibly complex DAX formulas, that's something to consider. Typically though, if you have a choice, measures are leaner, unless you're going to use the results of a measure as a filter here in Power BI. This is actually a really good time to save your model if you haven't, because we'll want to use this calculated column later. To do this, simply go to File and choose Save As if you'd like to have this as a different version of it from your original. I'm going to save mine as Contoso Sales Sample-2, and it's now been saved. Let me show you another alternative to the measure that we created called Total Sales. I'm going to recreate this visualization, so let's click on Matrix. I'm going to start by choosing Manufacturer from Product Table. There it is. And scroll down. And then what I want to do is I'm going to simply choose Sales Amount. And I'm going to drag and drop it in here. If you notice, this looks amazingly like Total Sales. I have the same value, a few more decimal places, and since some recent changes to Power BI, I can even rename this. I can rename this sales amount so it says total sales, and it will look just like this. I can give this a little bit more space, but this renaming, like any other formatting I do, is actually for this instance of total sales, formerly the summarization of sales amount, in this particular visualization. Watch what happens. I'm going to remove this. Sales amount isn't here anymore, and I select it to put it back. It's once again labeled sales amount, and any other formatting changes that I had made to this column of data are gone. It's totally temporary. This is what you call an implicit measure. It's a measure that's created on the fly simply by adding particular values into a visualization but it's not the same as having a measure that I can format and reuse. And there's another important difference. When I'm creating a new measure, I can refer to existing measures in that measure because they are explicit. They exist here separately listed as measures in my tables, my data model. I can't, however, call up these implicit measures that are created simply by using a column of data in a visualization. If the only thing that you need to do is check some values, sort of do a status check as you're working in Power BI, then this type of implicit measure is great. But if over and over again I want to be able to use total sales and I have it formatted in a particular way and have it the same meaning every time I use it, then I want to create an explicit measure as we've been doing thus far. Let's return to the sales table. Because what we'd like to do is create a measure that would allow us to see our net sales. Net sales are sales amounts minus total cost, but also minus any discount amount or any return amount. So this is basic math, and if we were in Excel, we would simply be clicking equal sales amount minus total cost minus discount amount minus return amount. But it's a little more complex than that here because, remember, that every measure we create has to work in every context. And so we have to give it the context of a table and a column and a summarization method. Therefore, let's create a new measure. And the new measure that we're going to create will be net sales. Net sales is equal to and right now, if I start 
trying to enter sales amount, notice that I don't have a choice here of any column of data directly. I only have a choice of other measures. Don't start creating measures you don't need. Don't worry. What we need to do is we need to summarize this. So if I choose summarize or sum sales, sales amount, close my parenthesis, minus. Now I need to treat total cost, discount amount, and return amount in all the same fashion. We need to summarize them. So sum, tab, sales. I'm looking for the total cost. Total cost. Close my parenthesis, minus sum. And if before I hit that parenthesis, when I have just, you know, S-U-M, it'll uppercase it for me, which right now, I know how to spell sum. But if I have a function that has a longer name, then it's nice to allow IntelliSense in the formula editor to uppercase that for me. Yep, I typed it correctly. Next, I want to subtract my discount amount. So in the sales table, discount amount, close parentheses, and then finally, then any returns that we have to remove to achieve net sales. So we're going to sum in the sales table, open bracket, return amount, and then close the parentheses. And that sales is equal to sales amount minus total cost minus discount amount minus return amount. Press enter. Looks good. Doesn't return an error. Let's create a matrix. And let's drop in, for example, product, particular brand name. And now let's use our new measure, net sales. And this is the net sales figure for each of these manufacturers, not total sales. Total sales is in the 8 billion range. Net sales is in the 4 billion range. Remember also that while we have net sales selected, it's always great to take time to take care of all of our formatting and make it consistent. In total sales, I've decided to drop the trailing decimals, so I'm not going to do the same thing here. Specify no decimal places. Looks good to me. Welcome back everybody. What I'd like to do now is that we've calculated gross profit and the sales amount is I'd like to calculate the gross profit percent. In other words of the sales amount, how much of it is profit? This is a division problem. We're going to take the gross profit and we're going to divide it into the sales amount. Now it's unlikely in this circumstance that we would have a sales amount that was zero, but that's not totally impossible. It might be that we gave a discount that was equal to the entire amount of the sales because we were donating this to a charitable cause. Anytime that we could be dividing by a value that could be zero, we have the same problem in Power BI that we have in Excel. We have basically a division zero or div zero error. In Excel, we would handle that usually with an if statement, checking to see if something's blank or if a value is greater than zero. But we actually have a function in DAX that handles it in a single step. And let me show you then how to create a measure that uses a function which is called divide. In the sales table, we want a new measure. And that new measure is going to be a gross profit percent. equals divide. Notice safe divide function with the ability to handle divide by zero case. We're going to divide and the numerator is in the sales table. But remember that if we start with sales, that's the wrong thing. We have to aggregate it first. So we need the sum of the sales table of gross profit. close parenthesis. 
we then need to sum from the sales table our sales amount. Those are the first two arguments. That gives us our division. And then the third argument that we would have is what would we like to have happen if this resulted in a division by zero? If you're happy with the result being blank, then we don't need a third argument. But if we wanted to have something specific, we could have some text that we are returning there. In this particular instance, if there's going to be nothing to divide by, then leaving it blank makes perfect sense. So we're simply going to close this, and then we're going to have one more set of parentheses that we have to close. Enter. That looks good. There we go. Gross profit, divide the sum of gross profit by the sum of sales amount, and we should be getting a number. Let's go see how this works. I'm going to remove one of our previous visualizations and create some space. We'll hang on to this in the case that we want it later and create a new matrix, and let's drop gross profit percent in it. That's kind of cool. That's for all the sales. So let's now take a look at the specific products. Click on a product name. And you might think that it's interesting that these are all the same. Well, they're just different colors of the same digital camera. So yes, our gross profit percent, 0.57. Now, remember that if we want this formatted as a percentage, it would be really good if we dropped up here to the model and said that this is actually going to be a percent, and we want it to have no decimal places. One decimal place. Whatever your choice is, remember that our formatting will be saved as part of a new measure. And just like that, if we have any items here that are zero, then it will not raise an error which in Power BI looks like an infinity sign on the side. Instead, the error is handled by our use of the divide function. We've been working with aggregation functions or aggregators. Now we're going to work with an iterator. Let me tell you a little bit about the iterator function. The iteration functions have been the same names as our aggregation functions, but followed by an X. And here's how they work differently. What an iteration function does is it moves row by row through the table and does a calculation or retrieves some data that we may ask about, and then it aggregates it when it's all done. Iteration functions really work in the same way that calculated columns work. So often, the iteration function and the aggregation functions provide two different ways to achieve the same results. Sometimes we could use sum or we could use sum x, and it's really a choice of what you want to use. But there are times when sum x is exactly what we want, and I'm going to give you an example of that. I'd like to do a calculation on return so that we can analyze what category of products and perhaps even what specific products get returned. We'd like to pay some attention to that. I have the ability to calculate my returns for any item because I can multiply return amount times return quality. What I'd like to do is create a measure that does that using sum x. Right click on the sales table, new measure. And the measure is going to be named total returns. And the total returns is a sum x function. SumX has two required arguments. The first is what table we're looking at, and the table we want is sales. The expression is what we want to do to be able to evaluate each row of the table. In this case, I want to multiply return amount times return quantity. If I use IntelliSense, I will include the table name, and that works. However, in the SumX functions, I don't need the table names. I've already pointed to a table and I can simply get rid of sales. 
Because the X function or iterations function go row by row through the table, and so in any particular row of the sales table, there is only one value for a return amount, only one value for a return quantity, therefore I'm allowed to simply put these field names, what are called naked fields or naked references, into this particular expression. So look in the sales table. In each row, multiply the return amount times the return quantity and aggregate that using the sum. That's what SUMX is telling us. We like this. Now let's take a look at how this works. I'm going to create a new matrix visualization. I'm going to fire up total returns, and this is the total return. But remember, our goal was to see what product category generated the greatest number of returns. Remember, these are sorted in alphabetical order, but I can quickly sort them. And notice that we return a lot of computers and relatively few items in the audio category. Remember also that while we have a particular measure selected, it's a great time to go into the measure tool tab and change our format so that we have zero or two or however many decimal places you want. And if you want particular currency, you can add that here as well. Finish editing and return to our measure and to our visualization. SUMX is only one of the iteration functions. As with aggregate functions, you'll also find count x, average x, min x, or minx, max, or really max, and rank x among the iteration functions. They all work in the same manner. DAX has two types of time and date functions, and we'll look at the first in the basic functions. If you're used to using date functions and time functions for Microsoft Excel, then you should be familiar because most of them are the same. For example, if I have a date and I want to extract the day, month, or year from that date, I simply say for day, for example, would say equal day, open parentheses, stuff in the date is an argument and close the parentheses. I can retrieve the numerical month and year in the same way. If I have a date time information, I can retrieve or parse out the hour, the minute, and the second. I also have access to the weekday and week num functions. Again, the argument that I'm giving them is the expression is a date. And then I have the date div, which is a slightly bit different function in DAX than the standard built-in Excel function, because not only can I give it a start date and an end date, but I can indicate whether the information I want back is in days, weeks, months, for example. EO month, end of month, the expression is a start date, whether I'm adding or subtracting months from that, and then the return date of the end of that month. And finally, we have the dynamic function, today and now, equal today and equal now. And these, of course, have no argument. They simply stand on their own. Let's jump back into Power BI Desktop and use one of these. I think we'll use date div because it's a little bit more different here. This is the promotion table. And the promotion table that we need to calculate date difference, which is a start date and an end date. And in this case, we're going to calculate a calculated column using the date diff function so we can see how that works. And we're going to create a calculated column because what we want is for each and every row to know how long a promotion ran. So we have the promotion name, start date, end date, and we'll be able to create a nice little table with that. We'll begin then by either choosing promotion or by clicking the more commands button, more actions button, or by right clicking in either event. We're going to choose new column. Let's name this column duration. We can always do it later if we wish, renaming, but this is what we'd like. And the function is date diff. Tell me a difference between two different dates. It has three mandatory arguments, date one, date two, and the interval or unit that we want to use to express the results. So I'm going to start with the start date, which is if I begin by typing start, 
promotion start date, comma, and for promotion end date, comma. And then here are my list of intervals. So notice it's a date difference, but we can use this to calculate minute difference, hour difference, year difference, and so on. In this case, our choice is day. I'm going to close my parentheses, having now created that new calculated column. If we want to see that column, we can simply go into our data, and here's the new column duration, and each of the promotions and how many days that promotion ran. So we've had some real long running promotions here. No discount runs forever. Every day you can come in and get no discount. But we have some other long running promotions like North America's spring promotion ran through more than a year and has more than two springs. If we go back to our report, we can insert a new report page. And that's easy enough to do, and I'm going to drop in a matrix. And begin with my promotion names. Here they are. Then I'm going to add in our duration, so that we can see the duration for each of the individual promotions and the total number of promotion days. A nice addition for this particular visualization might be a year slicer, because we're aggregating promotions that ran over different years as well, but this is how we use a basic DAX date function to be able to create, in this case, a calculated column. In the next two lectures, we're going to continue our project from the previous section and make use of the calculate, divide, and all DAX functions to clear away filters. Thanks for watching! In the previous section, we looked at data analysis expressions and how to calculate things in Power BI using the measure functionality of Power Pivot. In the following lessons, let's continue our discussion on the same topic, but we will ask some business questions and then figure out how to answer them through Power Pivot measures. Specifically, I want to address three questions in this lesson. The first one is, I want to be able to calculate staff percentages in a department against all of the company. Of course, we have a fortunate situation of having just 100 employees. So if a department has 12 people, their percentage is also 12%. But what if you have 500 employees and you want to find out the percentage? So that's going to be tricky. And we will figure out how to calculate that and how to visualize that. And then we also want to calculate how many people within a department are earning more than $100,000. So that's the second question. And then the third question is whether we want to be able to calculate the gender pay gap. Specifically, we want to observe if there are any disparities between male salaries and female salaries. For the purpose of the gender pay gap, we will ignore the other gender, but we want to be able to calculate the male average salary and the female average salary, and then do a comparative and then maybe even calculate the pay gap as a percentage and visualize that by department or by manager or by teams, etc. We will use that same file. It has many previous measures that we constructed average salary, employee count, max, min, and salary range. I will add a new page where we can have a little bit of clay with subsequent measures that we will create. The first one is I want to be able to create department-wise staff percentage. Let's click the table visualization. All right, I'll click on the staff department names, and then employee counts like this. So instead of seeing 12 or 10 or 23, I would really like to be able to see this as 23% or 12%. Now to get that percentage, we need to be able to calculate the grand total and then divide one with another to get the percentage. I'll write a text box here so that we can just type that definition. My total divided by all total. Right? That's how we could think. For example, my total number is 12, and then the all total is 100, so that would mean that one employee count as it is, and the second is employee count without any filters being applied. So to calculate measure by changing the filter context, by ignoring whatever is applied, we can use a special type of function in DAX. 
That is the calculate function. All right, let's calculate a new measure. We will name the new measure all staff count. This would be calculate. And this is equal to. So we want to calculate employee count as if there is no filter. That means we want to calculate employee count for all staff. So that's the syntax. That's the signature here. This is how we calculate functions that are written. Whenever you write a caliphate, you can simply say calculate, and then you give an expression or an existing measure, and then you specify how filtering should happen. Press enter. And great. If I add all the staff count here, it will be 100 no matter which department we are looking at. Let's explain it in more detail. When the first number is calculated, when number 12 is being calculated like that, the engine will go first through and filter the accounting department. And then it will count the rows, and then it will come back as the answer 12. But what's happening right now? How come when we are looking at an accounting department, we're getting the result as 100? What's happening here? So here, Power Pivot wants to filter for accounting department, but the measure definition has a calculate with an all staff as an extra clause. So just before Power Pivot is about to filter the table, calculate function chimes in and says, hey, wait for a second. Do not filter it because I get the dips on the table, right? So it will have a priority and then it will say, do not filter it because I want all staff. And then, so it will keep all of them, it will say, oh, that means your employee count is 100, and that's when that comes up. Now, I don't really know if this explanation makes sense, but as you use the Calculate signature more and more throughout the course, you will become quite familiar with the pattern, and you'll be able to capitalize on it. In my opinion, DAX has a couple of levels of learning. The first level of learning is uh, just knowing that you have to write aggregates. So average, sum, count, which will all take a bunch of values and turn them into one value. So that's the first level, which is aggregation. The next step in DAX is reuse. This is when we can build measures and then we're able to reuse them to create other things. So for example, salary range measure reuses max salary and min salary measures. The third level is understanding the filter context, how everything is filtered and what happens and how calculations are made. So these are the fundamental pillars of your DAX journey. And then the fourth level. This is like going into the depths, but this level is really important that you can alter the effects, right? You can take filter context and then you can finally control the filtering. So how do you alter the filter context? You could do this through many methods, but the most important thing is to use calculate function. Once you can use calculate function and then it'll tell you what you want and you're pretty much covered 80% of DAX. I mean, DAX has hundreds of different functions and there's like books and guides and websites and help pages that are all dedicated to all of them. But in my opinion, if you can master these four basic concepts, which is learning to write aggregations, learn to reuse, and then understand what is filter context and how everything is being filtered and calculated, and then how to alter that filter context, this alone is sufficient to answer more even some of the seemingly very complicated business questions. So that's what we'll do in this lesson we will alter the filter context through calculate. We've already done that here. Even though it says 12, all staff count is 100. In the next lesson, we will continue to create measures like staff percentage. Welcome back, everybody. We will continue from previous lecture using the same file, employee count. Once these two numbers are there, then I can calculate my third measure, which is staff percentage. All right, let's create a new measure and name it staff percentage. And this is equal to employee count divided by all staff count.
Now, whenever you are dividing one number by another, there is always a scope that you would come across in a situation when you are dividing zero with zero or a number with zero. In this specific situation, there is a possibility that you can divide zero by zero, which can be an ugly error showing up on the screens. So rather than doing this simple division every time I divide with index, I always use my divide function, which is kind of like a safe division. You just give the numerator and denominator, and then you close the bracket. And if there's an error, it will come back as a blank value rather than an error value. Okay? You can also provide an alternate result. No staff or something like that. But in this case, blank is good enough. So once that is done, then I can add the staff percentage, and then I can see that. Of course, we wanted to see this as a percentage, but it comes up as 0.12, right? Because that's an actual numerical result. I can select the measure, and I can go to Measure Tools, and then apply Percentage Formatting, and then we will get the representation here as percentage. So once that is there, we could get rid of these other decimals. We are only looking at staff percentage by department. So let's get rid of employee count and all staff count. You could also change the department to, for example, the manager. And then we could see how many people, what percentage of staff report to each manager. And then you could sort this just as in earlier lessons. You could also apply conditional formatting on top. So let's click this down arrow besides the staff percentage field. For example, you could add a simple data bar. I'll just go with this default so that it gets highlighted by the proportion of staff that report to the manager. Everything else works just as beautifully. For example, I will add a slicer here. Remember to always click anywhere to empty the canvas before adding a new visualization. And let's click the department field. And then I go to finance. I see that Van Zell has 4% of the staff here, Sam has 5% like that, okay? And then finance has a total of 11%. So what is really happening? How do you explain these numbers? Is finance department has an overall of 11%, and then that 11% is divided like this? So if you see Sam, for example, 5% of all the staff, not just the finance staff, but 5% of the staff report to Sam. But the way to read this is 5% of the result here is really 5 out of 100, not 5 out of 11%. Remember that when we're calculating all staff count, we're saying calculate employee count and then look at all the staff, okay? That means the entire table. So this is how that calculation is done. Let's go to the second one, which is calculate the proportion of people that are making more than $100,000, okay? Let's delete the slicers so that we have fewer things to worry about. All right, let's look at this from the context of managers. So Sam has 33% of the staff, and then I want to know, out of all of the people that report to Sam, which is 33 people, what proportion of them are earning more than $100,000? Or maybe how many of them are earning more than $100,000? So if I want to add it into the table employee count, I will see the number 33 there. And then I want to see something maybe like 8 or 12 or 19 against that. So that I can see that 33 is your total employee, 19 people are getting more than 100,000. Let's now add a new measure. And that measure is employee count, where the annual salary is more than 100,000. I'll simply say greater than 100k count. And then this is equal to calculate. Because it's a type of employee count, we will say calculate employee count. And then the conditions you can also specify. You can write a filter saying all employees like that. You could also specify conditions. 
So the condition here is staff salary that needs to be greater than $100,000. Close parenthesis. And let's add this new measure to our table. So it's as simple as that. We will specify a column and then the condition with greater than, less than, equal to, or equal to like that. And then this would create a type of employee count that gives me greater than 100,000 values. And you can see the results here. So 33 is Sam's total employee. And then 14 people are making more than out of 100. So we have a total of 46 people making more than 100,000. Let's save that file. In the next lesson, we will continue creating measures and finalizing our Power BI dashboard. Welcome back, everybody. We will continue from our previous lecture using the same file, employee count. Now let's calculate the proportion as well which is a third composite measure that is greater than 100,000. Right click and new measure. I'll name it greater than 100,000 percentage. This is equal to divide two. Open bracket greater than 100K count, comma employee count, Close parenthesis and enter. Now that I created that new measure, I can apply for percentage formatting. So click the new measure and from the measures tool, I will display the values as percentages with zero decimals, okay? And then I can add that measure to the table. So roughly 61% of Andreas's staff are making more than 100,000. But if you look at Cynthia, 3 out of 10 people are making more than 100,000. That's how you can do that. And then you can apply your conditional formatting again on that. For example, you could do background color scale to quickly spot that or clear among all values. And this table works for managers. It will work for almost anything. Let me give you an example. I'll copy this table with Control plus C and paste it here as a duplicate. And then in this, we will remove manager and we will add a department so we could see what's happening. For example, accounting department has extremely high numbers of people making more than 100,000, whereas IT department only has 4% one person. Despite being such a small data set with only 100 people, you could see that there is so much interesting bits buried in that data, all waiting for us to discover. And we were not able to uncover these interesting bits earlier because we didn't know the language. But now that you can know how to alter the filter context and how to write the measures, you can discover so much more about this data. Okay, so that's the second measure. Let's take a look at this again. Greater than 100k account is using calculate function and then saying calculate employee count by introducing an extra filter context. In this situation, through Calculate, we are able to introduce a new filter. If you compare this with the all employee count, all staff count, in this situation, we are kind of negating or removing the existing filter on the staff table. So you can use Calculate to add filters, remove filters, or change filters. That's why Calculate is one of the most powerful functions in Power Pivot. And if you can master Calculate, you can really understand what goes inside the tiny mind of Calculate. Then you can get very far in the world of Power Pivot based analytics. This is our Calculate demo page. We will now make a new page and name it as Gender Pay Gap. Gender Pay Gap can be defined as a couple of things. So one thing we want to do is calculate the male average salary. We're doing average pay gap, 
We can also do this with the median months, and then we can do this with the female average salary. Once both averages are calculated, then the gap dollar is equal to difference between those two. And then gap percentage is equal to the difference divided by male average. This is because conventionally male salaries tend to be higher than female salaries in most industries, in most situations anyway. In our situation, we want to make sure that there is zero gap. That means male and female employees are paid equally. So this is how a gender pay gap can be calculated. And you could add other gender values or missing gender values here with a similar logic as well. But once you know all the steps, then it is easy for us to define the necessary measure. So let's go and do that. Let's add a new measure here, which is male average salary. And this is a type of average salary. So we will say calculate average salary. Comma. And then we want to say staff gender is equal to male. So we are saying using calculate, and then we are using equal to as a comparison. We are adding an extra filter saying calculate average, but only look at the male employees and then do whatever else you are doing. Like if you are doing it by department, then keep the department context in. If you're doing it by manager, keep that context in. Okay, I'll make a table here. Then I'll add the department field. the average salary, and finally, the male average salary. Let's apply currency formatting to the male average salary measure. Currency general with zero decimals. For example, in accounting department, male average salary is higher than average salary, but in engineering department, the male salary is lower than average, which means probably the female average is going to be higher. Alright, let's add a new measure, which is of female average salary. Then this is calculate average salary comma, staff gender is equal to female, close parenthesis and enter. Then I can add that one to the table as well. We can see that number and then we can apply again currency formatting. So the overall level that you could see male is 105k and female is 114k. So this company is at an overall level favoring female employees. They are female employees. So the pay gap is actually kind of negative favoring female employees. But in certain departments, it's a different story. Now we're here and ready to add a gap dollar measure. Right click, new measure and name it gap dollar, which is we can say the male average salary minus female average salary, enter. Let's apply currency formatting with zero decimals. And then we can add that one to our table. We will add a final measure, which is gap percentage. This one is equal to divide gap dollar, comma, male average salary, close parenthesis and enter.
We will format this as a percentage with zero decimals. Let's add this new measure to our table. Nice. Maybe I will remove the measures in between and keep only the department and gap percentage because this is really what we wanted, right? We wanted to visualize which departments or which situations have very high pay gaps. For example, human resources have a huge gap. That means that females have paid extremely higher than male for every dollar. And at the overall level, females are paid 8 cents more than male employees. And you can visualize this in a table, but you can visualize this as a clustered bar chart. Alright, let's save our file as employee count 2. This is how you calculate anything by introducing extra filter context or altering existing ones through calculate function. I think we made tremendous progress in terms of understanding DAX through this four lesson project. In the next sections, we will slowly take a break from learning more DAX and instead focus a little more on storytelling and communications through visuals within Power BI. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Now we're going to work a little bit more with some of the logical functions. If you're used to working in Excel, you're used to functions like if, and, or, and so on. We'll begin by using a logical function find, which allows us to find a substring within another string. And specifically, we're going to use that to find mice in our product list. Rather than creating this as a measure, I'm going to go to the product table and I'm going to create this as a new column. And we're going to call the column mouse. And say the mouse is equal to find, here we have our assistance. The first thing we want to find is text. This is case sensitive. Mouse throughout this table starts with a capital M. So there's mouse within the text. And in the product table, we're going to be looking in the same product name. The start position is 1, and the product back on this will be similar to the substring function in Excel. So if mouse is the very first word within the name, then it would report back 1. If on the other hand the beginning character of the word mouse, M, was in the 6th position of the string, it would report back as 6. And if it's not there at all, we like it to report back as 0. That's called the not found value. Close parenthesis. So look in the product name, and if you find the word mouse, then tell us where you found it. Note then that in our very first entry, mouse is in position 24, is where you found that word starts, and this is a Contesso Wireless Laser Mouse E50 Gray. In fact, if the word mouse appears, then we'll have a number that's greater than zero. And if it does not, then we will simply have a zero because that's what we indicated we wanted to see if the value was not found. This is how we use find in DAX. Thanks for watching. Find and the logical function if are two functions that I often will use together. I'm looking for something in a product name, a product description, some other text string that is stored in a column, and then based on that, I'd like to do something other than indicate where that string shows up at. Alright, let's click on the calculated column mouse. So what we're going to do is modify the existing mouse column by wrapping the find statement in an if statement. So after the equal sign, type if. 
So I'm going to say if, remember that the result of this find will be either zero or something greater than zero. So I'm going to say if the result is greater than zero, comma, then if it's greater than zero, we know that the string mouse actually appears. And so I'm simply going to put yes inside quotes, type a comma. And if it is zero then, or conceivably smaller, that wouldn't happen in this particular formula, and I'm going to say no, inside quotes again. So if the result of find is greater than zero, then yes, it's a mouse. If not, no, it's not a mouse. Press enter. And note that our results have now changed. So that if the name includes the text string mouse, like these mice here, and at the top, that the mouse column says yes. And if not, it will say no. While I'm using a Boolean value in this case, yes or no in the column, we could be using something else instead. I could instead be saying yes and no, indicate that if it's a mouse, we want the word mouse. And if it's not a mouse, we want nothing. If works here much as it does in Excel. We're going to provide the if statement for a logical test. Results if true and results if false. We have a calculated column in our data model that uses find to determine the position of the word mouse within a product name and then uses if to place the word mouse in our calculated column if there is indeed a mouse in that product name. The problem when using find is that it's very case sensitive, and there are two different ways that you can deal with that. You could either convert for the purpose of comparison to the string to either upper or lower case, and to do the same with that text that's in the product name. That's one option, is a text conversion to upper or lower case for both of the items that we're comparing. The other possibility is if we know something about our product names, and we know that they are usually either lowercase or proper case, but never uppercase, then we really only have two choices. We could look for capital M mouse and all lowercase mouse. If either of those is found, then it will meet our conditions. And so we're going to add yet another logical function, the function or to our calculated column. Before the function find, we're going to insert or open our parentheses. And then our first logical test is whether we find uppercase mouse in the product name, and if so, if that's greater than zero. So all of this right here is our very first logical expression in the or statement. I'm going to copy that. Now I'm going to click a notice. In my help, I notice that I'm in logical two. I'm going to paste this at the end. So I have this long or statement and that or statement actually ends right here at the end of logical two. And I'm going to close parentheses on my or statement. I know that worked now because I'm being kicked back to my if statement and I need one more thing here. I need to put a comma so it knows that most, which comes next, is my result of true. What I've done then is or to look at this piece of it. Our or function says either find upper or lowercase mouse. But unlike Excel, where I'm dealing with specific cell addresses and saying, look at this cell address and see if it's this or this. Here in DAX, in Power BI, it's a lot more robust. I'm not simply saying look. I'm not simply saying find proper case mouse or lower case mouse. I have to say find mouse in the product table, in product name, column, and look starting in this first character of the product name, and then return a result. And I will have to do that twice. So this is much longer than it would take if I were using Excel and yet it's still going to work whether mouse is upper or lower case. By using or, I will have the appropriate result in my calculated column.
Calculate is markedly different and more powerful than the functions we have to access in Excel. With Calculate, there's only a couple of pieces of information that we're providing. We're first providing something that is either a measure or is a formula that we could save as a measure. And then we provide one or more filters that we'd like to be able to apply during this calculation. In other words, we're overriding the filters that are already being applied and providing filters of our own. For example, if we're looking at our products table, we could say that we wanted to calculate the number of products, but only where the product manufacturers can tow so. Number of products is an existing measure that we've already created, so it's calculating using all of the products, but we can apply a filter to Contoso only. Or we could provide a filter that says only where the unit cost of the product is greater than $100. Or we can combine both of these filters and run the number of products measure only where the manufacturer is Contoso and the unit cost is more than $100. Let's jump into Power BI and let's edit this matrix with the manufacturer and the sales amount. So instead of sales amount, I'm going to add number of products. Okay, let's move it somewhere here. Here's our manufacturer and our number of products. And I want to create a new measure using Calculate. So let's right click and choose New Measure. The name of this measure is going to be Over 100. Type the equal sign. And we'll use Calculate. Calculate and the expression that we want to use is the number of products, which is a measure that we already created. So calculate the number of products and we're going to put in a filter in place. And the filter that we're going to put in place is that the unit cost in the products table, so product unit cost, is greater than 100. We're applying a filter to the product table so we can run the number of products and only look at those products greater than 100. Press enter. And now let's add over 100 to our matrix. And you'll notice that the Datum Corporation has 39 products over 100 bucks. AdventureWorks, 102. Northwind Traders, none. And so on. This is how Calculate works. First an expression, and we've been building all these measures that are ready to be used as expressions. But any other formula that you could enter that could be saved as a measure works here. And then, one or more filters that we want to add to filter the calculation that's being done. This seemed relatively easy. What I want to say is that Calculate is one of the more complex functions. It's very powerful. If we were in Excel, we'd be using COUNTIF for this. COUNTIF, the unit cost, is over 100. That's part of what this does, but Calculate can do so much more. And there's a lot of resources that you can do with Calculate with Power BI. There is nothing exactly like Switch in Excel. If we wanted to do the same thing we're going to do with Switch in Excel, then we would use multiple if statements. We'd nest them together. If we wanted to do this, however, in VBA, we'd use select case. So it's a programming form that we may be used to. Let's add a calculated column to the product table. New column. Our new column name is going to be internal. And internal begins with the switch function. And the switch function starts with focusing on Power BI and what field it should find the value from, and then lists what we want to do in response to that value. So what we would like to do is look at a brand name column, product brand name. If product brand name is equal to, in quotes, because these are text values, Contoso, comma, then what we want to do with our calculated column is return internal, comma, that's the first set. So we begin with switch from the function name, and then we look at the product brand name. 
So if it's Contoso, list it as internal, and we don't repeat what column we're looking at. We'll never have to say product brand name again, because we're simply continuing by saying it is Fabricam. F-A-B-R-I-K-A-M in quotes. Then Fabricam is internal. If I had other choices I wanted to add, I would simply continue to add them here. At this point, I've listed the two companies I want to know about, and the third possibility, it is not Contoso, it's not Fabricam, and what I want to do in those instances. Well, if I don't want to do anything, if I simply want to just leave the column blank, then I'll end this right here with a closing parenthesis. If on the other hand, I would like to have external and everything else, then I simply put external in quotes and close my parentheses. Press enter. And our new calculated column list internal for Fabricam and Contoso and external for everything else. This is a small example, but if you need to look at the value for a column and return the corresponding value, switch is what you want to use. Some of the more complicated uses of switch treat switch as a lookup, and you can do that by using switch in combination with a find function that we used earlier. Welcome back to the Power BI course. So far we've gotten a very good introduction to Power BI and how the calculation engine Power Pivot works. In previous lessons, we looked at how to build measures and how to work with filter context and how to customize it with the calculate function. In this lesson, let's focus a little bit more on effective storytelling with Power BI. In this two-part demo lesson, we'll focus on information goals and visual layout, interactions in Power BI, working with pictures, formatting visualizations like cards, charts, tables, slicers. We got a bit of good here. We have some data. We know how to calculate things. Now let's put all of those together and weave a story. For the purpose of our storytelling, I want to focus on a department level report. Given the fact that we only have 100 employees and very little amount of data, there is not a lot of variety or interesting bits to get out. But this is a good starting point because of such small data, you can always see the results and connect the dots with the original data. Imagine if you're working with a million rows database. The chances are that you might see some of the numbers, but you're not able to immediately recover that with the original data. So that's where I think working with smaller data sets at the early stages is very useful. Enough chatter. Let's get into Power BI here. I've already opened the file employee count 2 that we've already used in previous projects. It's the same file and we're going to continue with that. And let's create a new page. I'll name it Department Report. The number one thing whenever you want, make a little more than some ad hoc analysis of data in Power BI. You want to first define some goals. Now given the fact that we only have a limited amount of data, this is very simple. All I wanted to do is tell the story of a specific department. So that means there needs to be a way to select one department out of five or seven that we have. An ideal visualization for this job is to use a slicer. And then I want to show some statistics and a detailed listing of employees. And in the white space, I want to show some explanation with the help of some numbers. Numbers like 15 employees, 7 female, and 8 male. These are some of my goals. So let's dive in. Let's add a slicer. This is the first thing, and we will use department. Now the default behavior for slicers in Power BI is that they will show up as little buttons. You could change the font size if you want from this button here and format your visual. If you hover on one slicer, you will see that there's a couple of small icons. The first one is a clear selection. So if I've selected marketing, I can go Click on that and go back to the alt documents. The second one is a tiny down arrow. And if you have an older Power BI version from here, you could change it from the list to drop down. 
This is a very useful thing in certain other situations where you have, let's say, 75 departments and you don't want to list them all because that will take up a lot of space. This video was recorded on June of 2023, so all the down arrow settings have been moved to slicer settings from format. Here they are. So from style options, you can use the list drop down view and you are able to see that and select. But what I want is a tile option. What Power BI does is it will tile them together like this. That means that the buttons will go after another. So if I can fit five buttons, it will fit. Otherwise, it will show them two like this. And if I can put it like this to get the buttons this way, or I can resize it to get that view, I can put it across the screen so that I can see those, and then you can customize this. For example, you can remove the word department from the top by getting rid of the slicer header. Likewise, you can also adjust the colors by going here to the values options. And you can also change the background. Let's say the background needs to be a dark color and then the font needs to be a white color. So this will give it a different look. Let's increase the font size to 13 for example. After that I want to display some statistics. Most of the measures here are from the previous lesson, but I would like to create three new measures. The first measure that I want to add is the average rating. Right click New Measure and I'm going to name it Average Rating. This is equal to the average of staff rating. Close parentheses and enter. This is an average of the staff rating column. And next I'll add a new measure. which is one or two rating count. This is equal to calculate function. What we want to do is calculate the employee count where the staff rating is less than or equal to 2. Great! And finally, I'll create a third new measure. And let's name it Other Rating Count. The other rating count is going to be employee count minus one or two rating count. So if five people have one or two count, then 95 will be the other people count, given that employee count is 100. Oh, I forgot to add a fourth new measure. I will name it 100k of less count. Which is employee count minus greater than 100k count. Which we calculated in the previous lecture. Those are the additional measures that I have added. It's time to save my file as employee count 3. In the next lecture, we're going to start adding visualizations like cards. Thanks for watching. And now let's go and add a card visual to display our summary statistics for a department. I'll resize and move this card here. The purpose of this is to kind of get our four tiles. So the first one would be my employee count. We will add the employee count here, and then before we copy this, we will fix the formatting for this. We will go and select the data label. 
From format visual button and callout value options, I will change this font to Sego UI Lite. Then from this general tab and effects options, I'm going to change the background color to a dark gray. Oh, let's change the font color to white. Yes, much better. And I'll do the same with the category label color, white again. Once that is done, we will copy this, paste it, and we will get a second tile. When you are moving these around, you can always use the guidelines, the red colored lines, to make sure that the alignment is not off. Alright, I'll copy and paste two more times. Okay, so the second tile will be greater than 100k percentage, so we will drag that field and drop it here. And the third one is the average salary. Third one is average salary. Okay. And then the fourth one is average rating. So we will get all of these, and as you click through the departments, you are able to explore that particular department's statistics. All good. Now I'll add a pie chart from visualizations. And then in this pie chart, we will use the employee count as values and gender as a legend. Because we don't have much space, we can't really get pie charts and labels and a legend and a tile and everything. So we will make the pie chart nice and tidy like that. I will get rid of the legend and the tile. And then I will go to the data labels. And the data label is showing a value percentage, etc, etc. So from detail label options, we will change the label contents to show category and to show data. It will come up like this. You don't really need the data labels in Power BI just as much as you will need them in Excel. And this is mainly because within Power BI it is meant to be used on almost always on interactive devices like computer screens, tablets, or phones. And in all of those places, every time you look at a number, you can just hover over to see the tooltip that explains that number. So you don't need technically, you don't need the labels. But sometimes having the label will add a little bit more information without having to hover. So that's the thing. Now for the second tile, I will add 100% stacked column chart. And let's add the measures. Greater than 100k count. And 100k or less count. so that both values show up like this. It's 100% stacked chart, and again we will turn off the legend. We will turn off the y-axis title and x-axis as well. Let's decrease the size a little bit. So this is the picture that you get. We can go and change the data color from visual and color options because the blue color scheme is used for employee gender. I wanted this to be a different one. Greater than 100, I wanted that color. And less than 100, I wanted this color, so it will look like this. As you go from a different department, you will see that the column changes. For the average salary, I wanted to show that male and female are two different bars. So we will add a stacked bar chart.
And in this bar chart, we can do a couple of things. We could, for example, add gender into the y-axis. And then average salary into the x-axis. The problem with this approach is that it's going to add three columns or three bars. If there is no other gender in that department, some other departments may not have that. So instead of doing it like this, what I will do is the first of all, I will delete these two measures. We already have a male average as a measure, so I will add the male average into the x-axis. And then I will add the female average inside the x-axis again. So that we have both of these. Let's change the type of chart to a clustered bar chart. And then we can remove the legend. X-axis, Y-axis, and title. So we will get that. Now in general, Power BI charts, when they are created, especially these bar and column charts, there's just too much white space. If there is only one series, you don't have the kind of white space on the top and bottom. To fix that, what we need is to actually change the spacing for these bars, okay? So how do we do that? Let's click on the Format button, then open the Spacing options. Under Spacing, change the inner padding to zero. And as a minimum category width, let's put 80. And if I want to adjust this to whatever the maximum allowable number is, that would make them nice and big and you could easily spot them. Nice. For the average rating, I will use a similar type of chart. So I'll copy and paste this. And for this one, we will use one, two rating count and other rating count. so that it will come up like this. We can again change the colors here. From formatted bars, we can go to colors and something with green variations. So that it'll show up like this. Once this part is done, then we wanted to show the employee details. So for this, we will add a table. We will come here, make the table nice and big, and we will start adding the necessary fields. The first thing that I wanted to add is the name of the employee. So we will pick up the full name. As we add name, we can see that there's just too many names and it kind of looks like everything is very tight. So I can go to the table styles format and then style. And from default, I can go to Altering Rows, and that it will give it a little bit more spacing. If you want, you can go to Grid Options and do a little more spacing here. From Row Padding, if I increase the Row Padding to 4 pixels or 5 pixels, and make the text size 16, it becomes a readable list of values. Then we can start adding the rest of the bits, which is the average salary. Age in the rating. Now age and rating can be numbers, but salary needs to be in dollars, and unless you do the formatting in the data layer, it will not trickle down here. Nice. 
One sneaky way to solve this problem rather than using annual salary, if I use average salary because average salary as a measure does not have the formatting applied, it will come through and show up there. And when you are looking at an individual, their salary is their average salary. So there is no semantic difference between these two. The only thing is we want the dollar formatting, but we don't want the title to say average salary. To fix that, double click here and just type salary so that the label is also fixed. Let's do the same with the age and the rating. And I will adjust the columns a bit. The next thing that I wanted to do is sort this salary. So we will sort it. And this sort order is set up on the salary column. So every time you change the filter, it will go and get these employees and sort their salaries. Now let's apply some conditional formatting data bar on the salary. For salary, we will go with some color like that will be there. And then for rating, I want to highlight anybody who is getting a rating of one or two. So I will apply conditional formatting background color. And this background color will be instead of color scale, it will be a rule on sum of rating. If the rating is greater than or equal to zero as a number, and if the rating is less than or equal to 2 as a number, then highlight the rating in big red color so it's easy to spot. And then we will remove the totals as well, so this is how it will look like. And that's how I made the department report. You could move these tiles around and adjust the spacing and size of these columns and bars, etc. But in a nutshell, this is pretty much the process. So this is how I would approach a storytelling in Power BI. And every time I want to come up with a report or a dashboard through Power BI, the first thing that I do is I list down some of the goals or information needs for it. And then I'll go and address those needs through the data model measures that we are calculating and the visuals that we are building here. So I hope you found this demo project interesting and useful. Let's save our file as employee count four. Great. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll talk to you again in the next one. Hello and welcome to this first Power BI Milestone Project section of the course. This is going to be budget versus an actual case study. Now, although this might sound like a little finance, it's actually a very generic number data set that we will use to kind of deep dive into data modeling and reporting stages of Power BI. So let's just look at what we're going to do during this section. Most Power BI reports are built with a star schema, i.e. one fact and multiple dimension tables. But what if you have multiple flattened tables and no dimensions? In this case study, we look at Golden Corner, a property appraisal company in Australia, and analyze multiple fact tables, budget, and actual data. We will be loading multiple facts into the power query, generating a dimensional model from this data, creating necessary relationships and data model, making measures to compare budgets with actual values, working with interactions in Power BI, visualizing the outputs in a budget versus the actual dashboard. So what's the key focus here? 
The key focus shall be understanding Power Query. The power of Power Query is that we want to unleash that and explore some really advanced features that are built into the Power Query. Also, understand dimensional data modeling. What's the difference between a dimension and a fact? What is the star schema? Spend a little more time on report design, thinking about a narrative and a multi-page view rather than a single-page report. Consolidating our DAX understanding and Power Pivot understanding, and then building some advanced interactions into the report, right? And finally, look at some layout-related hacks that will help you speed up the process for designing reports and publishing them without feeling constrained by what is available within Power BI. So this is kind of a journey. We start with raw data, and we understand how to do the modeling and set up calculations, and then we get the report into advanced stages. So there will be multiple lessons in each of these things. We will start with the data problem. First, we need to get our data into Power BI and then look at Power Query for help there. I'll go over to Power BI here. Right now, it's all blank, but I'll just quickly showcase the data. I've got an actual file, a budget file, and a text file that has some additional components. There's also some images that we will use. But just to set the context, this is a budget versus actual data set where we are looking at the property appraisal company. What this company does is they go to houses or buildings that people want to sell, and then they appraise the property, and then they will tell them what is the value of the house or how much they should sell it for. So that's what this business is. And I got some data. I think it's best to look at this. This company is based in Sydney, Australia, because we want to have some sort of geographical base. They have some employees. The name column tells me who the employees and the employees are typically working in a store. Like, for example, Belmont Store has all of these employees. And then within the Belmont Store, this is how many actual appraisals they have done in January of 2022, all the way up to November of 2023. So that's the actual data. They operate in a bunch of suburbs. So each suburb has multiple employees. Belmont, Barava Creek, Bondi Beach, and Carlton, Cars, Park, etc. So the data is like this. As you could see, they have 94 employees. The first row is head of 94 employees is what they have. And they're spread across multiple stores. And this is how the data is maintained. Likewise, they also have a budget that is allocated per store, so the budgets are defined at a different level. They are at a store level, whereas the actual data is at an employee level. Okay, so I hope you understand the difference here because it's a different granularity. This is again something very common in real life as well. You would have actual things happening at an employee or at a product level, whereas a budget or a target may be set at a category or project or team level. So this makes it simple in terms of comparisons. You could alternatively have multiple things to compare. For example, you could have a number of appraisals, total revenue generated, total time spent, or some of those other things as well. But for the sake of simplicity and understanding, we'll do it like this. Now you could see in the budget spreadsheet there are some blanks. The intention here is the budget spreadsheet is maintained by the finance department, and maybe the person who is maintaining the spreadsheet is a little bit lazy. So what they are doing is every time there is no change in the budget, so it's supposed to be 900 here and here because it's 900, they've just left it blank and they will only make a note of change. But you might say, oh, Andreas, that sounds silly, but what about these things that they're saying? Why did they not leave it blank? It could just be that they are lazy, but they are not consistently lazy, you know? <laughs> All right, so this kind of gives us a glimpse into the real life challenges that you will face when you're trying to get the data into Power BI and deal with the problems. Okay, so the rule here is that if it is blank, we want the value from about to come down. Now, if you notice, we will also see that there is a format difference between this file and that file. In this file, the months are going down and the suburbs are going across the screen.
In the other workbook, the months are going across the screen and the stores are going down. But each store appears multiple times because these are actual values that are tagged at the employee level, not at the store level. So that's the key concept that I want you to be aware of. Now there is also a third file, which is the managers. Each suburb is managed by the manager, and they have five managers. Andreas, George, Virginia, Van Zell, and John. And they manage these suburbs. This date is maintained in a simple text file, or maybe a sticky note, and somebody kind of digitized that for us in this case study. So the first and foremost challenge for us when we want to work on this data set and make some sort of reporting for the chief executive for this property appraisal company is that we should be able to kind of get all this data that is very half-assed manner. I mean, this is kind of semi-structured. You have everything here, but it's in a very loose format. So we want to be able to get everything into Power BI in a very clean, consistent, repeatable manner. And then only we could do the modeling and then do the report development. So that's what we will do. In the next lesson, our focus will be to get this data into Power BI in a tabular format. Once that is there, then we will also start modeling. I want to thank you for watching this introduction to our milestone project, and I will see you in the next one. Welcome back, everyone. Before we actually start creating Power BI report, it would be a kind of good idea to make a sketch of what the assets or things that we have here are. So each item in our data, each concept in our data, I'll draw a circle. So the first circle is employees. So we have employees and we also have got stores. What else do we have? We have managers, right? And then we'll call this as actual appraisals. Then we also have budget appraisals. How much we're supposed to do, how much we have done. All of this data is maintained on a monthly level. Okay, so these are the assets or things or objects in our data. Now let's see if I've missed out on anything. We've got employees and stores and actual and then budget. We have stores and budgets per month and then we have a separate manager file that tells me what is each manager's responsible stores. So if I kind of want to draw a diagram that connects all these things, employees, they're working in a store. So there's a relationship between employee and store. And managers are responsible for stores. So a manager manages a store, okay? So you could think that a store contains employees and the manager contains store. So if I want to kind of draw a connection of which way this is going, you could say a manager will have stores and then a store would have employees. So if I want to, for example, see who's reporting to Andreas, I'll have to go first to all the stores that Andreas is managing and then all the employees under him. That's how we will go. But what about these things? There's a kind of relationship because an employee would have an actual. So we just draw a line like this by month. That means an employee and a store and a month combination will give me what is the actual. 
So if I want to ask a question about how many appraisals we did in January of 2022, I could just look at a month and all we get on January, there's one January 2022, and I can count how many appraisals are there within that. So that will count all the employees and store level things and give me one number. What about the budget? The budget would be at the store level. So this is the budget and month. So if I want to, for example, do a comparison and then say what percentage of budget has been achieved at a store level, I can do it because a store would have a budget. A store also has an actual. But if I want to do it at an employee level, we won't be able to do it because an employee has an actual. We don't have what is the budget for the employee. So that's the point that I want to make very clear. So this is the kind of loose diagram that we want to have in our data. But all of these components kind of shrunk into three different files. So that's the tricky bit. We need to be able to separate this out and bring them out. So that will be our focus in the first part of the journey, which is to get all of these elements outside, liberate them, and then make them separate files within the Power BI model. But they all connect to the same set of files. So if the data changes, we just refresh and it will give me those additional tables. This kind of view is what we normally refer to as dimensional data model, but I'll get into that later once we finish our data extraction part. In the next lesson, we will actually establish the connection to these files and bring that over to our query and then start working through the data cleanup and reshaping process. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back. We've been working on a budget versus actual case study for a property appraisal company in Sydney. In the previous lessons, I've introduced the whole concept to you, and now let's get into the data stage. For now, what we have is we've got three files, actual data, budget data, and manager files. And what we really need is a kind of six tables, employee table, stores table, managers table, month table, and two sets of data tables, which are actual and budget. If you want to look closely at the final data set that we need to obtain, then this is the data set. Now this data set has six tables, and we could simply say that there are six just tables. But if you observe closely, there are two kinds of tables. The actuals and budget tables are the ones that have the numbers. This is where numbers are stored and everything else explains those numbers. Like an employee table will tell me who the employees are. And when that table is read in conjunction with the actual table, I will know how much an employee has done. Whereas a store table will tell us what stores we have and where they are located. And then when you read that in conjunction with budget or actual, it will tell you what was the budget and what is the actual information for that store in a month or against an employee or whatever. So this is quite typical in the world of business intelligence, where although we have multiple tables, they are usually categorized into two kinds of tables. The light colored ones here can be thought of as a dimensional table because they explain the behavior of data in certain dimension. This is the employee dimension, that's store dimension, that's manager dimension, that's the time dimension, month dimension. And these tables with the dark color contain the actual things that happened, right? These are the number tables, so they can be thought of as fact tables. Now, I won't get into too much theory here. For now, I just want you to be sensitized to the idea that there are two kinds of tables. In simple data analysis, you can usually combine everything into one giant table. And this is also typically called a flat table or a flat end version of data. But as you tend to work with more complicated data, it's obvious that you need to have both the dimension and the fact tables. Okay, now that we understand what we need, let's go and load this data into Power BI and split the three Excel files into six tables that are dimensional and fact tables. And then we'll start on getting data. We will load the actual data first, and then we will load the budget data as well. So this is the actual table. 
If you see this is coming through as a spreadsheet, right? There are 26 columns and the 26th column is null. For some reason, Power BI thinks there is an extra column here. We will select that spreadsheet and then we will say transform this table data because this data is there, but it is not in the format that is ideal for data analysis. Here's the Power Query Editor. There is our data. We shall load the remaining files and then we will come back and start working on the data cleanup. So I'll right click here on the left pane. You can load extract data sets by using the Power Query screen itself. You don't have to go back to Power BI to do this. Click the New Source button and then the Excel workbook. Now I can select the Excel budget file. Great. It also has the data, but as you could see, there are some extra blank rows of the tops that are coming through. So we will just say, OK. The last step is to right click and choose the new query to load the text file. Here it is, Managers. Press OK. So we loaded the Suburb Managers file as well. All right. So now that all of the files are loaded in the following lecture, we will start working on the data cleanup process. Welcome back everyone. Let's go to the actual table first. As you might see, this file contains everything that we need, but it is in a very clumsy format. It might be a good format to maintain if I am collecting the data or entering the data. But if I want to analyze and maybe look at the trend of budgets or actuals, then having these one column per month is very much impossible for us to work with. This is because if each month is in a column, then you are not able to compare month on month changes or anything like that very easily in Power Pivot. But imagine if this table only has four columns, name and store, and then the third column would be month and fourth column is value. Then it's a better format. Then you can apply filters. You can select a particular month and then you can see all the values corresponding to that month in the fourth column and all your measures can be written on that fourth column. Okay, so we will do that. But first we also need to select this row. That row looks like the headers, but somehow Power BI is not picking that up and is putting that in the header. So that's what we will do. But first, let's see the applied steps that already have been done. The source is connected to that file, and this is the first step. Navigation is taking to the sheet that is named Actuals and then loading that data. That is a good step. The change type step, which is usually added by the Power Query itself automatically every time you make some changes, is unnecessary because of the open formula bar, there is a critical mistake here, which is doing column 1 text and then column 26 any data type. What if there is a new month, which would be column 27? It's not doing anything to column 27. It's assuming that there will only be 26 columns and that's a bad assumption to make. This can create problems further down the line for us. So I want to delete this step. Just select the step and then click on that red tick mark right next to it. And that way that step is gone. And now our query is not making any assumptions on how many columns there will be. Okay? So once this is done, we will go and we will use the first row as headers. It will promote the first row as headers. And then every time there's a change in the header, Power Query champs in and says, wait a second, I see that you have changed the header. So let me go and help you by automatically doing the data type changes again. This is what I really hate within Power Query. These kinds of automatic steps default added by Power Query can create problems further down. So we need to delete that step as well. Now it might seem a little obsessive for me to delete these steps, but believe me, this can save you countless amounts of time in real life when you're actually implementing these ideas. So keep that in mind. This is a typical pivot table format. You have name and store going in row labels. 
and month going in column labels, and the intersection is the value of the appraisal style. So this kind of looks like a pivot table. And what we want is we want to go back to the original state of data. That kind of thing is called unpivoting. All you have to do is select name and store, right click, and then say unpivot other columns. We unpivot other columns because we want to keep these two and everything else we want to turn into the original format. This will instantly turn your data into an attribute value pair, where the attribute would be the header and the value is the value in the intersection. Now I can double click here inside the attribute and then call this a month. We will keep that as value. So that's it. We don't really need to worry about the blank column at the end anymore because that's a null value. So automatically none of those values will come through here. It will stop all the way up to November 2023 and we'll go back to 2022 again and all of the data is there. Let's go and do the data type changes first very quickly. Right click on the month column and then we change that type to date. In this one, we will change the type to a whole number because you can't have a partial number of prices in a month. That's it. This is actual data ready now. And then we can go and we can work on the budget. Click on the sheet one table. So we'll go up to the budget and we'll do the same thing, which is delete the change type applied step. Also, it had already promoted the headers this time, but that header was not useful. So I'll undo that step. So we have only source and navigation, and then the headers were actually in row number four. So we'll just delete the top three rows. All right, I'll click the remove rows down arrow, and then I will choose to remove top rows, and then simply type the number three. So the first three rows are gone, and then you'll say use first row headers. We'll delete the change data type. So this is how it looks. Again, this format is also looking like a pivot table format. But before we add pivot, well, you must deal with this problem of nulls, okay? We need to get rid of those null values and put the value from the cell above. This kind of operation is called fill down. I'll show you a single column, and let's pick the Carlton column. Carlton has a couple of nulls at the bottom, so we can go to the Transform tab and click the Fill Down button. What this does is it looks at the column and every time it sees a null, it will take the value from above and fill it down. Maybe I'll do it for Cars Park column, and then we can see what happens. Fill Down. It says 560, and then these two became 560. And that one didn't change, right? Let's undo it. So that's what fill down does. It will simply fill out the values. So we've done this for one column, and I, I want to do it for all the columns. I just have to select all the columns using shift and the arrow keys. and then fill it down. Now we may be able to happily leave this here, but I want to just make a note of some of the advanced things that we need to be aware of. What we are doing here is we are filling down for the stores. But if you were to add a new store, then this would not work for that store. Because if you look at the formula and what is applied here, it's only filling down for those sets of stores from Belmore to Wetterburn. So if there's a new store that is introduced at a later point in time within the budget spreadsheet, it will not be filled down. So how can I automate this step as well as that list of stores that we have there? And how can I make it more dynamic? It is possible to make it more dynamic. It's just that that kind of thing requires an understanding a little bit more on how Power Query works and what kind of formulas are available and which is a bit too technical for us at this point in the course. But at a later stage, maybe I can point to some resources or tips that can help you with that. 
but it can be done. All right. Once that is done, we select the month that we want to keep the month column and everything else we want to unpivot. So right click on that month column, unpivot other columns. Let's rename the attribute value to store and then let's change that month's data type to date. And I will change the value column to a whole number, right? So that's the budget file, and I'll just name this as budgets. In the next lecture, we're going to clean up our manager's data, create new queries, and make relationships between tables.